You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Margaret? Margaret? Yes, Miss Alva? Come here, please. I'll be right there. Now, it's important. The dishes are all done. Do you need something? It's getting late. It's not that late, is it? We can play a game of cards if you like. A storm is coming. Is it? Well, that's what they said on the radio. A very serious one. Hmm. <laughs> the sky was clear this afternoon. Nevertheless, I think you should be getting home. Well, I'll just fix your cup of tea then. I'd like to be in my bed. So early? Well, I'm feeling a bit tired. Well, as you wish. Do you have your shawl? It doesn't do much good. Ooh. Awfully chilly this evening. I'll raise the thermostat. Ah, there's the rain. Oh, I hope the roof holds. Why wouldn't it? You had it re-shingled last year. Here we go. I'll turn the bed down for you. Now. Take my hands up and out of your chair. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I don't know what I'd do without you. Oh, you do just fine. You'll be walking again soon. Have you been doing your exercises like Dr. Mays told you? It's no use. These legs simply don't work anymore. Oh, Margaret, I'll never leave this house again. Now you stop that. There's a big, wide world out there. Places to go and people to see. The only way I'll see them is if they come here. And there's not much chance of that. Most everyone I know has passed on. Surely not. You have a phone right next to the bed. Call some friends. Keep in touch. Uh, it's been too long. I don't know if the numbers work anymore. Of course they do. If they don't, talk to Miss Finch at the telephone exchange. She'll look them up for you. Now, wait right here. I'll get your pills and a nice cup of hot tea. Hurry, Margaret, the rain. You'll never get home. Oh, don't you worry about me, Miss Selva. I'll be back with your tray. Oh, my. Such a terrible, terrible storm. Miss Elva Keen who lives alone on the outskirts of Linden Fleet in Maine. Her world has shrunk to the size of the small house she owns and may never leave again. For some years, the pattern of Miss Keene's life has consisted of sitting in her wheelchair or lying in her feather bed, knitting, reading books, listening to the radio, eating modest portions of food, napping, taking her medication, and waiting. For exactly what, she's not sure. Perhaps for something different to happen. Something small but significant that will make all the difference. Miss Keene doesn't know it yet, but her time of waiting has just ended. For something different is about to happen. By way of an unexpected phone call in the middle of a stormy night. A telephone call routed directly through the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Night Call, starring Marriott Hartley, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Oh! Oh! Someone calling? At this hour? Oh. Hello? I I'm sorry I didn't hear... The thunder. 
Hello? Hello? Who is on the line, please? Oh, no one, apparently. How odd. Perhaps I was dreamy. Hello? Hello? I can't hear you. If you wish to speak to me, please say something. Or I'll hang up. Hello? 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 Just a moment, Margaret. You're up early this morning. Oh, what is the matter with this phone? You're trying to make a call? No one's picking up at the switchboard. Well, I imagine they're pretty busy this morning, what with the storm and all. I suppose. Phone company, Miss Finch speaking. Ready for your tea? Uh, just a moment. Miss Finch? This is Elva Keene. Yes, Miss Keene. Can I help you? Oh, I, I certainly hope so. Oh, I'll do my best. What is the problem? Uh, last night, uh, about 2 a.m., my telephone rang. Oh? I answered it, but no one spoke, and I didn't hear any receiver hanging up. Just silence. Is that right? Or, or rather, a... A crackling sound, like wind and rain. That would be electrical noise, a faulty line, most likely. The same thing happened a few moments later. Well, I'll tell you, Miss Keene, that storm last night about ruined our service. We've been flooded with complaints about fallen wires and bad connections. I'd say you're pretty lucky that your telephone is working at all. Oh, you would, would you? Yes, ma'am. And would you say, then, that someone was trying to call me, but that the connection was washed out? That's as good an explanation as any, Miss Keene. But who would have tried to call me in the middle of the night? I'm sorry. I wish I could be of more help, but the way things are right now... Well, is it likely to happen again? I really couldn't say. It might. Were you expecting a call? Not at that hour. It depends on what's causing it to happen, of course. Well, could you find out... If there's a breakdown somewhere, our crews will find it and repair it. And what am I to do in the meantime? If it does happen again, you just call me and I'll run a special check on it. Will you do that? Well, if that's your only suggestion. I'm afraid it is. I'll be here in any event. Well, goodbye, Miss Keene. Goodbye. All taken care of? I'm not sure. I'll start your tea. And then we'll move into the living room. Would you like that? Margaret. Yes, Miss Alva. Did you call me? When? Last night. At two in the morning? No, ma'am, not me. Oh. I thought you might have tried to check on me because of the storm. But then uh, I don't pay you for nights, do I? Tea? No, thank you. Have you taken your pill? Yes. Don't I always? Never missed one yet. The highlight of my morning. The mail should be here by now. Shall I check the box? Why don't you do that? With multiple injuries in the five-car pileup, so take caution while driving in these slick conditions. The storms are still very strong in the north and northeast, while the rest of the city, the severe storms seem to have passed over. Several areas were still without power last night due to fallen wires. 
workmen restored electrical service shortly before dawn. Here's your mail, Miss Alva. Thank you. Anything interesting? Oh, an advertisement. Another advertisement. The light bill, the telephone bill, of course. No personal letters. You heard from your sister a few days ago, didn't you? Oh, that was weeks ago, Margaret. Three weeks and two days, to be exact. Has it been that long? Yes, that long. Nobody cares whether I live or die. Oh, sure they do, Miss Elva. You don't understand. Don't I? You can't. You have no idea what it's like to be alone. But you're not alone. I come by during the day. Yes, you do. And for that, I thank you. But it's been so long since I've had a real visitor. I mean, someone who came of their own accord. Oh, now don't talk like that. You're going to get yourself into a mood. I'm sure lots of people are thinking about you this very moment. Who? You'll hear from someone any time now. Just be patient a while longer. Wouldn't you like to work on your knitting? All right. Can I get you anything else? Not just now. Well, start thinking about what you want to eat tonight. I'll make a list and go to the store later. For now, I better get the dishes washed. Hello? Hello? Margaret? Yes? Come here, quickly. Was that the phone? See, someone's calling you now. Take the receiver. What for? I want you to listen. If you like. Well? There's no one on the line, Miss Elva. Just listen. See if you can hear whether anyone's there. There's nothing. But you heard it ring, didn't you? Yes. Tell me if someone hangs up. Not a thing. The line's dead. Wait. What's the matter? Oh, well, it doesn't matter. I'll call Miss Finch and have them check on it. You really think that's necessary? Yes, I think it's necessary. Am I to suffer calls like that at all hours of the day and night? Calls like what? There was no call. Then why did it ring? It was a mistake, that's all. How could it be a mistake? Someone must have dialed my number. Not if it's a malfunction. Something's wrong with the equipment. I'm sure they'll... What are you doing? Reporting it. Phone company, Miss Finch speaking. Hello, Miss Finch. I thought you should know. I've received another one of those calls. There we go. I peeled you an apple. And here are two of your favorite cookies to go with your tea. Can you think of anything else? No, no, I'm sure that will do. All comfy? Ah, perhaps one more pillow. Certainly. Here you are. Thank you, Margaret. You go to so much trouble. It's no trouble at all. I wish you could understand how... Degrading it is for me to ask for help. I've always been able to take care of myself. Oh, now. We get along just fine, you and me. We're friends. I don't have friends anymore. Don't be silly. You have more friends out there than you realize. Oh, I wish that were true. You'll see. You'll hear from them. And meanwhile, don't fret about those phone calls. Don't give them another thought. I'll try not to. It was the storm, I'm sure of it. Perhaps you're right. Whatever the trouble was, the repairman have fixed it by now. But just to be sure, why don't you keep the receiver off the hook and then you won't be bothered? Oh, that's a good suggestion. You know, I have an extra television set, a portable. I could bring it over if you like. No need. 
There's hardly any reception out here. There is if you put up an antenna or connect with the cable system. That costs money. Besides, there's nothing I care to see. Suit yourself. But if you change your mind, let me know. You should be getting home. It is getting late. Let's see. You have your pills, your knitting. Would you like a book? Uh, I'll be going right to sleep. Good night then, Miss Keene. See you in the morning. Yes, in the morning. What should I do? Nothing. Just as I thought. I won't speak. I'll hang it up and then leave it off the hook. Yes? Who's there? Who is it? What is making this sound? Is anybody there? Anybody at all? Who is on the line? Who is it? Who? Hello? What is that? Please, please leave me alone. Here we are, your favorite spot in the living room. Not today, please. Well, where then, Miss Elva? Away from the window. If you're going to knit, you'll need the light. I don't care to knit just now. Very well. And close the curtains. Close them? I just opened them. That's the way I want it. But look what a lovely day it is. With the curtains drawn, there'll be hardly enough light for anything. Please do as I say, Margaret. I'm not feeling well. Why? What's wrong? My nerves. I hardly slept last night. You didn't? Not a wink. Why on earth? What happened? Do I have to tell you? No. Not the telephone. Yes. At all hours, over and over again. You're sure? Indeed I am. The sound is so loud in this house it hurts my ears. Well, we can't have that. And this time, he spoke to me. He didn't. Margaret, I simply can't bear it. Shush, dear, don't you worry. We'll do something about that right now. Call Miss Finch and clear it up. She won't listen. Of course she will. She doesn't take me at all seriously. Well then, I'll have a word with her. We can't have you going without your sleep. Operator. Is that Miss Finch? It is. This is Margaret Phillips, Miss Keene's private nurse. Oh, yes. How are you? I'm fine, but Miss Keene isn't doing so well. Oh, sorry to hear that. Why haven't you fixed her line yet? I've told her we'll repair it as soon as... It's gone beyond that. Now someone is speaking to her. She can't sleep at all. If Miss Keene's health should be disturbed any further, the phone company will be held responsible. Now, just a minute. Give me the phone. Here she is now. She'll tell you herself. Miss Finch. Yes, Miss Keene. There's a voice on the phone. A voice? It says one word over and over. Hello. 
It doesn't sound normal. It sounds distorted. Are you sure it's a voice? What else could it be? Well, static on the line, sometimes... It, it was someone, I tell you. The same someone who kept listening to me say hello over and over again without answering back. The same one who made those horrible noises. What kind of noise? I don't know. That's why I'm calling you. It must stop immediately. A voice, you say? Was it a man or a woman? I couldn't be sure. So you have no idea... I tell you there is no way of knowing. It could be either. And you're positive it wasn't someone on your party line? Oh, don't you think I know the people on my party line? Of course, Miss Keene, of course. Well, I'll have a man come out as soon as possible. The crews are still pretty busy, what with the damaged lines and all from the storm, but I'll tell them to put a rush on it. And what am I to do if this person calls again? Hang up, Miss Keene. But whoever it is will only call back. And then I have to answer to stop the ringing. That's my best advice. It's either that or disconnect the line. No, no, you, you can't do that. What if there were an emergency? I have no way to call out. That's true. Then there isn't much choice. I suggest you talk to them. Try to find out more, get a name if you can. Do that and we'll have something to go on. We'll take immediate action, I promise you. But I don't wish to speak to them at all. Then I'm afraid there's nothing we can do. So you won't help me? We can't. It could be absolutely anyone. There's no way to know. I see. Then... Good day to you. What did she say? Not a word of help. It's obvious she doesn't believe me. Oh, I'm sure that's not true. As far as she's concerned, I'm just a nervous old biddy falling prey to my imagination. But she didn't actually say... Well, she'll find out differently. You all will, if it's not too late by then. Such talk. You're letting yourself get way too upset. Why don't we have some breakfast? Would you like that? No, I'm not hungry. In a while, then. We'll both have something. I'll leave the curtains drawn so you can catch up on your rest. Would you like a pillow for your back? Make sure they're completely drawn. But it's so dark in here. I can't afford the risk. What do you mean? Well, if someone's out there, he could be watching. Watching what? Me. Oh, nothing tastes right today, not even tea. That's not your fault. I'm feeling so out of sorts. Margaret? Margaret? <clears throat> That's all right. Stay where you are. You're entitled to a nap, too. There. That will stop it. I won't put it to my ear. I won't. But if I don't take the call, I'll never know who it is. Oh. All right, I'll leave it on the hook. And the next time it rings, I'll force myself to speak to them and find out what they're up to. Oh, oh. Hello? Hello? Who is this? Who's calling, please? Hello. Who's calling? I've had quite enough. Stop this at once. No. Why do you keep saying that? Can't you hear me? No. Please. No. No. Margaret. Margaret. <clears throat> 
Margaret! Uh, yes? Oh, oh, Miss Miss Alva, I was just resting my eyes. Is, is everything all right? No, it is not. Mm, then what... The telephone! Oh, D- did it ring? I thought I heard something. It's a man. I'm sure of it. How do you know? Because he just called again. I heard the tone of his voice. It was uh, deep and hoarse. Like there was something wrong with him. What did he want? I don't know. Then how? He just keeps saying hello over and over. That's all he says. Hello. 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 Now you've got to stop this, Miss Keene. I've got to stop. I'm not the one who... You're working yourself into a state over... Over nothing. I didn't say that. You didn't have to. You were going to say it. Now, Miss Keene, I was not. I think I'd better put you back in your bed so you can... I don't want to be put in my bed. I want to know who this terrible man is who keeps calling. What did Miss Finch tell you? She told you it was probably a bad connection, didn't she? The telephone wires are still wet from the rain. It was not the connection. It's a man. I'm not arguing, Miss Keene, but if he keeps on saying hello... That's all he says. Then obviously he can't hear you. And that would be because of a bad connection. Doesn't that make sense? No. He heard me. I know he heard me. He paused each time and waited for me to speak. I don't know what he wants. Then why don't you hang up on him, Miss Selva? You don't have to listen. Just hang up. Is that so hard to do? No, I've tried that. But the voice. Hello. Over and over. Hello. 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 Then do this. Take it off the hook. There. Now he can't call you, right? Nobody can call me. Leave it that way, just for the time being, until all this funny business is over. It will be the same on the extension. And then if you decide to make a call, all you have to do is hold down the arm for a second. Isn't that right, Miss Keene? Miss Keene? But why is he calling me? Why would he? Can you tell me that? Why? He wants something from me, but I can't imagine what it is. Oh, I can't bear that sound. Try putting a pillow over it. Uh, There. No! Hello. Hello? Miss Finch, the problem is getting worse. Oh, hello, Miss Keene. I tell you I won't have it. Have you tried leaving it off the hook? No, it doesn't do any good. He just waits for me to hang up so he can call back. I left the receiver off last night, but I can't do it anymore. Even when I bury it under a pillow, the noise keeps me awake. I haven't had any sleep in 24 hours. Then perhaps, Miss Keene, we should disconnect it after all. No... I am an invalid, Miss Finch. I must have telephone service in case of emergency. I'm sure you must. Now, I want the line checked. Do you hear? This terrible thing must stop right away. 
All right, Miss Keene, I'll put a man on it right away, and this time we'll get to the bottom of it. Swear to it. I give you my word. Oh, good. Thank you. You don't know what this means to me. I'll call you as soon as we find out the problem. You'll see to it, no matter what it takes. Of course. First thing, we'll give you an answer before noon. Thank you. Don't you worry now. Oh, bless you. That's what we're here for. Your play? What? Pick up your cards, Miss Elva. This is what we need, you'll see. A nice game of canasta. Oh. Yes. Now, it's your play. What is the matter with that girl? Hmm? She promised faithfully that a man would check on it today. The afternoon is almost over and no one's been by. Maybe he doesn't have to come by, Miss Elva. Why wouldn't he? If the problem is somewhere else, with one of the telephone poles, for example. Ah. Uh. Well, I suppose that could be true, but if she promised she'd let me know. Look at your cards. Did you get a good hand this time? Oh. That'll be her, don't you think? Want me to answer it? Oh, yes, yes, if you would. Hello? No, this is Margaret Phillips. Would you like to speak with her? Who is it? Just a moment. You see, it's Miss Finch. Now everything will be fine. Oh, yes? About those calls you say you've been receiving, Miss Keene. Say I've been receiving? Why don't you believe... We sent a man out to trace them. I have his report here. And? He says he followed your line through all its connections. He found the problem. Well, what is it? A fallen wire on the edge of town. Fallen... Wire? Yes, Miss Keene. The weather blew it free of the pole. I don't understand. One end was on the ground, so no signal at all was getting through. Are you telling me that there were no calls? I'm sorry, but there's no way anyone could have called from that location, Miss Keene. I tell you, a man called me. There must be a phone there. There must be some way for him to call me. Miss Keene. The wire is lying on the ground, unattached. Tomorrow our crew will put it back up and you won't have any further trouble. There must be a way that someone got through. But there is no one out there. No one at all. Out? Where? Miss Keene. It's the cemetery. <gasps> oh. Miss Keene? Are you there? What is it, Miss Elva? Why have you dropped the phone? Will you tell me what's wrong? Miss Keene, for heaven's sake, what is it? Here we are. Valley View Cemetery. Are you sure you want to get out of the car? Yes. I wish you'd tell me why you decided to come all this way. Miss Keene, this isn't good for you. If you hadn't made such a to-do about it, I'd never have taken you in the first place. Why won't you answer? What can there possibly be out here for you to see? Get my chair from the back seat, please. Very well. Have it your way. Careful, now. Up and out. Here's a blanket for your legs. Though I can't imagine why you'd want to. Miss Elva, what are you looking at? Over there. You mean inside the grounds? On the other side of the gate. All right. We'll have to steer clear of the power lines, though. Well, there's a loose telephone wire hanging down. I can't see where it touches the ground. Where are we going? The first row on the left. About halfway down, as I recall. That's where the wire ends. I knew it. Here? Here. And we better not go any closer. It's fallen directly onto a grave. Right by an old headstone. 
What's the name? Brian Douglas. And the date of birth and death? More than 50 years ago. Oh, the poor young man. Only 27. I knew it. Miss Selva. It's him. Who? It's him. Brian. Oh, Brian. You knew him? Brian, my fiancé. You're... He died a week before we were to be married. Oh, Miss Alva, I didn't know. We were in a car together. I insisted on driving. I was always insisting on things, telling him what I wanted, dominating him in my way. And he always did what I said, always. I lost control of the car, steered it right into a tree. Brian went through the windshield. He was cut to pieces. I was left crippled, and now he's trying to reach me, I'm sure of it. Don't you see? He's trying to reach me. So many years out here alone, in the sun, in the wind, in the rain. And now, at last, I can talk to him. I won't be lonely anymore. Would you like more covers on the bed? No, Margaret, I'm perfectly fine. I can plump up your pillows for you. That's not necessary. I can't leave you like this. I'll be all right. Good night. But... Good night, Margaret. You call me if you need me now. I will. I'll be home all night. Yes, yes, Margaret, good night. Hope you sleep well. Now then, you may call me any time at all. I'm waiting. Oh, this is ridiculous. Now that I want you to call. Brian? Brian? Are you there? Can you hear me? It's Elva. Elva! Oh, Brian. Brian, my dear. Brian, where are you? Where are you, Brian? Can't you hear me at all? Brian? Are you there, Brian? If you are, please speak. It's Elva. Elva, you can speak to me now. I, I, I didn't know it was you. I thought, Brian, please, I know you're there. It's Elva. Talk to me, Brian, please. I beg you. Not this time, I didn't understand. I only meant... Oh, Brian. Brian, speak to me. No, no, Brian, don't go. Don't leave me here. I, I didn't know it was you, I didn't understand. I tell you, there were so many things I didn't understand. I, I, I didn't mean to say. Brian, please, please. Oh, please. <laughs> No! Oh. Oh. oh! According to the Bible, God created heaven and earth. But it is every man's prerogative and every woman's to create their own particular and private hell. Case in point, Miss Elba Keen, who in every sense has made her own bed and now must lie in it. Sadder but wiser, by dint of a rather painful lesson in responsibility, 
Transmitted from the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Night Call. Starring Marriott Hartley, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Sarah Wellington, Meg Falcon, and Doug James. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group and Westwood One. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Greg Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaks. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Told you not to play here. Go on now. It's it's so noisy. They're gone now. Come along, Mrs. Knaus. This way, everyone. Oh, but doctor, I have my knitting to do. Another time. Out onto the porch. I didn't finish my crossword puzzle. It will wait, Mr. A.G. Now then, isn't this a beautiful day? I don't know why we have to go. It isn't good to spend all your time inside. Everybody needs the sun once in a while. Even you, Mrs. Summers. I've had my share of the sun. Now I need my rest. We all do at our age. And where's Mr. Conroy? He's not feeling so well this morning. Well, I'm not either. What about Mr. Whitley? Why does he get to stay in? He's waiting for an important call. Watch your step. Nurse will bring the picnic baskets. Well, some of us may not want a picnic. A picnic, is it? On the grass? All those ants. We have blankets and chairs. You'll see. Ah, darn those kids, anyway. Hey, quit running. Stop it. Like wild Indians. They won't bother us. 
This way, there's a nice place under the trees. Listen to them, would you? Ah, oh, they're only children. They know they aren't supposed to play on the grounds. <sighs> How can a body think? Now, Ben, just read your paper. They're not hurting anyone. Well, let them play someplace else. They've got homes, don't they? It's the grass. The what? We have such a big lawn at Sunnyvale. Kids can't resist it. Oh, what are you doing downstairs, Charlie? I thought you had to get ready. Not today. You haven't heard from your son? I I thought it was all set. Maybe you didn't get my letter. <laughs> oh, he got it all right. They just don't care. Nobody cares anymore. The boy has enough problems. It's a small house and the second baby's on the way. It was a foolish idea moving in with them. They don't need an old duffer like me around. Huh. Would you listen to that? It's enough to wake the dead, I tell you. Don't be so hard on them, Ben. They're only kids. A fine state of affairs when your own son turns against you. Stay out of the over the Rhine neighborhood. Technology stocks extend to Wednesday. Make positive views on the central from there you are. Yes, nurse? You have a phone call. I do? I believe it's your son. Well, what do you know? Be right there. I'll tell him. Isn't that something? Guess he got my letter after all. Huh. I never get any letters. Or phone calls. Nope, nope, nope. You will, Ben, you will. Excuse me, I'd better get it before he hangs up. What are they doing out there? Don't be a grouch. It's Saturday. Perfect for kick the can. Perfect for what? We used to play it all the time, remember? No, I don't remember anything of that kind. Sunnyvale Rest Home, a place for the aged. The address is 1275 Tranquility Lane, on the outskirts of town. It offers room and board, nursing care, and a kind of refuge from the world. Outside, a common game called Kick the Can. Very shortly, a man will have a choice to make. He can either die in this world, or escape to another kind of refuge in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Kick the Can, starring Shelley Berman and Stan Freeberg, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hmm, some picnic. Plastic spoons and forks. Well, the potato salad was good. What do you mean? It was spoiled. No, it wasn't, Emma. They made it in the kitchen, just for us. You must admit, it's better when it's fresh. Oh, oh I, I think I hurt my back sitting down. Oh, the ground was damp. It was. Bad for my arthritis. Will you people please hold it down? I'm trying to read. Oh, you shush, Ben Conroy. No one's bothering you. <laughs> Easy for you to say. Where is Mr. Whitley? Still in his room, probably. Taking a nap. Oh, that's what I'd like to do. And why, may I ask, on such a lovely day? There he is. Going somewhere, Charles? Yes. Why are you all dressed up? It's my son. He's coming to get me. You don't say. He called a little while ago. He did. He's on his way. Huh. <laughs> 
At least someone gets calls. What's he carrying? Is that your suitcase, Mr. Whitley? Indeed it is. You're going to stay overnight, then? A bit longer than that, I should say. That is, if they have the room fixed up. Room? At my son's house. You mean you're moving in with them? That's the plan. If they'll have me. Well, what about the rest of your things, Charlie? You can't just leave your things behind. No hurry. It all can be packed up and sent over later. Well, we'll certainly miss you. Will you come back to visit us? Of course I will. Meanwhile, I'll call and see how everyone's doing. May we write you? Please, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Cox has the address. Nobody writes. They say they will, but they never do. There he is now. Hey, aren't you going to say goodbye? I hate goodbyes, Mr. A.G., don't you? Take care, all. Here, let me carry that for you. I've got it. Who's that behind the wheel? His son, David, don't you remember? Such a nice young man. Let me see. Some car, huh? Betty costs pretty penny. Everything does nowadays. Don't crowd now. You wouldn't want him to think you're watching. Hi, Dad. David, you're looking well, son. What's the suitcase for? Oh, just a few things for now. I don't understand. Wouldn't want to push you out of the house and home. What? Of course, I don't have that much anymore, but I suppose it could go into storage Whoa. if... I think there's been a misunderstanding. There has? Get in. We need to talk. If it isn't convenient today, we can make it another time. Listen, Dad. Yes? I didn't say I'd come to get you. I said I'd come to see you. But I thought, didn't you get my letter? That's what I wanted to talk to you about. If it were up to me... You don't have to explain. Well, Debbie's turning the extra room into a nursery. Right now, is it being painted and... I understand. I don't think you do. Let's drive a bit. Uh, your friends are watching us. It's all right, really. Let's go into town. I'll buy you lunch. That's not necessary. Please, Dad. I want to. This wasn't a good idea. If you'll let me explain... Pull over here, please. I can walk back. But, Dad... The exercise will be good for me. If you'll just listen... We'll have lunch another Saturday, son. Call first, though. I'm really quite busy these days. You're taking this all wrong. Give my love to Debbie, will you? He's coming back. I thought he said... Don't, don't stare. It's not polite. Yeah, you're it. Gotcha. Hey, where'd our can go? That old man's got it. Hey, mister. What's this? Our can. Your can? Can we have it back? Could you have... Yeah, we need it. Oh, you do, huh? Yeah, we're playing a game. Yes. Yes, I remember. This is a good can. Nice and sturdy. It will take a lot of kicks. It will? 
You have to play by the rules, though. What rules? You know the rules, don't you? Hmm. I give it back. Please, mister. I'd say this can is just about the perfect size. Is he gonna keep it? Hey, mister, can we have our can back? You can get another. Anyone will do. Tomatoes, beans, doesn't matter. You'll see. Charlie? You in there? It's going to be a beautiful sunny day today. And yes. Much more oh, the same over the uh, just days. wondered what happened to you. Not a thing, Ben, not a thing. Las Vegas, 68. Los Angeles. Thought I'd lie down for a minute. Come on in if you'd like. Uh, sorry about that son of yours. Are you? I'm not. This is a good enough place for me. I don't know what I was thinking. Here, uh, I'll close the window for you. Why? It's a beautiful day, don't you think? Oh, so much noise. Yes, what a great running and shouting. Huh. That's what you call it? Such a grouch. You can't stop kids from playing kick the can. It's in their blood. Like statues or hide-and-seek, a ritual this time of year. You, uh, you surprise me sometimes, Charles. And why do you say that? You actually brought that tin can up to your room? Ah, must be filthy. No, it's not. It's been emptied out and washed clean and baked by the sun till it's shiny as the day it was made tempered by the wind and the grass and the warm summer air. Sure you're feeling all right? Admit it, Ben. Admit what? Don't you ever think about it? You must. I don't know what you're talking about. All kids play those games the same as we did, and the moment they stop, they begin to grow old. Oh, come on. It's almost as though playing kick the can keeps them young. Huh. So that's what this is for. Magic. I'm not sure. Charlie, I'm worried about you. You're not yourself. Aren't I? You don't believe in magic anymore, do you, Ben? Huh. What are you talking about? But there was a time when you did believe in it. Never. We've known each other since... I can't remember. Since we were... Toe-headed kids. You believed in magic then. Huh, not me. Yes, you did. When we walked on different sides of the street lamp, you'd say bread and butter. When your baby teeth came out, you put them under your pillow for the tooth fairy. And when you went down the sidewalk, you were careful because you knew that if you stepped on a crack, you'd break your mother's back. <laughs> oh, you believed in magic all right. What is wrong with you, Charles? Would you like me to get the nurse? What happened, Ben? Where did the robbery take place? Robbery? A thief stole everything away when we weren't looking. Who was it, Ben? Was it time or something else? <sighs> we grew up, that's all. Everybody gets older. Do they think, Ben? How can we be sure? Maybe there are people who stay young, only we don't know it. Maybe they have a secret that they keep from the rest of us. Now, Charles... Is there something kids know that they forget? That they want to forget? They say, when I get big, I'll be a fireman or a detective or an explorer. They wish so hard to get older that it finally happens. They get taller and stiffer and forget the magic that made it all possible. There is something wrong with you. I've never heard you talk this way before. Maybe the fountain of youth isn't a fountain at all. Maybe it's a way of looking at things, a way of thinking. Charles? Yes? Stop it. Stop what? You're an old man. Don't you understand? Your youth has been gone for 60 years. Well, what I mean is, you lived a full life, Charles. Don't go sloppy now. Don't spoil it by acting like a nut. 
But it's all so clear. It makes sense. It isn't too late to play kick the can. That's the secret. Can't you see, Ben? Can't you? I see a plain old tin can with dents in it. That's all. Then look again. This can is special. I'm absolutely sure of it. And so, that's why I thought I should tell you. I'm glad you did. It's just that I can't stand to see him make a fool of himself. Of course not. And if there is something wrong with him, something in the head, then you can get him the right medication. You understand, don't you, Mr. Cox? I do, Mr. Conroy. You were right to come to me. When he acts that way, I feel I don't know him at all. It's foolish talk, I agree. So what are you going to do? Nothing. Beg pardon? At least not for the time being. If I got excited every time someone indulged in foolish talk around here, I'd be upset every minute of the day. Let him go on about kick the can if he wants. He isn't doing any harm. But I'm worried, I tell you. It, it, it isn't like him. He's getting on in years. It's common for folks of a certain age to behave like children once in a while. Oh, nonsense. He's no older than I am. In some ways, maybe, but in other ways, when some people get old, truly old, in their minds, they may act strangely, out of character. Take Mr. Agee, for instance. He's as sane as they come, but do you remember that ruckus out on the porch the other day? Somehow he got hold of some firecrackers. The nurse found him trying to set one off. It must have been those kids. Well, wherever he got them, he could have hurt himself. And that's something that concerns me. Charles hasn't done anything like that. I, I just don't want to hear him talking crazy. Oh, it isn't necessarily crazy. Huh? You, you haven't heard him. Look at it this way. As far as he's concerned, all his best years are behind him. He can't even look forward to spending time with his son and daughter-in-law. Hmm. Huh. A fine thing. So, that being the case, he'd rather return to an earlier time, one he recalls with pleasure. It only makes sense from his point of view, so he uses a time machine to accomplish it. A what? It's called memory. Is that so crazy, Mr. Conroy? Everybody does it, even you. But he actually believes he can be young again by playing kids' games. Not really. He's exploring, that's all. He'd like to believe that kick the can is a magic button he can push to make himself young. But deep down inside, he knows it won't work. Instead of the disappointment of failure, he'll never risk pushing that button to find out. Stop worrying. Your friend is fine. Are you certain? I'm certain. Until he does something to endanger his health or the health of others, there's no reason to interfere. Thanks for stopping by my office, though. Look at the time. You wouldn't want to miss dinner. Well, in that case, uh, I, I suppose... Uh, it still troubles you, doesn't it? What would you have me do? Maybe if you talked to him. It would be a waste of time. But you have a point. Perhaps I'm reluctant to face the facts myself. Every time one of our people goes senile, I get a little cold inside. When I took this assignment, I was 32. Now I'm 43. Everyone grows old, Mr. Conroy. Everyone. I think we should go in now. Yes. It turns chilly this time of day. Ah, stay a while. We can watch the sun go down. I've seen enough sunsets, thank you. Hey, it is the same. It's pretty sight. Puts me in the mind of back home. If we're going to stay on the porch, I'll need my sweater. Why don't you come inside with me, Mrs. Summers? Give me a moment to get my strength. 
there you all are. I wondered where you'd gone. Hello there, Whitley. Hello. We were just going in. Why? Before it gets dark. I uh, have my programs to watch. What's wrong with you people? Wrong? Nothing in particular. Then show a little life. Aren't you the same ones who used to skip rope and hunt pollywogs and night crawlers when the sun went down? Why, I don't think so. Don't ring a bell. Well, I was. If you can't remember it, I'll remember it for you. The weather was just like this back in Wheat Town of a summer evening. Right after dinner, you'd hear a banging of screen doors all down the block, and there we'd be, Stanley Maple and his kid brother, Wes, and Ben Conroy and the Arvis girls and some others whose names I can't think of. The air would be soft like this, children weather, and we'd come out with no coats, and we'd start shouting and play kick the can. Yeah, you're right. Everybody played that game, absolutely everybody. Or catch, or, or hide and seek. <sighs> Seems like a million years ago. I was fastest runner on the block. Were you? Sure was. When we played kick the can, I was never it. But now, ooh, look at these legs. I remember. I remember. Sure you do. But we all grow old. I miss the running most. I think if I could only run again, growing old wouldn't be so bad. I agree with that. That's one way to look at it. Maybe we can't run as far and as fast, but we can move about, and there are lots of trees and bushes if the hunted are handicapped so is the hunter. You can't be serious. He... He isn't serious. But I am. I was the fastest runner on the block. Us? Children's games? It's the secret. Can't you see? The secret of youth. Well, now, I don't know about that. Look at this. What do you see? Ooh. What have you got there? Just what you think it is. The fountain of youth. The source of the Nile. Looks like a tin can to me. It's a good deal more than that. I promise. Take another look. Think. Feel. Have you forgotten how? Have you all gone too far to turn back? Back to what? You mean to what we were? Yes. Do you feel it inside you yet? Here. Take the can, touch it, pass it around. Does it wake the part of you that's been asleep? Let me see that. Well? Why, it fits perfectly in my hands. Here, Mr. Agee, you try. Okay. Ooh, I thought it would be cold, but he's warm. <laughs> Is it? Of course it is. Put it like a seashell. Now listen. To what? Can you hear it? Summer. Grass. Running and jumping. Youth. I hear something. It's telling you to wake up. This is the last chance. Somebody, tell me I'm not crazy. Or if I am crazy, prove it to me. I can't play kick the can alone. Well, I don't know, Charlie. I'm not quite sure, but I think these legs, they might just work. Oh, there's a sprinkler. Yep, every afternoon at this time. Now we must go in before mm. the spray blows this way. Yes. Sprinklers? I remember sprinklers. We all do, don't we? Hold on. Do you see it? See what? A rainbow. Look at it in the air, above the lawn. Why, I believe I see it. Remember running through the sprinklers on a summer's day? What could be more fun than that? Wait, 
Charles, what are you going to do? What does it look like? I'm going to do what feels better than anything. Run through the sprinklers and cool off. Somebody hold my shoes. <laughs> well, look at him, will you? <laughs> this way, everybody. It feels great. Mr. Whitley. Charlie, what are you doing? Come on in, the water's fine. Nurse, nurse. Yes? Help me get him inside. Yes, Doctor. Don't worry about me, I'm having a great time. That's enough. He's soaked. Get him some dry clothing and put him to bed before he comes down with pneumonia. Right away. Ah, oh, you're spoiled sports, that's what you are. I don't need any help. Don't be difficult, Mr. Whitley, just come along. I'll get you a towel. What are you doing, Ben? Did you call them? It's for your own good, Charlie. You'll... you'll only hurt yourself. I thought we were friends. We are. That's why. This way, I'll bring your shoes later. All right, everybody, the party's over. But he wasn't hurting anyone, was he? You see, he's been talking to them. Pretty soon he'll have them believing it. I was afraid of something like this. Yeah, it's like he's gone crazy after all. I'll have him move to the observation room in the morning. But, Doctor, to be all alone, that, that'll that kill him. If I don't, he'll end up killing himself. See, not of me? Mr. Whitley, please try to understand. You want to put me in a special room? Alone? You don't leave me much choice. Why? What rules have I broken? There have been complaints. Oh, there have? Who from, may I ask? That's not the point. Go on, tell me. I want to know. Who thinks I'm breaking the rules? It's not so much a matter of rules as attitude. Look out the window. Grass, trees, a park across the street, all very peaceful. The kind of place people come to for rest and relaxation. It's what Sunnyvale is known for. But if things happen that rile them up, disturb their peace, well then, we can't stay in business. You see that, don't you? So the charge is disturbing the peace. And for that, you want to isolate me from my friends. I hope that won't be necessary now. You've got to go out there and show them you're all right. Cut the crazy talk. Learn to fit in. That's not hard, is it? What a choice. To keep that nurse from pawing at my pulse all day. I have to sit like a vegetable, stare into space. Listen, I'm trying to help you. Keep on like that and they'll put you away. I won't have a choice. Use your head. Maybe you're right. There. You see, you're an intelligent man. It's a question of playing the game. Isn't that something we all have to do? Yes, I suppose it is. Good, Mr. Whitley. I knew you'd see it my way. Now, why don't you go up and rest before dinner? Tonight's the bingo game, remember? I remember. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye, Mr. Whitley. Anytime you want to talk, feel free. I consider it part of my job. I made him change into fresh clothes. So I see. Thank you. Is he going to be all right? I think so. It must be quite a transition. Remind me of that when it's time, will you, nurse? Time for what? To pack it all in. Personally, I think I'd rather go back to the town where I grew up, instead of rooming with a house full of strangers.
wake up. Oh. Who? What? Come. Charles, what is it? Shh. Quietly. Come where? We're going to play a game. What do you have there? What does it look like? Uh, an empty tin can. We're going to play kick the can now? It's dark outside. It usually is in the middle of the night. Now get your robe and come with me. <laughs> Mr. Freitag. It's us. What? Uh, what? What? It's time. We're all gathering downstairs. Uh, w w why? Something important. It's a secret. What would Mr. Cox say? He'd say it was dangerous and foolish. He'd say it was crazy, and maybe it is. Maybe it's necessary to be a little crazy for magic to work. He'd say we'd be acting like children. But isn't that the idea? Only children can play kick the can. Now get the others. Freitag, wake Mrs. Summers. A.G., you get Mrs. Wister and Mrs. Knaus. Let me see, who else? There's Mr. Carlson. Everyone? Everyone. Well, uh... What if they won't come? They've got to. Don't take no for an answer. Hurry. I heard people walking around. Whoa, what's going on here? Uh, Mr. Whitley has an idea. Would you like to come too? Hello, Ben. Charles? What are you doing? Go on. Do as I said. Yeah, yeah. Right away. I'll see you downstairs. You should be sleeping. Everyone should be... What? What's that in your hand? No, Charles, you can't. Who says so? It's against the rules. The devil with the rules. It's our last chance, don't you see? Ben, Ben, come with us out to the lawn. Me? Yes, you. Ben, we always did everything together. Let's not stop now. Even if you think it's crazy, come out and play. Come to your senses, Charles. You think I'm obsessed? You think I've got hold of one crazy idea and won't let it go? Well, haven't you? Maybe so, but where I have one idea that's strangling me, you have dozens. You're the one obsessed. Oh, nonsense. Is it? You're afraid of death, but you're also afraid of life. You think age gives you the right to stop growing. You've sealed yourself inside your shell, and you're afraid to poke your head out and look around. That's enough. You're afraid of a new idea. You're afraid to look silly, afraid to make mistakes. You've decided you're an old man, and that's what's made you old. I am old, Charles, and so are you. It's a fact. Facts be damned. Your bones are old. They'll break if you try to run with them. Your heart is old. Your lungs are old. Don't you get it? You're used up, worn out by a lifetime. Sit down, Charles, before you fall down. Go back to your bed. I can't do that, Ben. Charles? I've got to find out. Won't you help me, Ben? There is magic in the world. I know there is. When I fell in love with Mary and kissed her for the first time, that was magic. When my boy was born, that was magic. The moon is magic and the stars... Friendship is a magic thing, too. Life is magic. Maybe I'm right, Ben. Can't you consider that? Maybe kick the can is the greatest magic of all. Well, what do you say? There's nothing to say. I just don't know how to get through to you anymore. Then I'll do it alone. What are we doing here? I'll catch my death. Now, you just wait. Mr. Whitley has something in mind. Yeah, something important. But what could it be? Don't you know? Don't you remember? Remember what? How it used to be. How we used to sneak out of the house after dark when the grown-ups weren't looking and the weather was like this. 
Don't you remember how we used to play kick the can? Everybody played in my neighborhood. A long time ago. A long, long time. Funny. It doesn't seem that long ago to me. I remember. Yes. I think I do, too. But we've all grown so old. Are you sure? If these legs would carry me. How do you know they won't until you try? You can't be serious. He isn't serious. But I am. You made us children's games? What about the nurse? She's asleep. If we keep our voices down and open the door carefully, she won't hear us. Go outside? Why not? Are you chicken? Show them the can. Where did you get that? From some kids. They've already broken it in. Well, are you with me? Or do I have to play kick the can all by myself? Who, uh, who remembers the rules? Mr. Cox. Hold your horses, I'm coming. What is it? Mr. Cox, come quick. Keep your voice down. You'll wake everybody. They're already awake. Hurry, hurry. Y you've got to stop them. Calm down, will you? What, what are you talking about? You'll see. Come to the front room. Easy, Mr. Conroy. Now, what is it exactly that I'm supposed to see? There's no time to lose. But there's no one here. Why is the door open? Because they've gone outside. Why would they do that? It's like I said, to play kick the can. That was just a crazy idea. Mr. Whitley's forgotten all about it. No, no, you're wrong. They really mean to play. Calmly, please. You mean now, at this hour? That's right, and it's all because of Charlie. Now I'm really worried about him. What'll happen when it when it doesn't work? He really believed it, see, that it would make him young. That's not the problem. What worries me is what will happen if he tries to run. He can't take the exertion. None of them can. Five, ten, Where? Fifteen, Look, 20, the front lawn. Everybody, let's hide. This is gonna be good. Over here, hurry up. 85, 90, 95, 100. Ready or not? Where are they? Huh. And what are these kids doing here? I told them to stay away. Look out! Run, Amanda, run! Maybe, maybe they're around the other side. I'll go check. Hey, kick the can over to me. Hey, Ben! Look at me! I told you it would work. Charles? Come on, you want to play? No, no, it can't be. Ben, you better hurry up, or it'll be too late for you. Charles! Yeah, hurry up, or it'll be too late. What is it? Do you see them yet? Gotcha. Is... is that... <laughs> Here, you kids, <laughs> how many times do I have to tell you, go home? Ah, get out no, of my way. wait. <laughs> what are you doing here this time of night? One, two, Charles? Three, you're out. Charlie? Sorry, Ben. I wish you could have believed. I gotta go. Charlie. Hey, kick it over here, over here. Charlie, take me with you. Get away and stay away. Mr. Cox, please. Last one over fences right today. Come on, let's go. <laughs> I can't climb that. Charlie, high. wait. <laughs> wait. Charlie. Hey, you guys. We gotta find the others. They can't have gone far. I bet Whitley's taken them down to the orchard. No. Why? Look all you want, Mr. Cox. <laughs> you won't find them. 
wait here. You, you forgot your can, Charlie. But don't you worry, none. I'll keep it for you. Inside. In case you ever come back for it. Sunnyvale Rest Home, a place for people too ancient to remember the fragile magic of youth. A place for those who have forgotten that childhood, maturity, and old age are magically intertwined. A dying place for those who have grown too stiff in their thinking to revisit the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered while supplies last at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often and I'll see you in the zone. Kick the Can, starring Stan Freeberg and Shelley Berman with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by George Clayton Johnson. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, Kurt Napig, Herb Graham, Joby Cerny, Doug James, Roz Alexander, Meg Falcon, Renee Matthews, Sarah Wellington, C.J. Amari, Natalie Byrne, Amanda Amari, Mitchell Hernandez, Julia Cosmos, Robert Gertish, Matthew Gertish, and Brayden Luke. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group and Westwood One. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Oh, tough luck, mister. Yeah, I thought I could make that one easy. Yeah, I thought so, too. Well, at least I didn't leave you much. Well, let's see. <laughs> they said you don't have a shot. <laughs> it looks like you're going to snooker yourself. Well, you never can't tell. Eight ball, corner pocket. <laughs> Lots of luck. Like I said, eight ball, in the corner. How'd you do that? Ah, oh, just lucky, I guess. Luck, nothing. That, that was some shot. 
been practicing. I uh, guess it finally paid off. Yeah. You win. Here's your five bucks. Yeah, one more game? Double or nothing? Yeah, hey, you wouldn't be hustling me, would you? Do I look like a hustler? I'm not sure. Oh, come on. <laughs> me? See, I just play on my lunch hour, you know, whatever town I'm in. Relaxation. Oh, me too. Strictly for laughs. So how about it? I don't know. Flip to see who breaks? That's all right. You go ahead. Yeah? Sure. Well, okay. Double or nothing. Go on. Sink as many as you can. Make it hard for me. No money on the table. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, Pops. You know I don't allow gambling in here. Yeah, we're, we're just having a friendly little game. Jesse, Jesse, why don't you give it a rest? Now, he do this a lot? Every day. It's all he lives for, this one. So he is a hustler. What are you talking about? Tell him, Pops. I never hustled anybody. Not for money. For pride. Go outside, Jesse. Get some sun on your face. You'll feel better. I already feel better. Forget the money. We'll, we'll play for the fun of it. No stakes? Not a dime. In that case, let's see how good you really are. Nice break. Of course, I didn't sink any. But that's my advantage. Yeah? Too many balls on the table. It doesn't leave you a shot. Watch me. What in the... Bank shot, three cushion. Curveball. Top spin. Little English. And over and under. Now, my favorite shot. It took me years to learn this one. You're not gonna believe it till you see it with your own eyes. This is the way it's done. Good. Pretty good. You kidding? Nobody ever made a shot like that in the history of the world. Yeah, it's not bad. I'll give you that. <laughs> but you're no Fats Brown or anything. What? Put your glasses on. It was impossible, but I made it. Yeah, sure. Keep practicing. You'll get there. Hey, here's for the beer, Pops. See you around. Okay. Thanks. What, what are you talking about? Keep practicing. I made it. Jesse. Just enough hey. English, the right draw, perfect position. Settle down. Perfect. Easy, Jesse. That's all I ever hear. Fats Brown. Well, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of hearing his name. Jesse, relax. You got company. Hi, Jesse. <laughs> Jesse, you are a lucky man. Rita, what are you doing here? I thought we had a date. No, that's tomorrow night. Thursday night. Tonight is Thursday night. What? Oh, I guess I lost track of time. I'm sorry, I, I was supposed to pick you up at 8 o'clock. 7. 7. It's 9. Wow. Wow. You, you look great. Mm, don't change the subject. But I did get dressed up special just for you. Well, we can still go out. Mm, it's pretty late for dinner. Well, how about if we go out for a drink or a movie? How did you forget about our date? Yeah, how did you do that, Jesse? I, I was shooting pool, and I guess I just lost track of the time. Uh-huh. The guy I was playing started baiting me, saying, I'm no Fats Brown, I'm no Fats Brown. Can you believe that? How could I not be better than a guy who's been dead for 15 years? When it comes to dating, it's a draw, Jesse. <laughs> okay, I deserve that. Look, I'm sorry. I'll make it up to you. Come, come on, let's get out of here. Why not? There's nobody left to hustle. Right, kid? You bet, Pops. I beat them all. Fats might have been good in his day, but this is my day. I'm Jesse Carter, the best pool cue on Randolph Street. The best player ever. Maybe. 
Too bad Fats is dead. Now, you'll never know for sure. <sighs> I know. And it's killing me. I would have given anything to play him. Jesse Cardiff, Pool Shark. The best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be on Randolph Street. He has spent every free minute honing his skill for pride and for love of the game. But he's about to learn that there's more to a man's reputation than skill or talent or even fame. And that being the best at anything carries its own special problems in or out of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, A Game of Pool, starring Wade Williams with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hmm. So, what's the big deal about this dead Fats guy? Uh, don't you know nothing? Fats Brown is a legend. Where you been? Most people say he's the best ever. Then he must be. No, no, not really. Because most people never saw me play. I'm better. Is pool all you think about? Well, what else is there? Look, if, if you want to be the best at something, it's got to be your life, right? Where do I fit into your life, champ? Oh, oh, you are right there. I work you in whenever I can. You gotta understand something, baby. Pool takes a lot of concentration. Well then, I got a great idea. What? I want you to stay here. Yeah? And then concentrate oh. on losing my phone number. Oh, Rita, don't be mad. Rita, go. Rita, come on. Look, Rita, please stop. Get lost. Let me explain. What? Look, I, I would give anything to play Fats Brown just once. Is that so wrong? Yes. But for your own sick, self-centered ego, I hope you get your wish. Oh, Rita, come on, give me a break. I just want to beat the best. What's wrong with that? Fats, dead and buried in the ground. I'd give anything to play him one time. I could beat him cold, I know it. I'd show him who's the best. I'd give anything to play him one time. One time. This time. Fat Brown. Brown. You're needed. Lister's Pool Room. Randolph, Randolph Street. Street. Chicago. I'm on my way. Mr. Fat Brown. Brown. What game? Whatever way he wants it, doesn't matter to me. Straight pool, anything. If I just had the chance to meet Fats Brown face to face one time. At your service. Who? How did... You called? Y yeah, but... I, I must be seeing things. Why do you say that? Fats Brown? I, I thought you were... Dead? Not quite. As long as people talk about you, you're not really dead. As long as they speak your name, you continue. Continue? The game goes on, you might say. A legend doesn't die just because the man does. No. No, no, no. I, I know that, but... But what? This is impossible. Nothing's impossible. Some things are less likely than others, that's all. Wait a minute. There's a picture of the real fats on the wall. You... You look like them, but... Not many people do. 
Yeah, there, standing by a table, holding this custom-made pool cue. You mean this one? Where'd you get that? Nice stick. Good balance. I had it made to order. Wait a minute. Let me get a look at the face. The, the chin? The nose? Not one of my better pictures. It isn't a rib. I, I mean, you're, you're him. You're... James Howard Brown. Known to my friends as Fats. <laughs> I know it's a shock, but then you called me. I didn't call you. Oh, uh, well, I I didn't mean to... I mean, that is, I, I, I was just trying to... To what? I don't know. I, I was just saying if, if I could, if I could, if I could prove... It was big talk. Is that it? Well, no, not exactly. Talk is cheap. I know the type. You like to play with fire, but you don't like to cook. You're not really as good as you claim to be, and you know it. Hey! Deep down, you know you're second rate. Now, hold on. Are you afraid? Now, why would I be? Look, I've come a long way, boy. I don't like to be fooled with. I've met your kind before. A little skill, a little knack, some style. But when the heat's on, you fold. That isn't fair. You've never seen me play. Maybe not, but I've seen plenty like you. You have, huh? How do you know I can't beat you? How does anyone know anything? We learn to read the signs. Well, take another look. It's possible, isn't it? That's not the point. It's a matter of what's likely. But it is possible. Sure, it's possible. Things change. Records get higher. Once upon a time, nobody could run the four-minute mile. But people get better. Then you admit it. Yes, it's possible you could beat me. But the only way you'll do it is with a pool cue. You'll never get the job done with your mouth. All right, fat boy. Dead or alive, I'll tell you something. Maybe you are some kind of a legend, a tin god. But you know what you are to me? A big balloon. Just waiting for someone to stick a needle in you. Well, I'm the someone, and here's the needle. Where? My pool cue. Oh, it'll get the job done, don't you worry. You're like all the other legends. You get by on your reputation. One time I heard a man in this very room swear he saw you make a nine-cushion bank. And you don't believe it? Now, you hit a ball that hard, it won't stay on the table. The guy had more imagination than brains. Is that so? Well, let me tell you. That's not what counts. The question is, can I back it up? Oh, how right you are. I know how good I am, but you... Then you'll play me. Rack the balls. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. What about the stakes? The stakes? A little something to make the game more interesting. Oh, here's what I got. I'll shoot it all. My whole bankroll. Any or all of it. Put it back in your pocket. Why? My money not good enough for you? Come on, use your wits, boy. What good is money to me? Then what? Something to make the long journey worth my while. Name it. You said you'd give anything for a game with me. Anything. What are you getting at, mister? Just what kind of stakes are you talking about? Life or death. What? You beat me, you live. You lose, you die. You're pulling my leg. The proposition is simple enough. You're crazy. Interesting. What is? To see how much faith you have in your ability. Or should I say how little? Go chase yourself. You know something? For my money, you don't want it bad enough to be the best. Why, when I was your age, I would have jumped at the chance. But then I was better than second rate. Watch it. You wouldn't know about that. It takes more than skill to be a champion. It takes equal parts talent, work, luck, and nerve. A quality you sadly lack. Nerve? You mean insanity? How so? You want me to risk my life on a game? Insanity, then, if you prefer. Listen, I'm just a pool player. There's probably no less important thing on the face of the earth. Pushing balls around with a stick on a felt-top table. But mark this in your book. I'm the best. It's a proud thing to be the best at anything. But then you wouldn't know about that either. Hey, hold on. Hmm. Where, where are you going? I'm going back, of course. Back where? You wouldn't understand. You're wrong. About what? 
You say I don't want to be the best bad enough. That's not true. Oh, boy, is it not true. Do you know how many hours, how many years, how much of my blood and sweat I put into this game? I'm listening. How many nights I slept right here on this table? Yeah, I did that. I made a deal with the owner so I could practice after the place was closed. I haven't been to the movies in years. I know what you're talking about, but it's still talk and nothing else. I'm good, mister. Real good. But am I... am I that good? You'll never know until you're ready to risk everything. Will you stop pushing me? Sure I will. I was just thinking. Where I come from, there's a race driver. Go to the track and whisper his name. Say Tazio Nuvolari and watch the heads nod up and down. Or go to the bull ring and hear them talk of Manolette. Both men face death daily and both are legends. They learned something important early on. You'll never make the grade by playing it safe. Uh, this is nuts. So long, kid. Wait. What for? Oh, boy, what, what am I doing? Something you want to tell me? Well, I... You accept the terms? I... Life or death. Rack em. Just so you understand, once we start the game, there's no turning back. Get cold feet and it'll be too late. You heard me. Rack the balls. In a hurry, are you? I've been waiting a long time for this. Have you? Yes, I guess you have. First, the tools of my trade. Now, what's so special about that stick, anyway? It's the man that counts. You're right. But this one suits me. You know how it is, the big game hunter has his elephant gun, specially bored with a custom grip. The fencing master uses a blade from Lima. This cue, it was made for me in St. Louis. It cost 600 bucks back then, and I made a living from it for 35 years. It never let me down. Well, there's a first time for everything. Yes, I guess there is. The question is, what's the most likely outcome? Look, if you're not going to rack them, I will. Anytime you're ready. Do I get to call the game? Name it. Rotation. Kelly. 14-1 rack. Eight ball. What's your pleasure? All right. Let's see how good you are. One game, 300 points. That'll do. Standard rules. Is there any other kind? But just so there's no misunderstanding, we play for the value of the balls. Nine points for the nine ball, ten for the ten, and so forth. Agreed? Agreed. Good. Do you have a coin? Right here. Toss for break? You flip. Sure. Call it. Tails. Here goes. Why'd you put your hand over it? I want to give you a fair chance. Go ahead, let's see. You can change your mind. You heard me. Tails. All right, then. If you're sure. You can change your mind, you know. There's still time. Not on your life. My life's not what's at stake. Let's see it. Heads. I guess that means it's my break. Yeah, your break. As soon as I chalk up. Take your time. I know what you're thinking, son. Oh, you do, huh? Same as most players. The man who breaks is at a disadvantage. Once he scatters the balls, the other man has a clear field. Well, doesn't he? Maybe with some people, but not the way I play. Oh, sure. I suppose you can control the break. Time to go to school. Wow. Two balls into the rail, back to where they were, exactly. No advantage given. That's... That's a perfect break, all right. Mm -hmm. I bet it took you years to learn that. Oh, it did, but not the way you think. What do you mean? It takes more than practice. Not just setting up shots in an empty pool hall. 
You have to handle the pressure out there in the real world. Well, this is my world. You're on my turf now. I know this table like the back of my hand. Maybe, but who have you played here? Kids, two-bit hustlers, traveling salesmen? Step aside, fat man. Be my guest. Now it's your turn to scatter them. <laughs> You'd like that, wouldn't you? Safety. Playing it close to the vest, aren't you? That's what you call strategy. What are you gonna do now? I'll try to think of something. There's always a power break. Yeah. But if nothing falls, you leave me wide open. And if I sink one, you're really in trouble. With luck, I can run the whole table. Prove it. Keep your eye on the 15 ball. It's not going in. Funny thing, I was thinking it is. Corner pocket. Think again. Oh, well, quite a few balls around the one. Looks like you're sewed up. Yeah, yeah. If you don't connect, it'll cost you. If I don't, mind if I smoke? If it makes you feel better. Yeah, you wouldn't have a fresh pack on you. I gave them up. Bad for my health. No, oh, that's okay. I, I got one left. Nervous? Eh, not me. But why is your hand shaking? Uh, maybe I'm itchy to get this over with. Or maybe you're just trying to rattle me. Or maybe it's because you don't have a shot. Except for the bank. That'll take a lot of English. Oh, I'm loaded with it. So you are. This time. Shall I keep score? I got it. Now what? The follow-up is important. You have to plan ahead. Three rails. Two ball in the corner. That's a hard combination. For some people. Watch your angle now. You watch it. Oh, I am. How about that, fat boy? Not too shabby. It was great! In some places. You know what? You're like all the others. Always trying to bring me down. Well, why would I do that? When I was a kid, there were plenty of guys like you. Guys who were good at things like music and basketball and arithmetic. They'd do anything they could to make me feel about an inch tall. Well, you fooled them, right? Yeah. Yeah, I sure did. I knew there was something, somewhere, that I could be good at. One day, I was about 16. I wandered in here. It was cool and dark, like, I don't know, like being underwater, you know? Yeah, I know. So I kept coming back. I used to stand around and watch him play. Got to know the place, till I felt relaxed. You know, one day, I picked up a stick and asked this old man. He was sitting right over there. I said, do you want to play, mister? Why not, he said. And I beat him. I beat him! That was when I knew I had an eye for the game. Three ball. Go in. An eye, huh? What happened to it? Well, I almost made it. My turn. Three ball. You know, almost works a lot of the time, but not in geometry. Well, what's that got to do with it? Pool is geometry in its most challenging form, a science of precise angles and forces. You have to understand that or you're lost. Yeah, yeah. Four ball, other end. Lucky shot. Luck had nothing to do with it. Five in the side. Angles, forces, big deal. Now who's sewed up, huh? I'll admit, it doesn't look good. You can say that again. If you don't hit the five first, you scratch. And that'll cost you points. Mm-hmm.
Your shot. Oh, man, is it. Five ball. Six. Seven. Now the eight. Nine in the side. Ten. Eleven ball, corner. I have 59 points, you have seven. The game still has braces on its teeth. Rack them up. No kidding. Just in case you lost track. Tell you what I'm gonna do, fat boy. Let me make it easy on you. No thanks. Hey, I'm trying to do you a favor. For what reason? Because I got feelings. Come on, admit it. This must be humiliating. Oh, I wouldn't say so. Well, let me say it for you then. The game's as good as over. Is that what you think? You want to throw in the towel and walk away? I'll let you. You will, huh? Sure. That way it won't hurt so much. It's not over till it's over, son. Be serious. Look at the score. I got 299. So I see. Well, what does that tell you? I need any ball to win. That right. Time to face facts. There's no way. You might as well throw in the towel. I've been in tougher situations than this. <laughs> when? There's more to winning than scoring points. Oh, yeah? Like what? Something you can't learn in here. Then why don't you teach me? Go on. I I'm all ears. Takes time. So? That's something you got plenty of, right? Talk is cheap. The big things you have to learn for yourself. Quit stalling. It's my shot. In an awful big hurry, aren't you? To be the best? Oh, you better believe it. I've been waiting years for this. One more shot and you are history, fat boy. There's a new shooter now and his name is Jesse Cardiff. Back off and give me room. This is something I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. Don't let me hold you up. Oh, I won't, I promise. Yep, this is the big one. They don't come any bigger. Me and Fats Brown, and I need one to win. Feast your eyes on this. Number five in the corner. Funny. Something you want to say? I was just thinking. You do a lot of that. What is it this time? Just that there's more to life than a pool hall. Huh? No kidding. It isn't right you're being cooped up in here all the time. You're all hard fats. You gotta get out a little, see what's going on. Uh, I've heard that before, from Pops. Now, what about you? What about me? Uh, you didn't get to be the best sitting on a park bench. You spent a lot of time with a pool cue in your hands. You must have. Of course I did, but I found time to live, too. I've been to places where they never heard of billiards. If you call that living, why would you want to? Why bother? It's not easy to explain, but I'll try. 
I may not look the part, Jesse, but I've done other things, too. A whole lot of other things. I've made love, walked uphill, and swum in the ocean. I've been on airplanes and cruise ships and played tag with little children. And when I think of the wonderful things there are to see and do in this world, it hurts me to think of you rotting your life away in this miserable dark hall. What? Oh, I get it. Nice try. What's this, you don't believe me? Doesn't matter whether I do or not. You're trying to distract me so I won't make my shot. Am I? That's a lousy thing to do. But it won't work. Five, corner pocket. Hey, what are you doing? Doing? Oh, you mean the coin? Sorry, it's an old habit of mine. Take your hand out of your pocket. Sure, if you like. Now, don't say another word. Just for a minute. This is the easiest shot I ever saw. There's no way I can mess it up. Nobody could. I'm in no hurry. Good. Take your time. I will. And I'll stand over here and just give you all the room you want. You do that. Enough with the chalk already. What? Oh, sorry, sorry. You're not even going to get to shoot again. I'm making this shot and there's nothing you can do to stop me. No doubt. You did that. Did what? You dropped the chalk. Then I better pick it up. My shot. But, but... That one right there, in the side. Oh, I don't believe it. Look at you. A little gamesmanship, a little pressure to put some fun in the game, and you come apart at the seams. You cheated. I did? How so? Well, you... Kid stuff. To make you break your concentration and shoot wild didn't take much. You know, if you ask me, that's pretty low down. Some places they break a guy's thumbs for that. Not here. Game ball. Oh, one more thing. If you want to concede now and save yourself the embarrassment... Take your shot. It's not over till it's over. Right. Even when it's just a formality. Last ball. Corner pocket. Choke. You wouldn't be trying to distract me, would you? Ha! Almost. Almost doesn't make it. There it is, the game ball again, right in front of me. All my life. So you said. Okay, you had your fun. This ball has my name written all over it. Perfect angle, clear table. I was made for this. Give it some thought, Jesse. Think about this. I sink it. I become the greatest. You're not going to make it. It's simple enough straight in, but you won't make it. You're sweating, fat man. Now, why are you so nervous? Not why you think. You wouldn't understand the reasons. No, no, no. I understand, all right. It means a lot to you, doesn't it? Even as a dead man, to have your name up there as the unbeatable champ of all time? It carries certain satisfactions, yes. I'll give you a chance at my crown, Jesse, but only if you're willing to stake your life on the game, Jesse. Couldn't be just a nice, friendly little game, huh? I take it as it comes. To you... Pool is not a nice, friendly game. It's a win-at-any-price affair. I saw that right off, and I acted accordingly. But it didn't do you any good. Didn't it? I've made this shot hundreds of times. Not when your life depended on it. Is this some more of your gamesmanship? I've been studying you, Jesse. I've gone up against dozens like you. Pressure is what separates the champions from the also rans I've seen men who could shoot brilliant pool... But they were duds when the stakes were high. That's why I insisted we play for something big. What does it matter to you if I win or not? Afraid I'll take your place? Is that it? Did people stop talking about Dempsey when Joe Lewis came along? Did Beethoven replace Bach? No. He wouldn't replace me. Then why? Someone has to keep the flame. Someone has to weed out those who haven't got what it takes. The champions, the legends, they serve a purpose. To be a challenge and an incentive. I don't need a challenge. Everyone needs a challenge, Jesse. 
Someone great out of the past to say, match what I've done, boy, and make it better. That's true of all walks of life, music, politics, sports, you name it. Musicians all over the world have been better because of Bach and Beethoven and Mozart. There's a man in the White House who can look out his window and see the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial. Don't you think it helps him to be a better president? Yeah, but a game of pool? Anyone who tries to be good at anything finds himself in your shoes. He finds himself faced with a legend. And when he can't measure up to the legend, he fades away, he dies, and is forgotten. I'm only a pool player, Jesse, but I'm the best. No, you were the best. No man gets past me unless he has what it takes. And you don't think I have it? There's still one ball on the table, and it's taken you a mighty long time to get at it. You wouldn't believe this, Jesse, but personally, I'd like to see you win. Yeah. Yeah. I've only been doing my job. Stand back and give me some elbow room. Wait, Jesse. Oh, no. I've been waiting too long. Before you shoot, think about one thing. What? Sink that ball and you may win more than you bargained for. You're wasting your breath. Don't you get it? There's nothing you can do to stop me now. Nothing. Sorry. I was required to say that. Something along the lines of a disclaimer. Well, what are you waiting for? Not a thing. Win more than I bargained for, huh? Is that what you said? Well, it's over. I beat you. Looks like you did. Now I'm the best. I'm the best at something. So you are. You had to prove yourself under pressure and you passed the test. Well, aren't you going to congratulate me? I'm not sure that's in order. Thanks. What do you mean, thanks? I beat you. I'm going to live. Of course you are. Those are the stakes. You'll live forever. Then why thank me, fat boy? You'll find out when the time comes for you to leave Randolph Street. Ah, you're a sore loser, that's all. I beat you fair and square. Yeah. You saw it. I beat the king of the hill, Fats Brown himself. So long, kid. Thanks for the game. Me, Jesse Cardiff. Now I'm the best. And I'm going to stay the best. Because nobody's ever going to take it away from me. Not ever. From now on, it's me, Jesse Cardiff. You hear that, world? Jesse Cardiff. 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 Yeah. Report at once to Mason's Pool Hall. Sandusky, Ohio. Mr. Jesse, Mr. Jesse Carter. Carter. You're, You're needed. needed. Yeah, I'm on my way. Mr. Jesse Carter, who became a legend by beating a man known as Fats. But many years later, after his funeral, he found out that being the best at anything carries with it a special obligation to keep on proving it. Mr. Fats Brown, on the other hand, having relinquished his champion's medal, has gone fishing. These are the ground rules on Earth and in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered while supplies last at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. (laughs) 
A Game of Pool, starring Wade Williams with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and Joby Cerny, and written for The Twilight Zone by George Clayton Johnson. Heard in the cast were Craig Brawley, Doug James, Roderick Peoples, Sandra Delgado, and Linda Ryder. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Mr. Poole. Morning, Mrs. Sullivan. Off to work? You know it. Oh, Mrs. Sullivan. Yes? I meant to drop off the rent last night. Oh, no hurry. It isn't due yet. I know, but I don't like debts. I'll make sure you get it this evening. That will be just fine. Well, have a good day at the bank. The same as every other day. Oh, excuse me. Were you going out? Just to bring in the paper. Oh, let me get it for you. You don't have to do that. No problem. Here you are. Why, thank you, Mr. Poole. You're the perfect tenant. Absolutely perfect. Paper, get your paper. You have the morning sports final? Sure thing. 25 cents, one quarter of a dollar. Here. Thanks, pal. Paper, get your paper. Who wants a paper morning final? One here, Marty. Sure thing, Mr. Poole. Always got a copy for you. Let me see if I have the right change. Yep. Here you go. Hey, look at that. Is something wrong? Your quarter. It landed on the edge. Didn't even fall over. Well, what do you know? That'll never happen again in a million years. This must be your lucky day. Oh, I hope you're right, Marty. A little luck never hurt anyone. What happened? That car, it hit him. Oh, did you see it? Somebody call an ambulance. Mr. Hector B. Poole, resident of the Big Apple, the Glass Canyon, hoping to survive an assault on his senses, all six of them. Flip a coin and keep on flipping it. What are the odds? Half the time it will come up heads and half the time tails. But in one wild, freakish chance in a million, it will land on its edge. Mr. Poole, a bright human coin on his way to the bank in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, A Penny for Your Thoughts, starring David Eigenberg with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Stand back! Look what you did! I didn't see him, honest. He, he just stepped off the curb. Where's the ambulance? Oh, oh, what happened? Easy, mister. You all right? Oh, I think so. Oh, just give me a hand. Look, lie still. I, I'll get a doctor. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I don't need a doctor. I mean, if you'll help me get up. I'll... You sure? You ought to take it easy. Yeah, at least get an x-ray. Uh... Why? No scrapes, no scratches, no broken bones. I seem to be fine. He should stay down. I would. Something like that, he could sue the guy's pants off. 
pardon? Oh, I, I just said, uh, wait till you get to the hospital. You, you never know. No, no need for that, really. Oh, you don't know how sorry I am, sir. Oh, no harm done. I swear, I didn't see you step off the curb. If you were hurt, God, I could never forgive myself. You clumsy idiot. I wish you'd broken your fool neck. What did you say? I said, if you were hurt, I could never forgive myself. No, no, not that. The other part. I, I see no reason for you to be abusive. Abusive? I should have been more careful, but it, it was equally your fault. Are you certain you're all right, sir? I think so. Thank heaven for that. I'm simply trying to say how grateful I am that you weren't injured. Lame brain jaywalker. That asinine stunt took ten years off my life. Now, see here, I'm not Let a Let me brush you off. Where were you headed? I was on my way to work. Well, I'll be happy to give you a lift if you like. Uh, no thanks. Uh, it's not far. I think I'd... I'd rather walk. Watch stop this morning? What's that? <laughs> Must have. Not like you to be late. Oh, oh, yes. No, I mean no. I mean, no, it's not. It's 9-10. Something happened on the way. Did it? Uh, Brand, can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Um, well, why are they all whispering? Who? The customers. What about them? It's just that... They're usually so quiet. I mean, nobody talks out loud in a bank, but this morning... What do you mean? You don't hear them? Hear what? <laughs> oh, I get it. Have a late night, did you? No, but you know, on the way here, I... I... Better grab some coffee. Miss Turner just put some on. Is he? Huh? Mr. Bagby. In his office. Where else would he be? Oh, thank you, Brand. Well, I better get started. Yes, you do that. Oh, I knew he'd crack sooner or later. Mr. Perfect. Hello? No, the vice president is on another line. May I take a message? Very well. Eileen. Morning, Hector. How, um, how long has he been here? A half hour. I wouldn't bother him, though. He's got an important call. All right, I'll wait till he's finished. Oh, Felicia, baby! You know I care, but... How would it look? And besides, Gladys has a nose for these things. <laughs> of course she would. I can see the headlines. Prominent banker divorces wife to marry chorus girl. <laughs> oh, oh, no, 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 Felicia, you misunderstand. I love chorus girls. I mean, not all of them. Only you. Yes, yes, that's right. Look, how about this weekend? Just you and me. <clears throat> yes? Uh, Mr. Bagby? Come in. Hold on. Someone's at the door. Yes, what is it, Poole? Uh, Mr. Bagby, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I'd like to explain. Explain what? Why I was late, sir. Were you? Ten minutes, to be exact. I didn't notice. Well, as you know, sir, my record for being prompt is spotless. I pride myself on attention to duty. Yes, yes, Poole, everyone is aware of your devotion to the bank. Well, you see, a strange thing happened, a very strange thing. Yes, uh-huh. Get on with it, you simpering idiot. You think she's going to stay on the line forever? You ruined my weekend with Felicia. I'll string you up by the thumbs. Your weekend, sir. 
What? Spoil your weekend. Oh, I wouldn't want to do that. What are you mumbling about? Look, I've got an important call here. Very pressing matter. Get on with it, man. No, of course, I understand. He said weekend. Good Lord. You don't suppose he knows about Felicia? It's impossible. I've been so careful, so, so discreet. There. I've placed her... I've placed it on hold. Now then, you had something to tell me? Pool? Pool! Another time, sir. I can see that you're busy. I'd better get to my work. Poor Mr. Poole. He looks so tired and pale. I'm all right. Oh, good morning, Mr. Poole. Good morning, Miss Turner. Did you say something? I didn't know I looked that bad. Oh, you don't. You look very well today. As do you. Oh, why, thank you. Would you like some coffee? Uh, not just yet, but thanks for asking. <laughs> Gotta make it to the game on time. First they won't steal a bag of popcorn with that southpaw pitching. Who is pitching today? You say something? No, nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Uh, good day to you, sir. Everything in apple pie order, I trust? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I bet you're the one who sent me that overdraft notice. No, sir. No what? I don't have anything to do with overdrafts. I work over there in the loan department. You do? Just see one of the tellers. I'm sure that they can straighten it out for you. Sure, <clears throat> sure. Uh... I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Pool? Yes, sir. You know Mr. Sykes of Ajax Cement? Oh, yes, Mr. Sykes. How do you do? His loan has been approved. Uh, will you see that the papers are in order? Of course. When do I get the check? Uh, Mr. Pool will take care of that for you. Uh, here's the file. Certainly, Mr. Brand. Won't you sit down, Mr. Sykes? Everything's there. Oh, I'm sure it is. It checks for $200,000. I see. A loan for $200,000. That's quite a sum. Expanding the business, Mr. Sykes? That's right. Wrong. Uh, well, which is it? Huh? You are aware that this loan must be repaid within 90 days. Sure I am. In full. No, uh, two hundred thousand. That's all I need. Put half on Lucky Lady in the six. Split the rest between Nimble Runner and Crinoline at five to one. Nobody will ever know I can pay back the loan with enough left over to save the company. It's got to work. There's no other way. Or what? Bankruptcy? What did you say? Nimble Runner and Lucky Lady. Now look here, young man. And Crinoline at five to one. What? That's a funny name. I don't have time for this. Am I going to get the check or not? Everything all right here? It better be. I'm not sure. What's going on, Poole? Uh, something wrong, Mr. Sykes. I don't know, Mr. Bagby. I signed everything. Well, then what's the problem? He just told me he's borrowing the money to bet on the horses. What? That is what you said, isn't it, sir? I said nothing of the kind. And then he said that Ajax Cement was bankrupt. Ah, he's mad. Pool. Doubtless there's been a mistake. There certainly has. If you'll come with me, I'll correct it at once. I'll talk to you later, Pool. Uh, but Mr. Beck... In my office. Yes, sir. My job. He said. I heard the whole thing. I'm the one who took his application. What's going on, Poole? Will you tell me that? What? If if I could tell you, I would. But I honestly don't know.
How would you like that, ma'am? Can I have it once, please, and some quarters for the laundromat? Of course. 180, 190, 200. Just a moment, I'll get your receipt. I want it in the form of a cashier's check. Oh, I'll need to get it countersigned. Uh, money order, then. Yes, sir. That can't be all I have. Check the balance again. I've already checked it twice. If you'd like a printout of your transactions... I would, yes, so I can compare it to my records. There must be some mistake. 401, 402, 403... 20 years, the same window. Not one promotion. Nope, not me. Hello, Smithers. Oh, hello, Mr. Poole. Don't worry, you'll get that promotion. Do you really think so? I mean, what promotion? Stick with it, you'll see. Yes, of course, b but how? Have a little faith. It's finally happening. It is? Yep, old nose of the grindstone seems to have flipped out. Who are you talking about? Poole, who else? He's been acting goofy all morning. Well, why shouldn't he? He's entitled to once in a while. He does all the work around here. <laughs> Guys like that are all alike. Gutless wonders. Put the pressure on and they go to pieces. Know what I mean? I'm not sure that I do. You phony. Don't you know a real gentleman when you see one? Got any of that coffee left? Oh, uh, hi, Poole. Certainly. Here you are. Smells good. It's fresh. Nice and hot, too. You do all of the work and get none of the credit. You should speak up more and assert yourself. But I guess that's not in your nature. Miss Turner? Yes? There's something I've been meaning to say to you. There is? And I hope you won't be offended. Oh, I'm sure I won't. But, well... Yes, Mr. Poole? I want to thank you. Thank me? For your kind thoughts. I don't think I quite understand, Mr. Poole. Romancing the help, eh, Poole? Brand, please. Well, who can blame you? Miss Turner's the prettiest girl in the new accounts department. Just saying absolutely nothing. I haven't seen such an aggregation of beasts since the last time I went to the circus. Oh, I'm sure that's not true. Yeah, a lot of action around the old coffee station lately. That's no surprise. Not much chance for socializing on the job, is there? Brand, if I could get a word in... Yeah, go ahead. You were saying, Mr. Poole? She's probably a tiger. That the sweet prim ones have their cages and they refer to the jungle. That's enough, Brand. Hey, watch it! Oh, sorry. You spilled coffee all over my shirt. I'll get a napkin. It was an accident. No, it wasn't. You did that deliberately. He said it was an accident. I'll see you later about this, Poole. Good for you. I really didn't intend to do that. I'm sure you didn't. He was only joking. Maybe he was and maybe he wasn't, but he sure had it coming. Well, I suppose I should get back to my desk. Uh, yes, I suppose so. Or else it will be time for lunch. Will it? I mean, oh, it will. And then we'll all be having our lunches, won't we? I, I guess you're right. I mean, those who brought them... And those who didn't will go out somewhere. For lunch, I mean. Alone or together. Yes, yes, they certainly will. Well, back to the old grindstone. It's been nice talking with you. Nice talking with you, too. Bye now. Uh, bye. Oh, uh, Miss Turner. Mr. Poole? One more thing. I hope... Yes? I hope you have a nice day. I feel the same way, exactly. Such a gentleman. It isn't fair. It just isn't fair. I said, don't worry, Smithers. Who? Oh, Poole, uh, were you speaking to me? Mr. Bagby's a fair man. Mr. Bagby? Yes, I'm sure he is. Good things come to those who wait. What's he watching me for? Oh, no reason. Don't let it distract you. They'll be 
sorry. Not much longer now. At 4.30 this afternoon, I go into the vault like I always do. I'll take my briefcase with me. No one will suspect a thing. I'll fill it with currency and be on a ship to Bermuda by nightfall. <laughs> yes, indeed. All that money. As much as I can carry. I wonder how long it will take them to discover it's gone. It's not possible. Smithers? Oh, Miller. Hi there, Mr. Poole. Got a minute? Sure do. Pretty quiet morning. Is that what you call it? Well, as opposed to payday, then everybody and his brother shows up. Get a little rowdy sometimes, trying to cut line and everything. But I keep him in order. Teach him respect for the uniform. <laughs> you can count on me. I know I can. That's why I wanted a word in your ear. What's up? How long have you been a guard here? Uh, quite a few years now. Get my pension before long. And that gun in your holster, is it... Is it the same one you've always had? Sure is. Nothing beats a 38. Keep it oiled up real good. You could use it then. I mean, if you had to. Well, what do you think I got it on my belt for, Hector? To hold my pants up? Good. That's good. Uh, why do you ask? I'm not sure, but I suggest taking up a post by the door, keep your eyes open, and... Don't say anything to anyone just yet. I get you. Mom's the word. There he is. Was he waiting for me? Hello again. Miss Turner. I was just going back to my desk. Perfect timing. Isn't it? I, I mean, it is. Miss Turner, may I speak to you? Anytime at all. What I have to tell you is very important. Yes, Mr. Poole? Not here in front of everyone. Dreadfully important. Come with me. Where are we going? Somewhere private. I like the sound of that. Mr. Jones's office is empty since he transferred. Next to Mr. Bagby's, no one ever goes in there. Perfect. That seems like a good idea. If you're sure you don't mind. As long as you can spare the time... This won't take long. Take all the time you want. Well, what is it? You'll think I'm crazy. Is something wrong? Terribly, and I don't know who else to talk to. I'm here. Miss Turner, I keep hearing voices. People talking, their lips don't move but I can hear their voices clearly. I've got this ringing in my head. Oh, no. Well, it's, it's not what you think, Miss Turner. I mean, I, I can read people's minds. I don't know if I can help you uh, with a thing like that. I'll prove it to you. Think, think something, anything at all. Well, I have to hand it to him. This is an original approach. Why did it take him so long to gather up his courage? Because it only happened this morning. What did? At least that was the first time I noticed it. He didn't notice me until this morning? No, not you. The voices. Mr. Poole... They won't stop. Perhaps you should lie down for a few minutes. Mm, maybe later. I'm trying to tell you something. I know you are. No, this is serious. Do you think I enjoy hearing people's thoughts? I'm sure I have no idea. Well, try to imagine. It's like seeing people with their clothes off. Which people would that be? Well, uh, Miss Turner, I, I have reason to believe that someone may try to rob the bank this afternoon. Mr. Brand was right. He's coming unglued. No, I am not unglued. It's true. I mean, at least I think it is. You heard them say that. Well, in a manner of speaking. Well, then, in that case, you should do something about it. But what if I'm wrong? You have a responsibility to the bank, to the stockholders and depositors. I suppose I do. We could talk about it over lunch. I mean, one could, two people, whoever they might be... If they wanted to, that is. Otherwise, just one, alone, talking about it to himself. Uh, of course, that might be a bit lonely, for some people at least. Unless... There's no time to waste. 
No, definitely not. I have to get out of here. Why? I mean, what's your hurry? Have we finished our conversation? I, I thought... I've got to tell Mr. Bagby. From now on, Mr. Poole, you may call me Helen. Mr. Bagby. Oh, there you are, Poole. I want to talk to you. Sir, I... I'm worried about you, Poole. About me? But, but, sir... I've always considered you one of my best men. So why, Poole? Why what? Just tell me straight out. We lost the Ajax cement account this morning because of that nonsense a while ago. Something wrong at home. The wife, perhaps? I'm not married. Oh. Well, something's bothering you. Yes. Have a seat. I'd prefer to stand. Then out with it. Well, uh, I don't know how to put this, Mr. Bagby. Speak up, Poole. I'm with you. You won't believe me. Of course I'll believe you. You're as honest as the day is long. Well, you've been like a son to me. Well, a, a son-in-law, at least. If you were, which you're not, legally speaking. But nonetheless... Mr. Bagby, Mr. Smithers is... is... Smithers? Well, what about him? He's planning to rob the bank. Say what? See, I told you. Would you mind repeating that? Smithers. Old Mr. Smithers? Old Mr. Smithers. He's sitting on his stool right now, planning it out. At precisely 4.30, he's going into the vault. He does that every day. Exactly. But this time, he'll have his briefcase with him, and he'll fill it up with banknotes, as much as he can carry. And by tonight, he'll be on a boat to the Caribbean. How do you know? Um, I heard him talking about it. But well, he's one of our oldest and most trusted employees. Well, well, he was here when I took over the bank. I absolutely refuse to believe. I swear it, sir. He has it all worked out. Wait a minute. I take your point. Who's the one who ends up stealing the company funds? Isn't it always the most trusted employee? The man you'd least suspect? The man who's completely reliable for years until that one moment when everybody relaxes their guard and... Gotcha! He strikes! Good work, Poole! I wish it weren't true. I sort of admire Mr. Smithers. He's always there, steady as a rock, going his own way. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't overheard it myself. Well, no time for sentiment. Quick now, tell me the details. Um... Uh, well... At 4.30 on the dot, it starts. Okay, and Mr. Smithers will finish counting out his drawer as he always does, by the numbers. Thank you, folks. Good night now. Don't yeah, work too thanks. long. And See as soon you. as we lock the doors... See you Wednesday. You take care now. Good night, Rich. He'll close up his cage. Count down the drawer. 73, 74... 75, plus the bills. He'll stand up and go to the vault with the deposit, as he always does. The last teller, with his briefcase. He'll be back there alone to lock up the vault. Only this time, things will be different. When he comes out, his briefcase will be heavy. Very heavy. Miller, may I see you a moment? Yes, sir. Rich, let me out, please. Okay, be right there. I'm waiting. Gotcha. What? I'll take that briefcase. Here, here. What? Shall I cuff him? Not till we see the evidence. Looks pretty heavy to me. Dump it on the desk. I'm your witness. Sure thing. What do you think you're doing? What does it look like? Your mistake, Mr. Smithers, was in assuming that we were all asleep. A great mistake. But nothing gets by this institution. As a matter of fact, I've had my eye on you for a long time. You sure this is his briefcase? Of course it is. Duly noted. He admits it. 
One half sandwich. Clip on necktie. Change of socks. Comb. One book. How to profit from Armageddon. And uh, seven ballpoint pens. Where's the money? Has everyone gone insane? What money? Pool! Where's that idiot pool? Here, sir. So he was going to steal the money. He was going to take a trip to Bermuda. That was his story, huh? Mr. Bagby, I heard him. And who was he talking to, Mr. Pool? Well, he wasn't talking to anyone, not exactly. Oh? What was he doing? Sending smoke signals? He was... thinking. He was what? He was thinking. Well, that explains everything. Mr. Smithers, please forgive us all for this unfortunate intrusion. Well, I... I guess we all make mistakes. I should have known that what I was told was impossible on the face of it. Poole, do you know what I'm thinking? I'm fired. Kindly clear out your desk at once. Mr. Smithers, I don't know what to say. I'm very sorry. Return Mr. Smithers' possessions and let him pass. Right away. How did you know? What? It's true, of course, Mr. Poole. Yes, it's a little dream of mine. Have you ever had a dream? I have, often. People look at me and all they see is a funny little man, frayed and old, and they never know. I have the dream almost every day. I had it yesterday and the day before that. Oh, I don't always plan on Bermuda, though. Sometimes it's London... Paris, Fiji, beautiful, exotic places, thousands of miles from here. Places where there are no ledgers to keep, where I'm not a little man with no future and no past. I think of filling my briefcase with the bank's money, but I never go through with it. Do you know why? I've lived with it too long. I'm old and set in my ways. And besides, Mr. Poole, I'm a coward. Smithers, please. Will you open the door now, please, Rich? Sure. Uh, take care of yourself. Can I help you with anything? I've got it. I guess this is goodbye, Miss Turner. It may be a blessing in disguise for your career, a man with your abilities. Much more than mind reading. Strange delusion. But with the proper medical care, it'll go away. It's not a delusion, Miss Turner. There, you see, I can read your thoughts. But how? Until this morning, everything was normal. I was happy. Well, it, at least I wasn't unhappy. I had my friends, my job, and now this. I thought it was a gift. Well, it's no gift. It's an embarrassment. It's been nothing but trouble to me. I never imagined people were the way they are. You know, we do things without thinking about them, and we think things without the slightest intention of doing them. I've learned one thing. People are not what we think they are. Ooh. Oh, thank heaven I caught you. That was the Ajax Cement Company on the phone. Mr. Sykes has been arrested. I know, for gambling with the company money. I tried to tell you that earlier. Two hundred thousand dollars if that loan had gone through. Mr. Poole, <clears throat> about your job. It's still yours, if you're interested. Why, that windbag. Mr. Poole, if you can really hear me, you're wasted in that job. If you let him take you back on the same terms, you're crazy. Everybody knows you should be in charge of the accounts department. Well, what do you say? Well, everyone knows I should be in charge of the accounts department, Mr. Bagby. In charge? Good. That would mean he'd move into Mr. Jones's old office. 
That would mean he'd... I'd move into Mr. Jones's old office. Now, really, Poole. This is absurd. What am I standing here wasting time for? Don't let him bamboozle you. Felicia's waiting. Man, oh man, what a weekend this is going to be. Stand up for yourself. He needs you more than you need him. Uh, would you excuse us, Miss Turner? We have some business to discuss. All right, if you're sure. I'm sure. Business? What business? The business of Felicia and your wife, Gladys. What? I know all about it. I know where you're meeting her and when. What's impossible? No one knows about the trip or the apartment on Riverside Drive. Riverside Drive, Mr. Bagby. Am I right? Oh, all right, you win. In charge of accounts in the office next to mine. You won't say anything to anyone, will you? Not a word, Mr. Bagby. Not a word. Oh, and I forgot, there's one more thing. At the bank's expense, I'd like you to buy a round-trip ticket to Bermuda. Have it made out in the name of J.L. Smithers. I think he'd like a vacation. Are you out of your mind? Mr. Bagby? Oh. One ticket to Bermuda. Shall we go, Miss Turner? If you like. I'd go anywhere with you, but I wish you'd call me Helen. Have a good night, folks. We'll try. May I see you home, Helen? Well, I don't know. Of course you can, Hector. What do you think I've been waiting for? Paper, get your afternoon paper. Latest stocks. Oh, just a second, do you mind? Not at all. Oh, hi, Mr. Poole. Well, was I right or was I right? Was it your lucky day? I'd say so. Uh, give me a paper, will you? Sure, this one's on the house. Oh, no, no, no. I don't like to owe anybody. Heads. You win. Hey, why'd you do that? I had that other quarter standing up all day, and nobody knocked it over till now. Well, I guess if you're the guy who stood it up, you're the guy who can knock it down. There goes your luck. Could be it's just beginning. Paper, get your late edition paper. What was that all about? Oh, nothing. Wait. What is it? Think something, Helen. Think anything. Oh, I am. Believe me. Did you get that? No, I didn't. I didn't hear anything at all. It's gone. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> if you say so, dear. <laughs> Toss a coin. Any coin, and one time in a million, it will land on its edge. But all it takes to knock it over is a slight vibration, a light blow, or even a vagrant dream. Mr. Hector B. Poole, a human coin on edge for a brief time, in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone.
A Penny for Your Thoughts, starring David Eigenberg with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by George Clayton Johnson. Heard in the cast were Michelle Graff, Doug James, Jamie Barron, Jeff Lupatin, Kurt Napick, Joby Cerny, Frenette Lebo, Peggy Roeder, Alex Sopner, Carl Amari, Karen Olson, Tracy Hernandez, Christina Verba, and Vince Amari. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for the Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Street. Bus driver. Yes, sir. There's a restaurant I've seen. A buffet. Ah, there are lots of restaurants along here. Carolyn's Country Kitchen, I believe it's called. With the chicken special. Oh, yeah, yeah. Corner of 17th. That way you went off. Indeed. I've been looking forward to trying it. All you can eat, I understand. Oh, knock yourself out. Oh, I shall, I assure you. I shall. Next stop, 17. 17. Here you go. Hey, watch your step. Yeah, um, oh, oh, wait a minute. Yes? Well, when you got on, did you ever give me that transfer? Most certainly. There was such a crowd, but I finally found it. Remember? Uh, yeah. If you say so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have a nice night. I shall. Here's your check. Ah, yes, the check. Get you anything else? Another glass of iced tea, perhaps. Refills are free of charge, I presume. Nadine will get it for you. I'm off the clock now. And pay up front. Certainly. Oh, miss. Yeah? Might I trouble you for one more plate of your delicious fried chicken? That makes three. Your policy is all you can eat, is it not? (sighs) Another chicken platter coming up. Thanks, Mrs. Nolan. Oh, don't mention it, Bernice. Hey, see you Saturday for the baby back ribs. You take care now. Enjoy your meal, sir? Very much. I couldn't eat another bite. That's nice. Cash or charge? Oh, cash, of course. I don't believe in credit cards. All that interest. I know what you mean. That'll be... Oh, my. Something wrong. What a bother. Do you know what's happened? Why don't you tell me? My wife borrowed from my wallet and forgot to leave anything for me. Hmm. Will you take a check? Like it says on the sign, no checks. Yes, yes, I see. Well, not to worry. My name is, um, James Brocklehurst. I'm with the Plyo Film Corporation. Perhaps you've heard of it. Here, let me give you my business card, if I can find one. Card won't do me any good. Oh, my. Most embarrassing for me as well as for yourself. In that case, I insist on returning tomorrow evening to reimburse you in full. Uh, would you move it, pal? I gotta pay and get home. 
Uh, of course. Tomorrow evening, then, at this exact hour, I'll include a generous tip as well. Thank you for your kind understanding. Hey! Thank you. What's the matter with that guy? I'm not sure, but I think he just stiffed me. Meet Mr. Luther Aorta. A normal enough man, at least in his own mind. Like so many people, he enjoys getting something for nothing. But for him, it has become an obsession and a way of life. So it isn't surprising that he's attracted by words like all you can eat and no limit and best of all, free. That's the magic syllable. It does strange and wonderful things to the metabolism. In fact, it's his whole reason for living. Unfortunately, Mr. Aorta is about to discover that such signs don't necessarily tell the truth. Because though the offer in question may be free, it sometimes comes with a one-way ticket to the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Free Dirt, starring Eric Bogosian, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Luther? Hmm? Luther, I'm talking to you. Yes, dear. Breakfast is ready. Good, good. If you want yours, you'll have to get that junk off the table. Oh, but it isn't junk, dear. I found several good coupons in this morning's paper. You and your coupons. Samples for the cost of a postage stamp. We can get new packets of seeds absolutely free. Seeds? You've got a hundred packages of those things already. Yes, dear, I know, but these are special. I'll bet. They are. Look. Would you clear off the table, please? From the largest seed company in the U.S., free peaches, free cucumbers, free asparagus, and free ranunculus. Can you just taste them? What are you going to do, eat the seeds in a bowl with milk? Of course not. I'm going to plant them. Oh, you are. Where? In the backyard. They'll make a lovely garden. I hate to disappoint you, but plants need something our yard doesn't have. And what's that, dear? Dirt. Dirt? Topsoil, loam, there's nothing but rocks out there. Yes, you're right. But don't worry, I'll find some fresh dirt and bring it home. From where? That may require some thought. Just a minute. Hmm? Breakfast first? Oh, yes, breakfast. You drive me to work today, remember? Of course. Sit down and eat, I'm going to be late. I was just... Thinking about the dirt. Where were you last night, anyway? I rode the bus into town. Some things I had to take care of. The bus, huh? I'm surprised you were willing to pay the fare. Cheaper than the cost of gas nowadays. It worked out very well, actually. Did you eat anything? To be sure, I found something on the way. <laughs> a bargain, no doubt. Quite a remarkable one, in fact. You would have been proud of me. I hope so. Where does one go to get dirt, I wonder? Oh, Luther. A quarry would have some, but they'd probably charge a lot of money. Finish your eggs. I'm late as it is. Just cleaning my plate. It's a crime to waste food. Let's see now. Nothing on the way home but offices, real estate companies. Perhaps the nursery. No, packaged soil would cost a fortune. Oh well, have to give this some serious consideration. Or double your money back. Hmm? That's right. If you're not 100% satisfied with your new Ellison steam cleaner, return it to the factory and get double your money back. Call toll free today. All right, the Ellison Company, Box 403, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And now, back to music for your morning commute. Box 403, Box 403, where's a pencil? Wait a minute! 
I don't believe my eyes. Free dirt apply within. Within where? Uh, of course, Lilyvale Cemetery. Where better to go for rich parturient soil? Hello? Hello, anyone? Anyone at all? Guess not. Help you, sir? Oh, I didn't see you there, so many tombstones. Getting crowded. What can we do for you? Well, now, maybe it's what I can do for you. Ain't gonna sell me nothing. This is a poor place. Not enough customers, if you know what I mean. No, 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 no. I'm not selling anything. That isn't it at all. I was driving by, and I saw the sign. You're offering free dirt. Yep. Left over from the grave digging. Well, I'm here to take some of that dirt off your hands. If there's any left, that is. Oh, there's plenty, all right. It builds up. And it's free, you say? No strings. Free as a bird. How much may one have? Much as you want. On what days? Any day there's some fresh, but you gotta do the haul on yourself. You couldn't do that for me. Can't. If I was to leave, there wouldn't be nobody alive left here, would there? <laughs> Anyways, I don't have a truck. You? No, but I might be able to borrow one. Now, if you don't mind, May I see the dirt? Even it out now. I want to get as much as possible in one load. Okay, mister. Otherwise, I'll have to pay you for two trips. Relax. We're getting it all. Nice truck. It will do. Where'd you get it? My neighbor, Mr. Santucci. I promised to share the bounty with him. Bounty? The fruits of my labor. It's a long story. Good thing your gravediggers were here. Always looking for extra work. Dig it up or shovel it someplace else. Same difference. You're sure you don't mind my taking it all? Glad to be rid of it. Well, it certainly does look like good soil. One should be able to grow anything in that. Ought to. Been fertilized enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose it has. All right, gentlemen, that's the last of it. I'll meet you at the house. Thank you, my good man. You've made my day. Don't mention it. Good dirt, I guess. For some people. Now me, I don't like the touch of it. Setting out here all week and it's still damp. I don't even like the look of it. Sure it came out of new ground? No old graves underneath? Hard to say. The plots are pretty close together. Well, don't tell that aorta guy. Yeah, you're probably gonna make mud pies out of it. <laughs> I'd as soon not know. Just be sure he pays you. That's about it. Good, very good. You've distributed it perfectly. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, yeah. Real beautiful. I'll set to work while it's still moist. You want to pay us now? Now? That's the general idea. Oh, dear me, no. That wouldn't do at all. Uh, for income tax purposes, I'll have to ask you to send a bill. A bill? 
Don't know the address here. Not here. My office. The Magnetic Cartridge Corporation. 163 Fairmont. Yes, that's it. I'll jot it down for you. Fairmont, huh? What part of the city is that in? The far side. Now, if you'll put the wheelbarrow and shovels in my car, I'll drive you back to Lilyvale. Just give me a moment. I can hardly wait. Peas, carrots, tomatoes, onions, squash, rutabaga, turnips, lettuce, corn, watermelon, and ranunculus. What a harvest this is going to be. I wonder what will come up first. Let's start with this one. What are you doing, Mr. Aorta? Good afternoon, Mrs. Santucci. I'm planting my very own garden. Where'd the dirt come from? The graveyard. But it's wonderful dirt. Really. Make sure you get the truck clean. My husband don't like no dirt in it. Oh, I will. Completely. And do thank him for me. Hmm. <laughs> graveyard, huh? Yes, just look how nice and moist it is. Reach over the fence and hold out your hand. See? Positively brimming with life. That what you call it? Think of the things that will grow out of this mulch, and all of it positively free. You can have it. Feels funny. And the color ain't right. Oh, it's splendid, I assure you. Excuse me, I have to drive the workmen. I'll hose the truck off soon as I get back. Good as new! Even smells funny. Now I gotta wash my hands. Don't know what it is, but something about that dirt just ain't right. And parsley, and watercress, and zucchini, and sweet potatoes. Yes. And cabbage and string beans and even red peppers. Oh, what a succulent harvest this will be. There, there, let the soil do its magic. For now, my precious seeds, prepare to deliver your wonders. see. Early? Or late? What time's it getting to be anyway? You were supposed to pick me up from work, or didn't you remember? Oh no, I'm sorry, dear. Truly I am. But you see, I've been out here all afternoon, working my fingers to the bone. Doing what? Gardening. Isn't it magnificent? I've marked each variety with twine. I've even dug a small drainage ditch between the rows, so the water can run off. And do you know what I did today? I had to take a cab all the way home because my husband forgot I was alive. It slipped his mind. A thousand apologies, dear. It won't happen again. You bet it won't. This is the last time I let you have the car. And from now on, you can take the bus every day. Myrtle, dear, may I ask one question? No. What's for dinner tonight? I'm feeling a bit peckish. Open a can. Hmm? <laughs> ah. 
Luther. Go back to sleep, dear. What in the world? Are... Just opening the window a crack. What for? Ventilation. Smell that. Come back to bed. It's three o'clock in the morning. I know, I know, but I simply had to get a good whiff. Isn't the night air delicious? Like it's alive. Oh, crazy man. Listen. You can almost hear the little seeds reaching up from the earth, trying to be born. Didn't you hear me? I heard you. Come! Why? You won't believe it! What is the matter with you? I've got to show you something. I have to be at the office in 20 minutes. Let go of my arm. Look! Where did all these plants come from? Where do you think? I planted the seeds yesterday. Now look at them. Oh, that's ridiculous. You got up early, drove to the nursery, and brought them back here somehow. Don't you be ridiculous. The squash, the beans. Do you realize what a miracle this is? You plant something and it grows. That's no kind of miracle. In one night? Use your eyes, woman. The corn is as high as an elephant's eye. It's impossible. It's not possible. Is it? Luther, if you did this to impress me, it's... No, I swear to you. All this happened in 24 hours. Less than that. Look at these cucumbers. Delicious. Delicious. Look, I haven't got time for you. I'm late enough. Try a carrot. Take a bite. Just one little bite. Oh, <laughs> What's the matter? Don't you like it? Are you kidding? Why? What's wrong with it? Mm, it tastes like... Ugh, dirt. This is Luther Aorta. Send a news truck over at once. I've got something big to show you. Pardon? 1217 Sunnyview Lane. Someone has to take pictures of this. People won't believe it if they don't see it with their own eyes. Has there been an accident, sir? Not an accident. Something glorious, stupendous. Something positively not of this world. Well? It's a nice garden, I'll give you that. Yeah, same here. But I don't see anything unusual about it. I told you, the seeds were planted only yesterday. It all came up overnight. Is that a fact? Ask my wife. She'll tell you as soon as she gets home. Mr. Aorta, we appreciate your call, but we're a television station, not the university. Do you see the size of it? Well, it looks exactly like what it is. A vegetable garden in someone's backyard. Bigger than most, but that isn't really news. So you're not interested in miracles? Only the ones that can be proved. All right, then. I'll prove it to you. And how will you do that? I'll rip out all of these plants and do it again. You can see for yourself tomorrow. Would that be proof? Yes, sir. That would be proof. Assuming there was documentation, footage of you doing it, and the results, then that would mean cameras around the clock. And unfortunately, that's just not in our budget. We have other stories to cover. I'm sure you understand. Now, if you'll excuse us. But think what a breakthrough this is. Food for the world, instantly. 
That would be a miracle. Would? It already is! Then how do you explain it? I can't, but it's happened. Oh, well, looks like it's been happening for a while. What do you mean? Well, these leaves. They're already turning black around the edges. They can't be. I'm afraid so. They've reached their maturity. Now they're going to seed. Then I'll plant some more. You do that. And when you do, give us a call. I will. I'll get right on it. You can count on me. I'm sure we can. Bye now, Mr. A. A-O-R-T-A. -A. Straight from the heart. I've seen some nutcases before, but this one is the king. Could have saved us a trip if he told us the whole story in the first place. Make sure he does the next time. Oh, think he'll call again? <laughs> you know it. But I hope we're out on a real story when he does. <laughs> <laughs> Now get that head of lettuce there on the end. Pull. Got it. Looks like it's six months old. It's rotting already. You believe me, don't you, Mr. Santucci? I wouldn't, except my wife saw you planting the seeds. Yes, she stood right where you are, leaning over the fence. I'll tell you flat out, I've never seen anything like it in my whole life, and I was brought up on a farm. It just don't make sense. It must have been the dirt. Could be. Can't think of anything else. Made a nice layer of topsoil. Now it's all sucked clean. You need some more fertilizer. I wouldn't know what kind to get. Unless... There is plenty more where this came from. That's what the caretaker said. Might work. Might not. I'll tell you one thing, though. I wouldn't be caught dead eating any of this stuff. It ain't normal. That's the point. It isn't. It grew so thick, ripened so fast. Sell it to the college, maybe. That's an idea. Or the agriculture department. Could be you come up with something brand new. Yes, yes. Maybe I have. I'll call them first thing in the morning. But for now, I'd better spread some fresh dirt. Mr. Santucci, what are you doing tonight? Why do you ask? I was thinking we could go back and get some more in your truck. Ah, uh, I don't know. If it works, we might even get a patent out of it. At least the Guinness Book of World Records. Partners. What do you say? Where did it come from? Not far. We can be back before dinner. Don't worry, we'll be fine. It's only a cemetery. Never liked cemeteries. It won't take long. The caretaker's shack is just ahead. Late for dinner and the missus will kill me. We'll be in and out in no time. You'll see. Sure got dark fast. It's the trees and the statues. Here we are. Hello? Hello? Maybe we should come back. Nonsense. It has to be now, while the plants can be revived. Well, it's my truck, and I say we get gone. There's nothing but dead folks here. Then no one should object if we drive on in. Help you, fellas? Hey! Don't go creeping up on people like that. Sorry, mister. Not many visitors this time of day. Is that you, Mr. A? Yes, I wanted to ask you. How'd that free dirt work out? Very well. I was wondering if you could spare a little more. I guess so. Planted a fresh one this morning. A fresh what? New man for the Saad Sheraton. <laughs> Got his bed turned down and everything. Good, good. Then we'll bring the truck in if you don't mind. Better watch those tires. Hit a sinkhole and you're stuck for the night. No triple A. Of course, of course. Thank you, my good man. You don't know what this means to me. Hope you brought a flashlight. They like it nice and dark out here. Uh, come on, Aorta. Let's get this fool thing done.
Barney. How much longer? Coming. Your dinner's cold. Be right there, I said. That's it. I'm going inside. But we're almost done. One more wheelbarrow full, and the whole garden will be covered. Well, it's your yard. You finish it. Don't know why I let you talk me into this in the first place. Think of the publicity. Our pictures in the paper. Two neighbors who can feed the world. Lots of luck, pal. I gotta take a shower to get this stink off me. There. A new layer spread out. Nice and even. That ought to do it. Myrtle! Myrtle, where are you? What are you doing with the suitcase? What does it look like I'm doing? I'm getting out. But why? Don't try to stop me, Luther. And I'm taking the car. You can just fend for yourself. I think I deserve an explanation. Oh, you do. Take a guess. I can't stand living with you anymore. Like Mrs. Santucci says, you're a loony. Do this and you'll be sorry. Are you threatening me? No, no. But those plants, they might be worth a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, in your dreams. Keep away from me. Tomorrow I'm going to have someone from the university come over and take a look. They're worth a fortune. Mr. Santucci agrees. <laughs> they might be worth nothing. That's what they might be worth. You know why? Because they're as loony as you are. That's not true. They're a miracle of horticulture. Then if you know what's good for you, you'll eat those miracles, because there isn't anything else in the house. Do your own shopping. I've had it! <sighs> She'll be back. Just you watch. She's right about one thing, though. The refrigerator's as good as empty. And the cupboard was bare. Oh, well. I've got my vegetables, ripe and ready to eat. Where's the laundry basket? I'll fill it up and dine like a king. squash, eggplants as big as your head. So what if they're a little ripe? Fabulous, fabulous. Waste not, want not. <sighs> Looks like I'm going to be a vegan for a while. Well, so be it. Tonight the vegetables, tomorrow the world. Boiled, sautéed, any way at all. How about a nice hearty soup and a casserole? Potatoes au gratin, yes. A little salt and pepper, a few spices, and voila. Luther Aorta's Blue Plate Special, coming up. some condiments. Catsup. Worcestershire, a touch of brown mustard. You gorgeous turnip, you. Now, something to wash it down.
Ah, I'm still not full. Something more to fill the hole. Let me see what's left. Can't leave anything to waste. Who's there? That you, Arnie? Who's in my backyard? The cat. Or raccoons. Come to steal by the light of the moon. Well, I will not have it. Get away! Go on, scat! What? Where did this come from? Somebody's dug a hole. A deep one. Someone or something. About six feet. But how. Whoa! Felt like something tripped me. But what? I've got to climb out. This is ridiculous. Can't get hold of a thing. Stop it! Stop pushing the rotten vegetables in! Who's doing this? What are you trying to do? Bury me? Stop! I tell you! Let me out! So, what do you think it was? What? Last night. Didn't you hear it? I didn't hear nothing. <laughs> well, I did. All night long. Like something digging uh, with their hands, only... Only what? Not exactly digging. Chewing is more like it. Do you think some animals got into that crazy man's backyard? <sighs> Who cares? More there than he can eat. <laughs> Don't be so sure. He's got some belly on him. Soon as the next crop comes in, I get my pick. A miracle, he says. We better make some money out of it. My back's killing me. Oh, there he is now. That ain't him. It was him. I could tell. Go out and look. Look for what? The loony. See what he's up to. You go. You. <sighs> All right, Ida. If that'll make you happy. all the rotten stuff. He cleaned them up pretty good. Hey, order? Hey, hey, order! You all right in there? Hey, what did you do with the old vegetables? Hey, are you... Oh, jeez. What happened? You okay, buddy? Wake up! What's wrong with him? I don't know. He was just laying here. Take his pulse. Oh, he's dead. Turn him over. Oh, poor guy. Sure got a gut on him. Bigger than ever. What's that stuff around his mouth? Looks like dirt. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <gasps> Don't you get it, Arnie? The whole yard's empty. And you know what he did with it. He ate himself to death. <laughs> no. 
End of a very strange incident in the annals of home gardening. Whether Mr. Aorta finally climbed out of that hole or ate his way out doesn't really matter. But an autopsy found several pounds of dirt and nothing else in his bloated stomach. And Mr. Santucci, his unwitting partner, slept very little that night, waiting for the next deadly crop to appear. Like Mr. Aorta, he began to wonder if there are some things, free or not, that are best left to the twilight zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Free Dirt, starring Eric Bogosian with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Meg Falcon, Roderick Peoples, Linda Reiter, David Darlow, Elizabeth Lido, Roger Mueller, Amber Lake, Jeff Lupiton, Doug James, Karen Olson, Dana Bokor, and Carl Amari. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for the Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Yes? Hi, Marilyn. Oh, hi, Val. Guess what? What? I got a catalog this morning. Hmm, that's nice. I'll hold it up so you can see. Didn't you hear me? I said I got What's a... What's so special about a catalog? You get a lot of them, don't you? Yes, but this one is from the Bureau. Oh. Well, isn't that simply the greatest? I suppose so. You suppose? Wait till you see it. It's beautiful. It's... I know. You think you do, but you can't. Not until you've seen it for yourself. I got one, too. You did? Why didn't you call me? I, I was going to. Honest. Isn't it wonderful? Oh, I can hardly wait. How long does it take, do you think? I don't know. A few days? But the transformation prom's next week. They have to give us time to decide. I don't need time. I've already made up my mind. You have? Number 12. They're so beautiful, with perfect blonde hair and those little noses that turn up at the end. My mother's a number 12. I know, and she looks so fabulous. Don't you think she looks fabulous? My mother's a number 14, but I always thought your mother looks so much better. Who wants to be a brunette? Nobody has dark hair nowadays. There's this one girl at school, that senior Jennifer. Well, she picked number 14. What a mistake. 
nobody liked it. She tried to dye her hair last week and it came out all red and springy looking. Now she wears extra makeup. She thinks we won't notice. But her hair doesn't go with anything else. I have red hair. Oh, uh, I know. Do you think there's something wrong with red hair? No. Honest. It's great. Really. But when you think about what you'll look like after the transformation, isn't it dreamy? Maybe I'll pick number 15. They have such nice long legs. Of course, number 11 does too, just like a dancer. Not as slim as number 12, but... I gotta go. To look at your catalog, I bet. Hold it up to the phone so I can see. It's not here. Well, where is it? You didn't lose it, did you? Better check, because if you did... My mother's got it. Oh, good. I mean, I want to ask her a question. Do you think she's happy being a number 12? If she could give me her opinion before... Yeah, I'll tell her. Bye, Val. Portrait of an American girl caught in that transition known as the terrible teens. The place? A world very much like our own, with all the modern conveniences that make life healthy, happy, and safe. The time? Only a few years from now, when the passage into adulthood has been rendered as pleasant and painless as possible. The answer is technology, and the guarantee that beauty is available not only to the lucky few, but to all, equally and without prejudice. Call it the American dream. For what young girl would not want to be beautiful? Given the chance, what girl will not happily exchange a plain face for a pretty one, an overweight body for a slender one, a lonely adolescence for popularity? It's a dream that might happen tomorrow. But as we're about to see, it's already happening in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Number 12 Looks Just Like You, starring Bonnie Somerville and Charles Shaughnessy. With Stacy Keach as your narrator. What are you doing, honey? I'm looking at the scrapbook. My old scrapbook? Oh, dear. How embarrassing. I think it's nice. You should be looking at your new catalog. Here, I brought it back. That's all right. They all look so pretty, don't they? I can't decide. The 17 reminds me of your father. His features, I mean. But I think the 12 might suit you better. Mm Mm-hmm. What do you think? I don't know. I thought we should look at it together, all right? If you say so. Of course, you can't see the details clearly. The holograms are so small. Just the basic faces and figures and how they look wearing different outfits. But you get the idea. What's the matter? Nothing. Are you listening to me? I'm sorry, mothers. Some of the pictures in this old album... Sometimes I don't understand you, darling. What do you mean? Most girls your age are thrilled to death when it's time to choose a pattern. Have you even looked at the catalog? Yes. I remember how excited I was before I made my choice. I couldn't sleep for three nights. The patterns were all so lovely. I couldn't make up my mind. (laughs) My mother had to help me decide. I finally chose number 12. I guess that's everyone's favorite. Is it? Aren't you excited? Mm Mm-hmm. What is it in that old album that's so fascinating? The way you were. Before. Oh, you can't be serious. This page, for instance. Not that one. It is you, isn't it? See? It says Lana Donnelly. Oh, I can't believe how plain I was. No wonder I didn't have any friends as a child. The sandy hair, all those freckles. Like mine? Well, that's what you inherited. But when I see that thick waist in the picture, those ugly, shapeless legs, I absolutely want to cringe. I wish your father hadn't given you this book. Hard to believe, I know, but I'm afraid the awful truth is it's me. Before my transformation. I knew it. I was such a sight. I wouldn't say that. I think you were beautiful. I really do. (laughs) Well, I certainly don't. I was unbearably homely. It was always hard on me at school until, well, thank goodness for the transformation. It's the most marvelous thing that could happen to a person, and it didn't come a moment too soon. Am I very homely now? Of course you aren't. Not to me. But afterwards, oh, think of it. You'll be beautiful. Mother. 
Yes, dear. May I ask you a question? Anything at all. Suppose I didn't want it. What? I wouldn't have to, would I? Darling, what are you talking about? At least I could wait a little while, couldn't I? Would that be all right? Oh, I don't think so. It has to be done at just the right time, a certain stage in your growth. Later, it's much harder. That's why the Bureau notified you. The time is now. But what if I'm not ready? You're just nervous, darling. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. Say, I know what you need. You do? A glass of instant smile. I'll ring for Grace. I don't need anything. I think you do, if you could see yourself. But all of that will change. Just think. Turn it over in your mind and savor it. Very soon now, very, very soon, you can look like this. Or this. Who's that one? She's exactly your age. Isn't she beautiful? Her name is, let me see, Melanie Moore. There's no reason why this couldn't be you. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You rang Mrs. Cuberrell? Lana. Pardon me, Lana. A cup of instant smile for my daughter, Grace. Yes, ma'am. On second thought, make it two. I could use a little pick-me-up myself. Right away. Teaching the help to use first names can be a problem these days. But we're all equal, aren't we? Yes, Mother. Remember that. After all, Grace is a number 12, too. Even if she is our maid. Oh, Mother. Why so glum, darling? I'm tired. I think I'll go to my room and lie down. That's a good idea. You're not yourself today. Oh? Who am I? You act as though there's something wrong with the transformation. I don't understand what possible objection anyone could have to being beautiful. After all, isn't everybody? Someone's at the front door, Grace. Yes, Mrs. I mean, Lana. Be right there. Oh, never mind. I'll get it. Hello, Lana. Oh, Rick. Thanks for coming by. How's Marilyn? The same. I almost couldn't believe what you said on the vid phone. I couldn't believe it myself. But it's true. She doesn't want the transformation. Can you imagine? Let me talk to her. I wish you would. Where is she now? In her room. I'll let her know you're here. Yes? Marilyn, are you awake? Why? Uncle Rick is here. He is? Be right there. That girl. You were her father's brother, Rick. What did he tell her? What do you mean? What could he possibly have said to give her these crazy ideas? It's an interesting question. Don't jump to conclusions. He was a good man. I know that. A little strange, perhaps, but a good man. I'll have a word with her. Might not have been his fault, you know. Then whose? Hard to say. They pick up so many peculiar notions from the trivid and that school. Oh, they... Here she is now. Don't let on that I called you. I won't. Honey! Look who stopped by to see you. Hi, sweetheart. Uncle Rick! Ah, oh, forget that uncle stuff, will you? You want me to start feeling old? Oh, you're not old. Can you stay? For a few minutes, I guess. I was just passing by and I... You two will excuse me. What's the matter, Mom? Nothing. I'm late for my culture class. Still taking that night course, huh? Well, I can't miss a chance to improve myself, can I? Make yourself comfortable, Rick. If you need anything, Grace is in the other room. Sure. Nice to see you, Lana. Nice to see you. Come back soon, will you? We'll all have dinner together. Sounds great. Bye now. Now then, what's all this about? What's what about? Well, I gather your mother is worried. Oh. Don't say it like that. She cares very much about you. Because I don't want to be transformed? Something like that. Because I want to stay ugly. Stop it. 
You're many things, honey. Most of them delightful, but you're definitely not ugly. You're just... Just what? Not beautiful? Some people might say so. What would you say? You're... different looking. Different good or different bad? Doesn't matter. The point is, people choose transformation when the opportunity comes along. I guess I'm not like other people. Your father chose it. I know. He was a number 17 just like you. <laughs> well, yes. 17 is the favorite for men these days. Has been for the past 20 years. My brother was a perfectionist. Wouldn't settle for anything less. Uncle Rick. Yes? Haven't you ever wanted to... to look like you? I do look like me. But you also look like a lot of other people. And all considered rather handsome, or so I'm told. Is that bad? Is it good to be like everybody? Isn't that the same as being nobody? I think it's time you tell me. Tell you what? We've been getting these radical ideas. My father used to say... Your father was a handsome man, wasn't he? Yes, but he read books. He, he thought about things. Sometimes we talk, just the two of us. Everybody talks. I mean about real things, not just electronic baseball or the super soccer team or where to buy a dress or fix your hair. Is there something wrong with sports, Marilyn, or buying new dresses? Think of all the businesses that would close down if nobody thought about them. But if you make that all there is in life... Sorry, sweetie, I have to be going. For now, I'd say you're out of sorts. It's not unusual at your age. You better have a glass of instant smile. Ask Grace to bring one in. I've had a glass of instant smile. I've had glass after glass after glass. And you know something? It doesn't do any good. Take it easy. I don't feel like smiling. I feel like frowning. In fact, I want to cry. I'm unhappy and I don't know why. Do you understand? I'm just not happy. I'll tell you what you are. I don't know how it happened. But I'd say you're a very sick young lady. Why? Because I don't want to be like everyone else? I'll tell your mother to make an appointment with the doctor tomorrow. Till then, take care of yourself, sweetie. And try not to worry. We'll all be better very soon. You'll see. What's wrong with me? Somebody please tell me. What's wrong with me? So glad you could come. Thanks, Mrs. Cubero. Lana, please. Oh, sure. Lana. We haven't seen much of you lately. I know. Marilyn, look who dropped by. Who? Hi, Marilyn. Val? Yes, it's me. Oh, I, I didn't recognize you. Doesn't she look fabulous? I feel fabulous. Number 12 has always been my favorite, ever since I was a little girl. Well, it was worth the wait, wasn't it? You bet. Are you two going out tonight? I don't think so, but if Marilyn wants to... I can't. I have to do my online homework. Just a visit, then. I'll leave you alone. I know you have a lot to talk about. Remember, Val, you're always welcome here. Thanks, Lana. If you need anything... We're fine, Mother. Don't be such a stranger, Val. I promise. See you soon. She told you, didn't she? Well, yes. And that's why you're here. Really, Marilyn, don't you think you're being silly about the whole thing? I think it's my own business. Well, of course it is. But I don't understand. Nobody does. I just don't see why I have to make up my mind right now. There's no law, is there? But everyone has it done. Fine. They're not me. It doesn't hurt or anything, if that's what you're worried about. When they did mine, I didn't feel a thing. I'm sure it didn't. Well, what then? You like the way I look, don't you? Sure. You look just like my mother now. Oh, excuse me. Like Lana. What's wrong with that? Nothing, Val. But I like you. Of course you do. We're friends. We'd be friends even if you didn't have the transformation. Don't you know that? That's not the important thing. What is important, Val? It's like getting a new dress or a new hairstyle. You just look better. You want to look as nice as you can, don't you? 
If I do it, I'll, I'll look like one of those holograms in the catalog. That's right, you will. And they're all beautiful, aren't they? What's wrong with that? I don't know. But somehow I have this feeling that it's wrong. Why? How will you know me afterwards? How will anyone know me? That doesn't make sense. You know what I think, Marilyn? I think you're just plain weird. If everybody says it's all right, if the whole world thinks it is, then how can you say something different? I don't get it. You're the one who doesn't get it. I don't want to look like someone else. Val, I want to look like me. I won't let them change me into something else. I won't let them. Help me, please, Val. I don't have anyone else who'll listen. Please help me. Marilyn? Mother? No, I'm Miss Simmons. Oh, you must be a number 12, too. Why, thank you, dear. As a matter of fact, I am. Doctor will see you now. Where's my mother? She's already in the office. Would you like to come with me? All right. Dr. Hortel? Yes, nurse? Miss Cuberell is here. Thank you, Eva. Hello, Marilyn, darling. The doctor and I were just having a talk. <laughs> Please, call me Rex. All right, Rex. Would you care for a beverage, Marilyn? No, thank you. That'll be all for now. Very well. Call me if you need anything. Uh, yes, I will. Have a seat by me. The couch is very comfortable. What's this for? Oh, just a simple interview. Your mother, Lana, wanted us to get acquainted. Why? Rex will answer any questions you have. <laughs> I'll do my level best. And I appreciate it. We both do. I'm sorry to have bothered you. It's, it's such a small thing, really. No, no, not at all. That's, that's my job. Marilyn, please, sit. Now then, you're 18? Yes. Well, it must be about time to... Ah, yes, I, I see that you've already received your notice. Went out last week. That's why we're here. Oh, you mustn't worry. I try not to. Marilyn's like so many young people nowadays. She is? Mm hmm And it's our fault. How so? Well, because we haven't made things clear to her. It's a matter of communication. But when you deal with a bureaucracy, well, there's bound to be an information lag. I read everything from the Bureau. But it didn't give you any definite explanation of why you've had to wait this long. I'm sure it's been difficult. Marilyn looks at you, Lana, at the women all around her in pictures on the trivid, and then she looks into a mirror. It has a negative effect on her self-image, not to mention her spirit. There's nothing wrong with my spirit. Marilyn, please. Well, from pure perfection of body, face, limbs, pigmentation, carriage, stance, she sees herself and is horrified. Isn't that so? Well, I... Well, of course it is. The child asks herself, Why must I be so hideous, off-balance, oversized, awkward, when, when everyone around me is so perfect? In short, she's tired of being a monster. She's come close to giving up. Dr. Rex, that's all well and good, but you don't understand. He doesn't. <laughs> I beg your pardon? If she isn't just depressed or anxious, she's... Well, go on, say it. You're my patient now. Everything is in strictest confidence. Well, she's... I, I don't know quite how to put this. I made up my mind. You have? I don't want to have the transformation. You what? I don't understand it either. She never said anything before, and now, suddenly... I is this true? Yes. Oh, perhaps you'd like to talk about it. Not particularly. She won't give any reasons. She just... Suppose you tell me, Marilyn. In your own words. There's nothing to tell. I, I just don't want to change. You do understand that transformation is a normal part of growing up. It has been for years now. In a way, it's a milestone. A sign of maturity it means you're ready to take your place in the adult world. How? By being like everybody else? Well, I wouldn't say that. No, there are 
a great many styles in the catalog. You're, you're absolutely free to choose any one you like. There's no pressure on you at all. No, no coercion. Isn't there? No, that would be against regulations. But I have to choose one, even if I don't want to. That's the way it's set up. If I don't, well, I don't, I don't even know what would happen to me. You make it sound like you're being forced. No, that would be contrary to free will. And if there's one thing this country guarantees... But what would happen if I don't? If I stay the way I want to be? Why do people care so much? I thought this was supposed to be a democracy where we respect everybody. Marilyn! Even if they want to be different. Even if they want to live their lives the way you they... mustn't talk like that. Why not? You've been given every advantage, every privilege. We're talking about a chance to develop your full potential. Would you mind if I conduct a test? What kind of test? A personality profile. For my records. I don't see why not. Do you, Marilyn? Come over here, please. What's that machine? Oh, it simply scans your mental activity, then prints it out on a strip of paper. The whole process takes a, a few seconds. It's quite painless, I assure you. All you need to do is sit in this chair. It's all right, darling. I promise. What are you putting on my head? A cranial recorder. I'm sure you've had this done before. You did? When you first started school, remember? All right, close your eyes, please, and sit quietly. Now, you must understand, the, uh, the transformation is desirable not only from an aesthetic point of view. It plays an important role in one's psychological adjustment. According to scientific research, it's absolutely vital. There. That's, that's all there is to it. What does it say? Hmm. Lana, was there anything specific that triggered your daughter's feelings? Uh, an emotional incident of some sort? Nothing that I'm aware of. She's never shown much interest in her appearance, but I honestly can't imagine anything your that Your husband might... died in the Ganymede incident, I see. Five years ago. Did you ever discuss this matter with him? Yes. I recall that he had some misgivings at first, but he finally chose number 17. Your number. Huh, I see. You remind me so much of him. Your eyes and the way you walk. Well, that's, that's hardly surprising. It's an outstanding design. He's not Daddy, Mother, or Uncle Rick. Now you can go back to the couch now, Marilyn. We're all finished. Just lift the helmet off. You were very f fond of your father, I take it? Yes. And you respected his opinions, didn't you? He was very, very intelligent. Oh, I'm sure he was. Did he ever tell you that the transformation was bad? Not exactly. I'm sure he didn't. What did he tell you? He said... He thought it was tragic. Jack had some ideas that were rather nonconformist, Doctor. But it was just talk. He had the highest physical and psychological rating with the rocket service. Well, this is a very unusual case. I'll require some additional time to look into the matter. Suppose I get in touch with you, say, in a few days. That will be fine. I appreciate your seeing us. Did you find out? Hmm? What's that? The machine... Did you find out what's inside my head? Oh, your general intelligence rating is quite high. Social adaptation, good. Powers of reasoning appear normal. Oh, above normal, in fact. Then why won't you let me make up my own mind? Honey, please. Why can't I? Why should I be forced to do something I don't want to do? You can't make me, can you? Oh, no one has ever been forced to take the transformation. Now, the problem is to discover why you don't want it. Then, once we understand that... Well, we'll make whatever corrections are necessary. <laughs> You're something of a challenge, young lady. But don't you worry. I'm sure we'll be able to handle it. Whatever it takes. Dr. Forrest, style 118, please. Where are we going? This way, please. It's just at the end of the hall. What part of the hospital is this? They have the private offices down here. I, I thought Dr. Hortel was going to meet me. You mean Dr. Rex? He'll be along later. Miss Marilyn Cubero. Come in, Marilyn. Sit down. It's too dark. I can't see anything. 
walk toward the desk. Wait. See the chair? Yes, but I, I can't see you. Sorry, the lamp must be right in your eyes. Let me adjust it. Who are you? I am Professor Friend, Sigmund Friend. You must call me Sig. Dr. Rex has told me about you. I'm here to help. Sit, please. Help me? Help rid you of your fears of this necessary and important... No, that isn't true. It's not necessary. This very necessary, very important step in your life. But why? Why does everyone want to force me to do something I don't want to do? Why else but for your own good? That doesn't make sense. Why else would the state go to so much trouble and expense? Many, many years ago, wiser men than I decided to eliminate injustice and inequality from this world. They saw in physical unattractiveness one of the factors that make men hate. And so they charged the finest scientific minds with the task of eliminating, or at least minimizing, ugliness everywhere. But I'm not ugly. I'm not pretty, but I'm not ugly either. To others, you may be. Not to those who love me. There's more to it than that. As we learn to reshape the features, remold the body, we also learn to eliminate most causes of illness and thereby prolong life. Before the transformation, you might have expected to live 70, 80, perhaps 90 years. Now you may live twice that long, even three times. These are good things, don't you agree? Genuine advances for humankind. Yes. Your mother. She's lovely, is she not? At one time, her face and body would already have begun to show the marks of age, of decay. You would not deny her youth and beauty, would you? But you could do that part without changing me, couldn't you? I wouldn't mind just that. Someday you might. And then it would be too late for the transformation. No, I'll never change my mind. I've thought about it, and I'm positive. Why? Did you ever read Shakespeare? Or Shelley? Or Keats? Those books were banned many years ago. Where did you find them? My father gave them to me. And dozens more. Aristotle, Socrates, Dostoevsky. D did you know Dostoevsky was an epileptic? Ugly, deformed, but he wrote about beauty. Real beauty. Marilyn, I warn you. This sort of subversive talk... Those men wrote about life. About the dignity of the human spirit. About love. I've heard enough. Interjecting smut into this interview is not going to help your case. Not at all. Then may I go now? I've arranged a room for you. You'll be quite comfortable. But I don't want to stay here. I want to go home. It's only temporary. Your mother will be informed and you'll be allowed visitors. Mother, did you hear what he said? They want... I'm not your mother, dear. But I am a number 12. This way. No, you can't make me stay here. I'm afraid you must let me decide what is best for you. This way? No, please. We're not going to hurt you. We're going to help you. Let me go! Let me go! We're almost there. Just ahead. Third room on the left. And you're sure she's all right? Oh, absolutely. I'm so glad. Did you know, Doctor, we've been best friends since preschool? Well, she's lucky to have a friend like you. And a mother who cares so much. Like you, Lana. I hope she's awake. Marilyn. Dr. Rex? You have company. Oh, mother. She was quite upset last night. I, I gave her something to help her sleep. Hello, darling. You haven't done anything to her yet. Oh, a mild sedative, nothing more. If you'll excuse me, I have to look in on another patient. Of course, doctor. Thank you. Hi, Marilyn. Hello, Val. Are you okay? I think so. We'd have been here sooner, only the doctor said you were sleeping. How do you feel? I don't know. What happened? Nothing. They just wouldn't let me go. Oh, Mother, they're gonna do it anyway. They're gonna make me do it. That's not true, Marilyn. Dr. Rex promised, remember? He was lying! Lying? Why should he? I don't know, but I know he has to say that to keep people from finding out. Finding out what? That they do the transformation whether you want it or not. Don't try to sit up. Didn't you hear what I said? I can't see why you're so unhappy, when all they want to do is make you pretty. But they don't! What? Last night before I went to sleep, I remembered something. 
I remembered what Father told me. He said, when everyone is beautiful, then no one will be. Because without ugliness, there is no beauty. Oh, Mother, don't you see? They don't care whether you're beautiful. They want everyone to be the same. That's all. They? Who are you talking about? I'm afraid it's time to go now. Already? If it's all right, I'd like to stay and talk to Marilyn some more. Well, uh, just for a few minutes. Don't worry, dear. Everything's going to be fine. You'll see. What do you want to talk about? Well, I was thinking about what you said. What your father said. I don't see why he's so important to you. Val! I mean, he's dead, isn't he? Besides, you must have had other fathers. My mother's been married 11 times. Personally, I always like the stepfathers better anyway. Please, Val. You've had nine fathers since the first one. Well, haven't you? Everybody marries everybody these days. Val, stop. After all, how can anybody live with the same husband for a hundred years? Besides, from what I hear, your first father wasn't much fun. Stop talking about my father. You didn't know him. I loved him. He was good, kind, and he cared about me. Not the way I looked, but what I thought, what I felt. And he cared about himself, his dignity as a human being. My father wasn't killed in the Ganymede incident, Val. He killed himself. Why? Because when they took away his identity, who he was, there was no reason left to live. I don't understand. And I don't understand you, Val. Look at me. Do you ever feel anything? Sure. I feel good. I always feel good. Like that poem we learned in school. Life is pretty, life is fun. I am all and all is one. You don't get it. Get what? What are you talking about? You really don't. You can't. You can't understand anything. I gotta go, Marilyn. Goodbye. I have to get out of here. You're number 14, aren't you? Yes. Do you like 14s? I do now. Have you had lunch yet? I was just on my way to the 22nd floor. That's amazing. So was I. Working a long shift today? Till 7. Then I'm free. That's great. Say, have you seen the Holo Lounge yet? If you like, I was thinking... Which is the way out? I can't remember. Must be those two doors at the end. <gasps> mother? What's that? Is that my mother on the gurney? Is your mother pregnant? No. Then your mother must be at number 12. Are you all right? Yes, I'm, I'm fine. What are you doing in your hospital gown? I, I was just looking for the nurse. You better stay in your room. Push the button by the bed. The nurse will be along. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. The double doors, this has to be the way. Hello? What is this place? Somebody? Hello, my dear. We've been expecting you. Dr. Rex? Where am I? What? This is an operating room. No! <laughs> no need to run. Sooner or later, everyone decides to be beautiful. What number have you chosen? No, please, please! Ah, Mrs. Cubell. Val, just in time. Is it all over, Doctor? All over. Is she okay? She's fine. You'll see for yourself. I've been so worried the last few days. She seemed in such a state. It's as I told you. Occasionally, a young person has difficulty adjusting to the idea. It always works out fine in the end. <laughs> it never fails. A complete self-contained procedure. Mother! Val! You see? What did I tell you? 
Look at me, Mother. Look at me. Marilyn? Well, what do you think? You're beautiful. Simply beautiful. Wow, I love your long legs. And the nicest part of all, Belle, now I look just like you and Mother. Turn around so I can see you. Do you like my makeup? They even gave me some high heels. Of course, I'll need a new dress to go with my new look. <laughs> yes, yes you will. Come along, Marilyn. We'll do some shopping on the way home. Then we'll have a party and all your friends can come over. You're gonna have so many new friends from now on. I know, isn't it exciting? <laughs> Portrait of a young lady in love for the first time with herself. Improbable? Perhaps. But in an age of plastic surgery, bodybuilding, an infinity of cosmetics, and an obsession with appearance, let us hesitate to say impossible. These and other blessings, some of them decidedly mixed, may await us in the not-too-distant future, or at least a future to be found in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Number 12 looks just like you, starring Bonnie Somerville and Charles Shaughnessy. With Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by John Tomerlin from a story by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Linda Reiter, Rebecca Spence, David Darlow, Nick Sandys, Nina LaSalle, Tom McElroy, Rick Arthur, Choby Cerny, Fernet Lebo, and Terry Lopez. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for the Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Anything on the radar? Uh, not yet. No signal at all. Try 4.0, true. It'll probably come from that direction. I had her on that all morning, sir. Still nothing. You're past your time, aren't you? Who's your relief? Al Baines, Captain. Baines? <laughs> I'll see what happened to him. Yes, sir.
Morning, all. Anything yet? Afraid not. They lost, you figure? There's no telling. Okay, if we fill our containers now? Go ahead. As long as the water supply holds out. Be a while till the next batch is ready. Julie! Where's your husband? He... he was sleeping, Captain. Get him, Julie. Is something wrong? There's something wrong. Yes, sir. How does it taste today, Henry? Same as always, hot, flat, and unforgettable. <laughs> but wet. Suffer it a little bit more. Six months from now, you'll be drinking chocolate ice cream sodas. You want to see me, Captain? There's a man in the radar tower who'd like to see you, Al. He would have liked to see you two hours ago when you were supposed to relieve him. I overslept. Tell that to Hank Parker up there in the tower. Tell him you overslept, and then be good enough to tell him, Al, that you'll stand his watch all day tomorrow. That's not fair, Captain. It doesn't happen often. Once is too often, Al. More than once is intolerable. And many more than once is a case history of Albert Baines who likes his sleep. I prefer it to a stupid game in the hot sun, both of them. A game, Al? What are we listening for? Thirty years of two shifts a day, what have we ever heard? Wind noise. And what have we ever picked up on the radar screen? Dust particles? But anything to make you happy, Captain. You listen to me. There's a ship on its way. And when it reaches this atmosphere, it may want to be vectored in. They may want landing instructions, wind direction, ground temperature. And if Al Baines is in the sack, we may spend the rest of our lives here. Is that what makes you happy, Al? How do we know there's a ship out there, Captain? A lot of garbled static two months ago that you told us was a message, and then nothing. Two whole months, and you decide there's a ship coming here to take us back. You make the rules and set the watches and plan the days, and now you tell us the Messiah is coming. Did you tell us to pray? The difference between you and me, Captain Benteen, is that I do my dreaming when I'm asleep. You do yours on your feet. There's a ship coming, Al. All of us believe it. Because he tells you to. And we believe him. Whatever Captain Benteen says, that's what will happen. Sure you believe him. He tells you this is the best of all possible worlds, and by God, you break into song. You're sweating your lives away on this rock, but the captain says it's paradise, and we have to clap our hands. Rule by hypnosis. Al, there's a ship coming. This happens to be a fact. There's a ship coming believe it. I tell you, it'll happen. And you know it's real, just as you know this is real. You haven't forgotten our ship, have you? The Pilgrim One? The first spaceship sent up to colonize the outer regions? And this plaque, placed here by the 130 men, women, and children who established the first off-Earth colony. We owe them our belief. Because they had faith. Don't ever forget that. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'd better go check on the generator. This is William Benteen, who officiates on a small outpost in space. An outpost slowly disintegrating under the heat of two suns with the holes, the cracks, the fissures that are the residue of despair. He tries to fill them with faith and to retain a faith of his own. This is a remnant society, a handful of people who left the earth looking for a millennium, a place without war, without jeopardy, without fear. What they found was a lonely, barren place whose only industry was survival. 
And this is what they have done for decades, survive. Until the memory of the Earth, they came from what has become an indistinct and shadowed recollection of another time and another place. Two months ago, a signal from Earth announced that a ship would be coming to pick them up and take them home. In just a moment, we'll hear more of that ship, more of that home, and what it takes out of mind and body to reach it. Because this outpost is located in the far reaches of the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, On Thursday We Leave for Home. Starring Barry Bostwick with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Can't keep the generator running, sir. No wonder. Look at these wires. They're rotten. That's all we got, Captain. No backup? This is it. Any insulation? That's all gone, too. We used it on the uh, converter belts. Well, we have to get the current running somehow. If that refrigeration unit stays off, the temperature in the underground rooms will go up 50 degrees. Well, we could stop the saltwater converter for a day or so, switch the parts. Then we'll have to do that. Tell the people to fill up all the jugs they have. We'll be shutting off the water in six hours. Yes, sir. Captain? What about the ship? It's on the way. We know that much. Then, everything will be different. When we get back, the things that are old and worn out, we'll throw them away. Just throw them away. Captain, Captain, Captain Benteen. What? The main square. Come quick. It's Mrs. Rodale. She's hanged herself. Cut her down. What happened? Is that lady all right? Get them out of here. Come, children. God have mercy on her. You men there, prepare her. We'll bury her in an hour. Yes, sir. We now consign to... To this planet, the remains of Mary Rodale. We ask God in his infinite mercy to give her the serenity and joy that she sought while she was with us. And we ask his forgiveness for her sin. Amen. 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 We ask that this good woman be allowed to rejoin her beloved husband who preceded her in death 11 years ago. Bid your farewells now. Forgive her, Lord. Have mercy on her, Lord, for what she's done. A terrible thing. She didn't know what she was doing. She knew what she was doing. Better and clearer than the rest of us. Oh, no. This is a funeral, Al. The ninth funeral in the last six months. Nobody talks about it. We just let it go by. But there have been nine people who thought that maybe heaven is a place where they can get a drink of water without salt in it. Where they'll be able to breathe air without choking on the heat of it. If you want to talk blasphemy, I'll take it away from here. I'm talking truth, Captain Benteen. I'm saying that this woman and the others, they took their own lives because living became intolerable. And I say that dying was their right. Anything else? Just this question. I put it to everyone here. Al, please. No! Isn't living tough enough that we don't have to do it by the book? Isn't it hot and blinding and miserable enough that there shouldn't have to be rules? So that we shouldn't have to suffer by the numbers 
Will anyone make the simple observation that there's far more happiness going into that hole than what's left above ground? There's more peace of mind than that dead body than in all you mourners put together. What we've got here is anguish. Captain Benteen, let us live with it or die from it in our own way. Young Mr. Baines here wants us to lie down in the sun. Young Mr. Baines would have us give in to death when there is still life. He would end all the rules. He'd throw away the regulations. There'd be no standing in line for water. Let the strong take it away from the weak. No rationing of food. Let the young steal it from the old. And when that ship comes down to take us back to Earth, it won't find a society. It will find only a pack. There'll be no human beings left, only animals. There's a ship coming. It's winging its way in now. It's on its way. Say it. Say it out loud. Let me hear you say it. There's a ship coming. 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 That's right. There's a ship. There's a ship. Yes. A ship that's coming to take us. Hear that? Can you hear that, everyone? Do you hear? It's a meteor storm. It's a meteor storm. Find shelter. Get inside. Up to the cave. Get up to the cave! Julie! It's Julie. She's bleeding. Quickly! We have to move. I can't. Something hit my arm. I think it's broken. Stand aside. I'll carry it. It's just a cut to the forehead, not very deep. But keep this bandage on it. Julie? Julie, honey? Can you hear me? Al? Don't let her move just yet. She may have a concussion. How's your arm? It's not broken. Must have been a rock that hit it. Captain, thank you. For a little first aid. <laughs> no thanks necessary. I deliver babies, too. You might want to keep that in mind. Now I'd better go see to the others. Will it go on much longer, Captain? I wish I knew. It sounds like it's spending itself. I've seen meteor storms before, Captain. Nothing this size. What about the damage, Henry? Two underground cells destroyed. At least, that's what it looked like from out front. Everybody accounted for? I think we're all here, Captain. I've checked. Nobody's missing. Thank God. Everyone try to stay calm. The worst of it is over. Jojo? Yeah, Captain? You're not scared, are you? Well, kinda. Now, we can't have that. Mind if I sit for a minute? We'll talk, you and me. Captain, tell me about the Earth. Would you, Captain? Tell us what you remember. Yes, do. Well, all right, I guess I can do that. We'd like to hear. You, over there, is that you, friend? Yes, Captain. And you, Buck? Yes, sir. You fill in the holes if I leave out anything. Straighten me out if I'm wrong about any of my recollections. Jojo, I was a boy of 15 when we arrived here. But I remember Earth. I remember it as... as a place of color. I remember that in the autumn, the leaves changed. 
They turned different colors, red, gold, orange. And I remember streams of water that flowed down hillsides. And the water was sparkling and clear. And I remember clouds in the sky, white, billowy things that floated like great majestic ships. They looked like sails. What are sails? Don't you know what sails were? In ancient times, that's how ships moved across the water. There was so much water. The men unfurled large sheets of canvas against the wind. And it was the wind that moved them. And I can remember night skies. Night. Endless black velvet with stars. And sometimes a moon that seemed to hang there as, as big as the face of an old man looking down on us all. Captain, what's night? Why, that was the quiet time, Jojo. Night was when the earth went to sleep. It was the cover it pulled over itself. Not like here, with two suns always shining, always burning. It was a darkness that felt like, like a cool hand brushing over tired eyes. And there was snow on winter nights. Gossamer things that drifted down and turned the earth all white. And we could build snowmen the next morning and see our breath in the air. And it was good then. It was right. So why did you leave there? Oh, we thought we could find another Earth, Jojo. Then we found this. We thought we could escape war. We thought, uh, we, thought we could build an even better place. And it took us 20 years to find out that we had left our home a billion miles away only to be stranded like visitors, transients, that no roots could take hold in this ground. But it was too late. So we spend the next 30 years watching a clock and a calendar and waiting. But we can't wait any longer. Not a day, not an hour. We have to get back home. There's no more time. I'll go outside and survey the damage. Charm. Radar tower is still standing. What? Why, it's... Al! Al Baines, do you hear that noise? All of you, come out here! Do you hear it? What is that? It's not a meteor That's not a meteor. And it's not wishful thinking. Not this time. Those are rocket engines! I remember the sound of it. That's the ship! The ship has come at last! Pretty fast. Watch your step. It looks like you got plenty of room for everybody. Do you have any water? Clean water? 
We have enough. Oh, doesn't that sound wonderful? Delicious. Careful. I'd better talk to your leader. You have one, don't you? Sure do. Captain Benteen. I don't see... He's standing over there. Hey, Captain, come see the ship. Mr. Benteen? I'm Benteen. Colonel Sloan. I command the Galaxy 6. Our orders are to transport you all back to Earth. Colonel, what took you so long? Six and a half months, Mr. Benteen. A hundred times that. We've been waiting for 30 years. Does it all look like this? Salt flats and scrubby mountains. Two suns, hot and perpetual. 30 years of it. 30 years. The children have never seen Earth, and some of the older ones don't even remember it. They'll see it now. Our orders are to get you aboard as soon as possible. We figured that we should be able to lift off on Thursday. Are you still using Earth time? Of course. Good. That'll give you three days to prepare. Unfortunately, your people will only be able to take what they can carry. Over 200, aren't there? 187 men, women, and children. It may be a little crowded, but we'll fit you all in. You've been used to a lot of space, Mr. Benteen, haven't you? Space? Room to move around. Oh, uh, that's all there is here. That and the heat. I can feel it. They'll make the trip standing on their heads if necessary. I'm sure they will, but I don't think that'll be necessary. Do you know, can you understand, what a godsend this is for all of us? It's hard to imagine. I can only say your country's very, very proud of you. What of the Earth? Has it changed? Not too much. Still green? Still green. And the cities? The cities still stand. And war? As always, I'm afraid. One dies down, another one springs up. But through some miracle and the grace of God, we never had the big one. Now, Mr. Benteen, all things considered, I think you'll find it very much as you left it. Captain... Benteen. Captain? That's what the people call me. This place, their very lives, it's all been my responsibility. You've done quite a job, Captain Benteen. But you can rest easy. I'll take over the responsibilities now. No need. I'm used to the job, Colonel. The living quarters, they're underground? I was saying, Colonel, I'm used to the responsibility. I wouldn't quite know how to function without it. Is it cooler there, Mr. Benteen? I'm sorry, I didn't... Your underground rooms, are they much cooler? Yes, they're refrigerated. Uh, it's, it's... Uh, captain. Morning, Captain. George. The best morning ever. We just wanted to say thank you, Captain. Why? For what? For keeping us alive all these years. That's right. Without the Captain, none of us would be here. That's not necessary. You better believe it, Colonel. I do. I do believe it. Captain Benteen. Go ahead, Colonel Sloan. That's all right. I'll see to the others. You know, I don't need this. I'm not going to take this. Hi, Captain. Julie, where's your bandage? Oh, I don't need it anymore. But we put one around your head so the cut would heal. What's this? Isn't it incredible? It's called a medicinal patch. You wear it for 24 hours. It accelerates the growth of new skin. Look at a forehead, Captain. You can hardly see the scratch. Better put the sling back on your arm, Al. I don't need a sling. Just this metal band. It's magnesium. Colonel Sloan said my arm would be perfect by the end of the week. Well, I, uh, I seem to have had my practice taken away from me. But while we're here, I'd use that sling. I'll bet I've fixed about 500 broken wings in my time, and the only way to be sure it heals properly is to keep the limb immobile. Where's Colonel Sloan? I want to ask him what to pack. Uh, Eleanor, uh, let me help you with that bundle of clothing. Thank you kindly, Captain. I'll carry it for you. No, thank you, crewman. I've got it. Here you go, ma'am. I don't know how to thank you. Are all the crew as strong as you? That's our job, ma'am. Nothing to it. <laughs> Hello there, Captain. Well, I'm so excited. How much longer? Not long. 
Be patient. May I have your attention, everyone? <laughs> Quiet, please. What is it, Captain? As all of you know, we have less than 36 hours before we depart. And as I told you earlier, there is a maximum allowance of 14 pounds per person. Soon we'll begin weighing your belongings, and if we're over the limit, I'll make up a list of necessary items. I hope I'm not intruding, Captain. I was just telling them about the weight requirements. We'll handle all that tomorrow. I heard you'd called a meeting here in the cave, so I brought Lieutenants Engel and Rafferty with me. Everyone has so many questions about Earth, I thought perhaps this would be a good time. Actually, Colonel, the purpose of this meeting is simply to make some last-minute arrangements. Colonel, I used to live in San Diego. Is California still the same? Sunny and warm most of the time, but not this warm. Los Angeles has become the biggest city in the world. These kinds of questions, we could just as well handle them when... Colonel Sloan, are there still major leagues? My dad used to tell me about baseball and the World Series. The leagues are just as before, American and national. What about the Dodgers? <laughs> they, they came in tenth last season. I'm told they need pitchers pretty desperately. I'll tell you what. When we're finished here, we'll improvise a ball and bat and have ourselves a game. How's that sound? Yes. That'd be great. Let's do it. I, I, think, I think it's a little hot for that kind of activity. What we could do is have some group singing. We haven't done that for a while. I got an old sack. That'll be the ball. Who's got a stick? What are we waiting for? Let's go. <laughs> please, please wait. We haven't finished yet. Jojo. Jojo, I haven't told you a story in a long time. How would you like to hear a story about... What have you got there? This is what they call candy. One of the spacemen gave it to me. It tastes... It tastes... Sweet, Jojo. It tastes sweet. Yeah, sweet, Captain. Want a bite? No, oh, thank you, Jojo. But back on Earth, we can get all we want. Something, Captain? I'm not sure. I'm not at all sure. You've promised them all candy. You've made it sound as if... Uh, as if that was what the Earth is made of. Sugar and spice and everything nice. Maybe... Maybe they ought to be told the truth. The universal language. Baseball. You have a limited vocabulary, Colonel. Do you have any idea what the temperature is? At this hour, it's about 110. I don't know whether your crew can take it, but I know my people. They're going to pay for this little athletic event. Some of the older ones, it might even be serious for them. It's just a game, Benteen. My guess is that it's worth it. Now, I'd better get back to the ship. Colonel Sloan. Something else, Mr. Benteen? Colonel, when we get on the ship, you can tell us what to do and we'll all fall into line. But here, in this place, I'm in command. I'm not trying to usurp authority, Mr. Benteen, but I really don't see what harm a little game... It's still Captain Benteen. For now. <sighs> Galaxy crewmen, back to the ship. That's an order. Oh, come on. It's time for rest now. All of you go back to your homes. I'll announce when the new day will start. You happy now, Captain? I was never unhappy, Colonel. I just happen to know what's right and what's wrong. I ask you to keep your crew in the ship during the rest time. I don't want my people distracted. You rule with a heavy fist. If it were one ounce lighter, no one would have survived. I've held these people together by will. They'd have died, Colonel. Without someone they could hold on to, they'd have withered away. Not anymore, Captain. Relax. That's a luxury I've never been able to afford, Colonel. I've never been able to marry, to think only of myself, because of them. I've been a father figure, a governor, a confessor. I've been all those things. And if I hadn't been, there'd be no life here. These are my people. Understand? My people.
What's with him, Colonel? I'll bear with him a little bit longer, fellas. He's really quite a man. He's got just one minor aberration. And what's that? He believes he's God. As far as he's concerned, we're booting him out of heaven. Yes? Mr. Captain Benteen is here, sir. Showman. Very well, sir. Come in, Captain. Sorry, my quarters are a bit cramped. Please, sit down. Colonel Sloan, this is a list of all passengers with their approximate weight and the weight of their belongings after each name. The scale we have is pretty beat up. My guess is that it underweighs by about four or five pounds. Fine, fine. All I wanted was an approximation. We'll weigh them in on our own equipment before blast off. This is Wednesday, 12 midnight? I keep getting confused with the constant light. When do the people get up? About two, Earth time. The hours from 7 until 1.45 are the hottest. That's when we try to stay indoors. Then we have our meetings at the cave about two hours afterwards. We've had to improvise our own schedule. You've improvised very well, Captain. I looked at the saltwater converter, your electro plant, the sun shield you put up over the crops. Very inventive. Necessity hasn't been the mother of invention here. It's been the father and the whole family. <laughs> well, you'll be able to give way to progress now. Though I wonder if all of it'll be to your liking. The way you'll be lionized when you get back to Earth. You're referred to in the press as the Lost Pioneers. They're gonna make quite a thing of you when we land. Oh? Wherever any of your people settle, there'll be keys to the cities, brass bands. I expect they'll scatter all over the U.S. The government's had inquiries by, well, it must be thousands of relatives. My guess is that they'll just about have time to look into a television camera and then get whisked off. Well, they won't be scattered, Colonel. They'll go as a group. We'll find a place where we can settle, and that's where we'll stay. I, I'm talking about when we get back to Earth, Captain. That's what I'm talking about. They won't be splitting up. Not my people. Captain, as a point of interest, did you ever ask them? Ask them what? whether they'd want to stay together. That would be a ridiculous question, like asking a child if he wants some more, uh, some more ice cream. They're children, you see, Colonel. Oh, chronologically, they range from six months to 60-odd years, but socially, psychologically, they're children. I've kept them alive and functioning all this time. Once we're back on Earth, I'll simply continue the process. Captain Benteen, have you told them that? Have you told them that after 30 years of waiting, 30 years of living in a compound, they're going to travel a billion miles just to walk into another one? Have you? There's no need. They wouldn't have it any other way. To leave them to their own devices, that would be an act of cruelty. Captain, do me one favor. Just ask them. <laughs> Naturally, we won't have to concern ourselves with the colder climates, the northeastern states, the upper regions of the Great Plains. We'll find an area much farther to the south, perhaps Florida or Texas. Southern California has a temperate climate. Uh, Captain, you better tell us about frostbite treatment, because I'm moving to Wisconsin. That's where my family settled originally. What about Oregon, Captain? That's where Joan and I plan to settle. I've heard about the forest there. Please, wait a minute. You don't understand. <clears throat> uh, let me make this clear. All of you will have a chance to meet your relatives. I see no reason why visits can't be arranged, perhaps even for a week or more. But naturally, we'll remain together as a community. In whatever land grant we obtain from the government, or whatever given area we can arrange. I can assure you of one thing, and I hope put all your fears to rest. I'll remain as your, well, your guide, your consultant. And I guarantee that no one will lack for my help or my advice. Captain? 
Julie, Julie and I were thinking of farming. Why, that's a fine idea, Al. We'll farm just as we have farmed, but much more easily. The rainfall back on Earth is so plentiful. And as I told you, there's only one sun, so you won't have to shield the crops. Of course we'll farm. Certainly, we'll farm. Julie's got relatives in the state of Washington. You couldn't take the cold. None of you could. But I guarantee that wherever we settle, the farming will be good. I'll see to that. What's the matter? Don't you understand? We, we don't plan to stay together. You don't understand, Al. You've never understood much of anything. If we split up, I seriously doubt that we'd survive. Al, explain it to him. Go on. We'll survive, Captain. If anyone wants to stay together, that'll be their right. But if they want to go their own way, that'll be their right too. Am I wrong, Colonel? You're not wrong. We're to take you back as a group. Once on Earth, you can do as you please. Colonel, let us settle our differences in our own way. There are no differences, Captain. There are differences. There are changes that have taken place on Earth. Things we aren't prepared for. Oh, the Colonel has made it sound like a big holiday. The good life just plucked off a tree. Well, friends, I don't want any of you disillusioned. Wherever men live, they grub, they scrabble. They have to dig to stay alive. It's a fact. But together, that's the word, together, we've got to stay together. Think of that word now. Let's say it out loud. Everybody, now, together, together, together. Together! Together! Looks like the congregation isn't with you anymore, Captain. What's the matter with all of you people? Wait. I've made the compartment assignments. I'd like to go over them with you. Assignments? Well, there's not much time, and there's some things we have to check off. There's a decompression problem that we've got to tell them about and a moment of weightlessness shortly after we leave the atmosphere that I want to explain to the children. Do you know, do you know what we called you while we waited for you to come? We called you the Messiah. Did you? You were supposed to bring freedom, but that's not what you brought. You brought selfishness, dissatisfaction, divisiveness. With all the misery we've had here, those germs never infected us. I brought nothing but a ship and a crew and a means of escape. You've had no diseases, no viruses. Did it ever occur to you why? You've lived in a test tube, Captain. Antiseptic and germ-free and sterile. Sure, you're a group, a cell, but that's all over with. Now it's time for you to be what God meant you to be, individuals. Time to break the test tube. Time to rejoin the human race. What I'd like to know is why in the name of God you're so reluctant about it. Because I remember the human race. This is incredible. Oh, it's really incredible. I was wrong, Colonel. I've been telling them about an Earth that doesn't exist. An imaginary garden. No. We can't go back. It's too late. Captain, really. Everybody, gather around. I've got something to tell you. Listen to me, all of you. I want to tell you all. Uh, listen to me, uh, all of you. I, I want to tell you about the real Earth. Captain, are you all right? Let's talk about the diseases. What? The viruses, the cancers, the floods and the freezing, the wetness and the cold. And there are other, other miseries, worse than anything we've experienced. Hatred, jealousy, violence. Listen to me. It's an earth we don't know. We can't leave here. We'd be committing suicide. We'd die of, of things we've never been exposed to before. We'd die of the loneliness that animals get in a zoo. Because we don't belong. We don't belong to his kind. Do you understand me? We don't belong there. Captain Benteen, why don't you let your children vote on it. Only if they know what's waiting for them. Only if they understand that Earth isn't any garden. It's never been, and it never will be. That's fair enough. 
I'll tell you what Earth is. The same as it's always been. It's a race struggling to survive, just as you have survived. Captain Benteen is right when he tells you that it isn't all a place of beauty. There may still be wars and prejudice and strife. I suppose there will always be jealous men and angry men and unforgiving men. But it has one thing you don't have. Every man is his own master. There won't be anyone telling you when to eat and when to sleep and when to meet, what to sing and how to play. Instead of heat, you may feel cold, and instead of thirst, you may feel hunger. But you'll be men and women. You won't be sheep. You won't be a kindergarten. And when you pray to God, his name won't be Benteen. A vote now, Captain. And the majority wins. Those of you who want to be on the ship ten hours from now, heading back to Earth, step forward. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. That's it. Let's go. I suppose that makes it unanimous, Benteen. Even you, Jojo? Well, I want to go with the Colonel. Give me something, anything. Give me that sledgehammer. Here. No, no, no. Angle. Wrap him up. There, sir. Stop him. He's running for the ship. No, no, no. Captain. We'll see how far you get. Without a tail fin. Put it down! Ah! Ah! You all right, Colonel? I'm fine. What about the ship? Just a couple of dents, nothing serious. Lucky you stopped him when you did. Captain Benteen, let go. For everyone's sake, loosen your grip and let go. God help you. God help you all. Tomorrow you think you're getting on a ship headed for paradise. What you don't realize is you're heading for hell. What about you? I'll stay here. That's right. This is my home. This is where I belong. This is where you belong. You just don't have the brains or the guts or the sense to know it. This ship leaves at 0800 tomorrow. If you're not on board... I want no special privileges, Colonel Slow. No special treatment. If you're to blast off at 8, you blast off at 8. As for the rest of you, you can go on the ship or you can remain here with me. I'll be at the cave. Any who want to remain can meet me there. That's it, folks. The rocket's fired up. Everybody on board, single file. What about the captain? I'll give it one last try. Lieutenant Engel, see to the passengers. I'll be right back. Yes, sir. Where are you going, sir? To the cave. Captain? Benteen? Benteen, we know you're in here. Please, let us talk to you. He's not going to show himself, Colonel. We're leaving now. We have to blast off in five minutes. If we don't, we'll have lost our orbital position. Benteen, it has to be now. Captain! Captain, please, come out! Remember this. If we leave without you, there'll be no other ships. This is where you'll live the rest of your life. And this is where you'll die. 
All right, Benteen. As you prefer. Let's go, Baines. Goodbye, Captain. Hello, hello, friends, all together at the meeting place. Any new business today? No? Jojo, I'll bet you want to hear about Earth, about the rivers and the seas, the, the blue skies, or the night, the stars and the moon. Which do you want to hear about this time? Uh, there's, um, well, there's color on Earth, a change of seasons, and the wind, the wind, brings the smell of the ground, the plants, the seeds, the roots, flower petals, sap from the trees, and the smell of the weather, the rain or the mist or the fog, and on the earth, on the earth, there's green, the color green, the feeling green, there's something fresh about it, something living. Earth. It's called Earth. Don't. Don't, don't leave me. Please. Oh, don't leave me. A man named Benteen, sometimes known as Captain, who had certain prerogatives. He could lead, judge, legislate, even dictate. It became a habit, and finally, a necessity. William Benteen, once a god, now a population of one, on a distant outpost in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. On Thursday, we leave for home, starring Barry Bostwick with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Christian Stolte, Elizabeth Lido, C.J. Amari, Richard Hensel, Justin Kaufman, Kurt Nabig, Joby Cerny, Jennifer Joy, Meg Falcon, Tracy Hernandez, Jake Salins, Doug James, Jeff Lupiton, and Amanda Amari. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone 
by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Keep them moving. Here comes another one. Ready? Ready. Let's go. Very gently now. I got it. Watch it. Oh. Ah. Hold up. Stop the line. I said hold it. There's a man down over here. What happened? It's Miller. One of the casings slipped off the belt. I'm all right. Get the line, boss. Now. Sturka! Stand back. Lay him down flat. Uh, sorry about that, boss. Take it easy, Rich. Can you move your leg? Yeah, nothing broken. Get him over to medical. I'm okay, I tell you. Just the same, let's be sure. What went wrong? I don't know. I told him to take his time. They're sending him down too fast, all day. Shouldn't have taken all the weight. My knee folded is all. It wasn't your fault. The whole base is working at capacity. They've got to slow it down. Slow it down? We're on condition red, you know that. This is my department now, and these are my men. I won't be responsible. That <laughs> seems to me you've got it easy, Sturka. Beats testing the planes. Think about it. That's where you'd be, up in the wild blue yonder, if it weren't for... Regardless, this is my watch. Any more injuries? It's on my hands. Well, now it's academic, isn't it? Time to go home. Rich. Yeah? I want you cleared by the medics first. Okay. Okay. Here, lean on me, Miller. Hey, you need any help? No, I can shake it off. Come on, Sturka. Thank your lucky stars there was no payload in that assembly. I'll walk you to the gate. You don't mind, do you? End of shift. All employees, please clear the plant at this time. Proceed to the security gate. All employees... Five thirty p.m. Quitting time at the plant. Time to go home to waiting families and supper. Time, perhaps, for a drink on the porch. For summer birds and crickets and the sounds that come with long, warm nights. For the quiet rustle of leaf-laden trees that screen out the moon. And the odd shadows that appear on the cooling sidewalks. And underneath it all, behind the eyes of those who watch, hanging invisible over the summer night, is a horror without words. For this is the stillness before the storm. What awaits Mr. William Sturka now is nothing less than the eve of the end in the twilight zone. And now, the twilight zone and our story, Third from the Sun, starring Fred Willard with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Next. Parkinson, chemical warfare. Parkinson, right. Next. Amberly, hydrogen armament. Check, move along. Mills, chemical weapons research. Where's your badge, Mills? Oh, uh, right here. Check. Sturka, missile assembly. Got it. Thought you were on flight testing. I was, but they need all the manpower they can get on the floor. Keeping you pretty busy, huh? Uh, very. I hear assemblies going on double shifts. That's what they say. Carling missile components. Okay, keep moving. Hold a gate, would you, Sturka? Sure. Long days, huh? Long enough. Say goodbye to coffee breaks. <laughs> Your department's going full force, isn't it? Dawn to dusk. You ever wonder why? Well, I'll tell you. It's coming, boy. It's really coming this time. What is? The big one. I'll bet you while we're talking right now, the military's getting set. Got it all mapped out. 
No way to know a thing like that. Talk is. 48 hours. Wait and see if I'm not right. 48 hours, and we'll have them in the air. Whoosh! Up, over, and whammo. There goes the enemy. Obliterated. Finito. And what are they doing in the meantime? Who? The enemy. What do you mean, what are they doing? They're probably set to retaliate as best they can. Just a big waste of time, though, let me tell you. <laughs> we get the first licks, so they can't do much. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> well, they can do the same thing if they want to. Whoosh. Up, over, and whammo. Absolutely. But not as many as we have. Not so perfectly aimed, not so efficiently launched. <laughs> so instead of losing 50 million people, we lose only 35. Is that your point? You a defeatist, Sturka? Is that the way you think? I don't think anything. Then you'd better watch what you say. And what I think, too? Yeah, and what you think. You don't know who might be listening. That's right. I don't. Good night, Carling. See you tomorrow. Oh, you'll see me all right. Count on it. Hello, baby. Where's your mom? Out in the backyard gardening or something. Pretty late for that. Yeah, I guess. And what are you up to? I'm waiting to teach you how to dance. Uh, just a minute now. Well, you said you wanted to learn the muscle tussle. That's what all the kids are doing, and I promised that I'd... Some other time, honey. Hard day? Yeah, they're all hard lately. Hey, Dad? What, Jody? What's the matter? I mean, really... You look so down. Nothing serious, just feeling my years. What? When I look at you all grown up with that beautiful face. Oh, Daddy. Well, it reminds me that my youth is up in the attic somewhere, stored in a bunch of old photo albums. Is that all? All? <laughs> That's quite enough, believe me. Daddy, do you like your work? What a funny question. I mean, is that the problem? It's all right, it's a job. But yours is... different. A job is a job. None of them are great. That's why they have to pay people to do them. I mean, having to work on the kinds of things you do? Fever bombs and, and hydrogen warheads and nerve gas and things like that. I'm only a cog in a wheel, Jody. Remember that. A very big wheel. Look at it this way. In one bomb there are perhaps, what, a thousand parts? And each part requires a team of... Fifty, sixty, seventy people. So when you're considered in that light, I'm actually not as responsible as... as the ones who... As the ones who what? Hello, Bill. Hello, honey. Jody and I were just... But everyone I talk to lately, they've been noticing it too. Noticing what, Joe? That something's wrong. It's in the air. What are you talking about? I don't know, but something's gonna happen. Isn't it? You know how how it feels in the air when there's going to be a storm or an earthquake? The way all the dogs in the neighborhood get real quiet and then go off and hide somewhere? Nobody knows where they are until, until it's over. Because they're afraid. But they don't understand what it is they're afraid of. Well, lately it's like, everyone's afraid. All my friends at school, everyone, Dad. Why? Jody, listen. <sighs> are you going to tell me or not? Sit down for a minute. We'll both sit. I want to talk to you. About what? Jody, people can be afraid for a lot of reasons. Their jobs, money, what's going on in the world. But the main reason is when they make themselves afraid. Why would they do that? Eh, they don't realize they're doing it. It starts with what they hear on the news, with rumors, with things people say that aren't entirely true. People who play on their ignorance, their stupidity. And there are people who start these rumors, who seem bent on subverting every great advance, every 
fine idea ever thought up, every marvelous invention ever conceived by mankind. Subverting? That's right, Jody. They dirty it up. They take what they can't understand and make it sound crooked and devious and wrong. And then when they've ruined everything and it can't be fixed, they wonder what happened. And they ask why. Sitting in the rubble in their own tears, they ask the question why. But by then it's too late. Far too late for any of us. Bill! Daddy, are you all right? Eve. Yes? Um... Invite Jerry Ryden and his wife over tonight. We'll play some cards or something. Tonight? Yes. Call him up. Ask him to come over around eight or so. But isn't Jerry out of town? Wasn't he testing some kind of aircraft up north? He got back this morning. I told him we'd phone them. If you like. You'll be here, won't you, Jody? They'd like to see you. Can't. Sorry, Dad. I've got a date. Oh, Jody, not tonight. Well, maybe I can get in early. But it's been set up for a long time. I told Mother... Break it, will you? Dad... I'd like you home tonight. But... Jody, listen to your father. He doesn't ask much of you. <sighs> oh, all right, I guess. It means that much to you. Thanks, sweetie. It does. Bill, is there a particular reason why you want us to stay home tonight? No, no, it's just that Jerry has some interesting stories. You'll see. He has some real stories to tell, believe me. His job, it's really very interesting. And uh, I just thought it'd be nice if we were all here tonight. Together. You don't have to explain. I thought maybe you'd like some cards. Get your mind off things. Now, if you two will excuse me... <sighs> I think I'll go to the bedroom and change. Bill. Well, what is it? That's what I'd like to know. Evie, please. What is going on? What do you think is going on? That's just it. I wouldn't know how to talk about it any more than Jody. But I have so much fear inside me that I can't give it words, only feelings. Feelings aren't what matters. Bill, don't shut me out. I want you to tell me whatever it is. I'm not sure I know how. You mean you don't want to? Look at me. I'm your wife. <sighs> oh, Eve, there's so much. But now... Now it's too late for words, for explanations, for debates about what's right or wrong. Try! Eve, remember what we talked about? All the armaments on both sides and what might happen if things went too far? How if we reach a certain point it could be too late to turn back? What are you saying? There's no hiding from it anymore. No pretending it won't happen. I'm sorry, Eve. So terribly sorry, but it's coming. When? Probably within 48 hours. And there's nothing that you or I or anyone else can do to stop it. Not now. Will it... Will it be bad? It will be a holocaust. It'll be hell. The end of everything we know. People, places, ideas, the whole slate, all wiped clean. Did you say 48 hours? It could be sooner. Then what will we... Hey, sit down, Eve. But if that's all the time we have... Sit down on the bed. I'm asking you... Listen very closely. We're leaving. You and me and Jody. Jerry and his wife. When? Tonight. Leaving? For where? I can't tell you that. I can only tell you that sometime between midnight and one, we've got to be out of here, as far away as possible. And no one is to know, not the neighbors, not our relatives, not even Jody. She might let it slip. We won't be able to tell her till we're already on our way. Oh, Bill. <laughs> you have to be strong now. There's no time. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, but... Be right down! Now? Why is someone here now? Stay here. I'll take care of it. 
But what if? Do as I say. Dad, Mom. Ah,、uh, wait, Jody! Don't answer the door yet. I'm coming. Bill, please be careful. I'm here, Jody. Are you expecting someone? Not yet. Well, should I answer the door? I'll get it. Dad, what's the matter? Nothing. Nothing at all. Hello, Bill. Oh, hi, Jerry. You're early. I am. We were just gonna give you a call. Oh, right. Cards. If you came by to tell us you can't make it. Are you kidding? It's a dollar a point tonight. <laughs> I don't know about that. Sure, I've been very hot at cards the last couple of times. So you have. Ah,、uh, can I make you a drink? Ah,、uh, no, thanks. I just dropped by to to talk to you about.、Uh, hi, Jody. How are you? Fine. Bill, I thought I should see you about、um, the watch. What? Your watch giving you trouble again? Is it? Oh,、uh, yeah. It's losing time. Probably the battery. Remember, Jerry? Sure, I remember. I just put a new one in for you last month. Probably some corrosion on the contacts. Yeah, that must be it. Let's take a look at it out in the garage, so I can get to my tools. Good idea, if you don't mind. It won't take a minute. Let's go. Nice seeing you, Jody. Sure, Mr. Ryden. Hey, how's your mother these days? I'm fine, Jared. Just fine. Great. I'll see you later then, with Ann. I hope so. Uh, Joe, can you give me a hand setting the table? Sure, Mom. If you want me to. Uh, come on, Jerry. We can go through the kitchen. Here we are. Now then, Bill, I. Let's see that watch now. Take it off your wrist, and I'll pop open the back. I've had to change the plan. Not now, not yet.、Uh, here's your trouble right here, Jerry. See that? I'll use the drill to buff it down. Now? Keep your voice down. You haven't told him. I told Eve. Jody doesn't know. Keep your head down and keep looking at the watch, and smile. Why? There's a window over there. You never know who's looking or listening. Oh, right. Lean in next to me. That's it. Now, what's the change? They've put a different guard on for the 1 a.m. shift. The man I know, the one I paid off, he clocks out at eleven. And we have to move it up to just before eleven. Can we do that? It'll be a lot tougher. More personnel on the grounds then. That doesn't have to make a difference. We'll tell them the same story. Yeah, you're relatives of mine, and you've got clearance to look at the new ship. That's right. It'll still work. It has to. Did you explain it to Anne? Not everything. Only that we're in danger and we've got to get out. I didn't tell her where or when. Better that way. Jody will stay home tonight. I told her you were coming over later. You and Anne. Can you make it around eight? Yeah. Ah, there you go. I think that does it, Jerry. Hey, thanks. Just a little buildup on the contact points. You might want to have it checked over by a jeweler. I couldn't get all the corrosion out. I appreciate it, Bill. Very much. Best part is, <laughs> I'm not even going to charge you. What was that? Uh, a cat, probably、uh, outside in the yard. I thought I saw something move at the window. Well, that's it, Jerry. You can put your watch on now. See you later.、Uh, about eight. What do you bid, Jerry? Hmm. I said nothing. This hand's garbage. Well, you can't just throw it in again. Well, Jerry's got the right idea. I've got garbage too. <laughs> well, who dealt this mess? You did. Whoa, she's got you there, Evie. Maybe we should give it a break. Yeah, fine with me. You okay, Jody? Sure, I'm just super. How about some lemonade and homemade cake? Sounds wonderful. I didn't give Jerry any dessert tonight. 
The rigors of a test pilot's wife. Oh, you. Let me help. I'll just get a tray. Jody? Yes, Mother? Will you give us a hand in the kitchen, please? Okay. I've got ten minutes to ten. That right? Yeah. The clock on the mantle's dead accurate. Everything's set, then. You're sure nobody suspects? I can't see how. You don't sound positive. There's no way. Well, what about that guy in your department, the one who asked so many questions? What's his name? Carling. Still curious? Still. Not so much questions as hints and innuendos. If he's an informer, he's not very subtle. Well, he has nothing to go on, does he? Not a thing. Forget about him. Jerry, uh, what about our destination? Right there. How far? What does it matter? A few million miles, give or take. A few million miles in a ship we don't even know will leave the atmosphere. Or whether its pilot will be able to take off and set it down in one piece. But that's the risk, Bill. That's the risk we've been talking about for months now. It's not a bad risk when you consider the alternatives. And the place we're going? It's populated. We've picked up radio waves, even some snatches of a language not dissimilar to ours. We've been able to decipher a lot of it. And with a little help, a couple of breaks, and the grace of God, we might even make it there. What? Who's here? Put the paper away. Let that be too obvious. Turn it over, at least. Bill? Look who's here. Well, how goes it, Sturka? And Ryden? Carling? What brings you... I mean, uh... Oh, just taking a walk. Saw your house, thought I'd stop off, say hello. Wasn't sure if you were home with all the blinds drawn. So I went to the back door, knocked. Oh, you're welcome anytime, Mr. Carling. Why, thank you. <laughs> a little game of cards tonight, huh? Uh, a little game of cards. We're about to cut into a cake. Care to join us? Uh, just a little more lemonade for me. I was telling your wife that she makes wonderful lemonade. <sighs> Not too sweet, a little tart, if you know what I mean. I think I do. Hot night, isn't it? A night for the front porch. Or sleep. <laughs> Not much else. How right you are. Jerry, what time's it getting to be? Whoops. Uh, that late. What's the matter? <laughs> Later than you thought, huh, Ryden? We have to leave in a couple of minutes. Oh? I've been up north, you see. Testing an aircraft, wasn't it? That's right. I haven't had much sleep the last couple of weeks. I know the craft. Do you? Well, they say it's capable of leaving our atmosphere. <laughs> Talk is it could go to another planet if the right man flew her. Not for a while yet. Needs more testing. Is that a fact? <laughs> you wouldn't uh, happen to have a cigarette, would you, Sturka? No. Uh, wait, uh, there's an old pack in my pocket. <laughs> Eve talked me into quitting. A wise woman. Bad for your health. Wouldn't want to take any risks. Uh, not on your life. Here. Don't bother. I'll come get them. Uh, uh, more lemonade? Jody and I will bring the cake. Light? <sighs> I've got it. Keeping score, are you? Yep. The way I figure it, after that last hand, Bill and Ann owe me a little money here. That a fact. He's a marvelous scientist, a very bad card player. <laughs> now, I wouldn't have believed that. I'd have guessed that Sturka here was a good gambler. I'd have guessed he'd gamble on most anything. Lemonade all around? I'll cut the cake, Mom. And I'll serve. Can you pour, Eve? Uh, of course I can. Well, let me help you, Mrs. Sturka. Uh, oh, I don't know what's the matter with me. I've spilled some. You seem nervous. Why, I'm not nervous. Not at all. I'd say you are. Very nervous. Your hand's shaking. I'll do it, Mom. It's the card game. <laughs> she doesn't like to lose. Yeah, that must be it. Well, what do you know? It's all right here on this paper. What is? That's just some rough figures. Well, according to this, you've lost a lot of money, Sturka. But I suppose, you know, what's between friends remains between friends. I'd better hold on to that. Don't sweat it, Bill. 
We don't have to settle tonight. Next week. Next week, we'll give you another chance. You'd better. Next week, eh? You plan ahead. Way ahead. A week? That's nothing. I beg to differ. A lot can happen in a week. Even in 48 hours. What are you getting at? <laughs> He's not getting at anything. Yes, he is. If there's something on your mind, why don't you come out and say it? Go ahead, Carling. I'd like to hear it. There's nothing on my mind. Nothing at all. Well, I'd better go on home now. I'll show you to the door. Thanks. I'll see you at the plant tomorrow. Bright and early. <sighs> Pretty night. Clear as a bell. Take a look up there. Nothing but stars. Ever wonder if those stars have planets? And if those planets have people on them, too? Maybe even people like us? That thought's crossed my mind. Ever think, maybe you'd be better off there than you are here? <laughs> that thought's crossed my mind, too. I have no doubt. See you uh, in the morning, then? Yes, in the morning. An odd man, didn't you think? Oh, I don't know. The way he kept watching us. Like he expected someone to let something slip. That's just Carling. What time's it getting to be? Ten already. What was that all about? Come along, honey. Help me clean up. No, I want to know. I don't like that man. Why was he here? Why are you all... You're going to have to tell her. But Jerry... Do you think that's a good idea? Tell me what? Will somebody please? Jody, baby, listen. This is very, very important. What is? We're leaving here tonight. What do you mean, leaving? There's a ship over at the government field. We're all going to get in the car and drive there. But why? Listen to your father. We've had to bribe a lot of people to get to this point. The ship's loaded with supplies. Enough to last for a long time. You've been planning this? I don't want to leave. All my friends... This is our last chance. We've got to leave here tonight. Jerry, I'm frightened. What's so special about tonight? Because the world as we know it, this world, won't exist much longer. What? It's about to blow itself up. With the help of a few misguided people. And it looks like it's going to happen by morning. And by morning, where will we be? A long, long way from here. A long, long way. We'll be out in space, Jody. On an adventure. The biggest adventure anyone has ever taken. Your mother has a suitcase packed for us. It's under the stairs. I want you to go and get it. All right, everybody. I'll back the car out. Ann and Jerry, is your bag ready? It's in our bedroom. I'll carry it. Then let's get going. Bill? Bill? I've got to answer it. No. Can't he just let it ring? If he does, they'll know something's up. Who will? Yes. Sturka. Who's this? Evans. Oh, hello. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to do something. And what's that? I need you back at the department. When? Tonight. That uh, might be difficult. I know, and I'm sorry, but something's happening. A new level of alert. We're asking all the crews to report in. I don't know how I can... We're sending a car for you. It's on the way now. I'm, uh... I'm in bed. So was practically everyone else I called. Get out of bed and put your clothes on. You don't, uh... You, you don't understand I'm ill. How ill? A bad cold fever. That's too bad, but this is urgent. Top priority. I wouldn't be much use to you. Nothing less than rigor mortis would excuse you tonight. The car will be there in a few minutes. Bill? That was my division head. They're working around the clock tonight. They're sending a car for me. I knew it. We'd better get out of here right now. I'll get the bag. And I'll get ours. Eve, did you hear me? Yes, I heard. I just have to put these glasses away first. And the cake so it won't spoil. And... Leave it! Leave it, honey. Just 
Let it go. Everything. All right, if you say so, Bill. I suppose someone will wash them, won't they? It doesn't matter now. Do you hear me? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yes, as soon as I get my purse and my keys. Uh, do you see my keys, Bill? I, I don't know where they are. I can't go out of my house without my keys. How would I lock the door? I couldn't, could I? Why, the house would be wide open. It wouldn't be safe. Eve! Eve! Oh, but, but that's foolish, isn't it? I'm being silly. Because we're not coming back here, are we? Never. Not ever. This car go any faster? We're almost there. It's just up ahead. Everybody okay in back? We're fine. There's the gate. Pull over on this side of the fence. Right. No reason to drive through the checkpoint. Stay in the car for now. It's awfully dark. It won't be if they put on the searchlights. What if they do? They won't, unless there's a security breach. For now, we're only observers. Government property starts at the fence. Dad, look. Out there on the field. What is that thing? That's our transportation. Yep. That's it. But it doesn't even look like anything I've ever... I know. It's top secret. The craft I was testing. It's an experimental design, a prototype. Will it fly? It did up north. Bill, who's that? Oh, it must be our contact. That's him. It, it has to be. Why is he carrying a flashlight? Give him the signal. Eve, lean over and flash the headlights once. If you say so. Wait a minute. That's... that's not... Good evening, Sturka. Fancy meeting you here. I could say the same. A long way from home, aren't you? Uh, it was my idea. I, I told him to drive out and see the ship. <laughs> That's quite a story. You don't honestly think anyone will believe it, do you? Jerry, he's got a gun. Now take it easy, Carling. Just stand there quietly, you two. Very, very quietly. And don't make a move. Wouldn't want to set off any alarms. What do you want? Name it. Would you mind getting back in the car? Sure, Ed. Just do me a favor, huh? And put the gun down. In the car. The front seat, please. What for? We're going for a little ride to the checkpoint. And I'll be in the back seat. Is that necessary? Would you three ladies be so kind as to get out? The two gentlemen and I have an engagement with the authorities. They have nothing to do with this. In that case, they have nothing to worry about. Someone will be along for them in a moment. Now step out, please. If you insist. Careful with the door now. Slowly. No, Mr. Carling. You be careful! Oh! Get the gun! I got it! Give it to me. In one second. Sturka, you don't realize what you're doing. Don't I? Oh. Bill, is he... Get in the car, Jerry. The gate's open. We're going through. Unauthorized vehicle unsealed. Unauthorized vehicle unsealed. Guard unit 7, approach and apprehend. Approach unauthorized vehicle. to the ship! Run! Hurry, Anne. I'm hurrying! Bill, wait! Dad! Let's go, now! Use the ladder. One at a time. Halt! Go, inside the ship! Sturka, what are you doing? 
Saving my family. But you can't. Can I? Stand back. Quickly, I have to seal the hatch. I'm coming. Fire it up. I told him to stay strapped in till we leave the atmosphere. Everybody okay? Twelve o'clock and all is well. Pressure's good. Air, fuel supply. The stars look far away. They are. But the one we want, that's not as far. Which one is it? Uh, see it there? The, the shiny one. Bright blue, over on the right. Yes, I see it. And are there people on it? People like us? People like us. It's the third planet from the sun, Bill. That's where we're going. To a place called Earth. Hmm. Earth. Nice name. I like the sound of it. Full speed ahead! Aye, aye, Captain. Steady as she goes. One tiny ship heading into space... And behind it, a doomed planet on the verge of suicide. Ahead lies a place called Earth, the third planet from a small, relatively unimportant sun. But for William Sturka and the men and women with him, it's finally the eve of the beginning, in a region known as the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered while supplies last at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often and I'll see you in the zone. Third from the Sun, starring Fred Willard with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling from a story by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Doug James, Ellie Weingart, Haley Nabig, Tom McElroy, Frenette Lebo, Jeff Lupatin, Kurt Nabig, Vince Amari, and Carl Amari. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabot, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking.
you're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Diane. What? Come here and sit down. In a minute. What are you doing? Going for a swim. What does it look like? Now? Of course now. Before the sun gets too high. But you haven't finished your drink yet. It's not going anywhere, Eddie. Right now, this pool looks positively delicious. Nice form. I give you a 10. <laughs> You'd better say that. Nice bathing suit, too. Come on in. The water's fine. I don't want to get wet. Why? I gave you some trunks. They're a little on the large side. Don't you think? They might come off. Mm. Promises, promises. Diane, please. I'm lonely over here. <laughs> I brought you a towel, Mrs. Templeton. Thank you, Marty. Can I get you anything else? Not just now. I came down to join Mr. Page for a swim. Yes, ma'am. So I see. Has Mr. Templeton left yet? In another few minutes. Good. I mean, that's fine. Tell him I'll see him when he gets back. Very good. Oh, Marty, is that your name? Yes, sir. Would you mind mixing up another one of these? What do you call it? Mimosa. Yeah, another mimosa, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> Make it two. One for the lady. Certainly, sir. Rub some lotion on my shoulders, would you, Eddie? I wouldn't want to peel. Sure thing. <laughs> oh, you have such strong hands. Did he say your husband's still here? He'll be gone soon. He has a rehearsal. Oh. He doesn't mind, huh? Me being here now? That's what the guest house is for. Friends who come and visit. But I don't even know him. I hardly even know you. How long has it been? Since yesterday? I know a friend when I meet one. We are going to be friends, aren't we? Yeah, you better believe it. Lie down. What? So I can do your legs. <sighs> Not yet, Eddie. There'll be plenty of time. They're really red. You don't want to burn, do you? <laughs> oh, you silly boy. Swim a few laps for now. Work it off. Not on your life. These trunks are a size large. Maybe that's why I loaned them to you. Stand up. Oh, no. Come on, stand up. I'm not going to push you in. Promise? Promise. There. Now, turn this way. That's it. Hazel. Hazel who? Your eyes. I wanted to see what color they are in the sun. And yours are... green. So I've been told. You know, maybe we shouldn't be out here like this. Why not? I just saw somebody at the window. What do you care? We're not doing anything, are we? No, but if that's your husband, I feel kind of funny. Why? Because you're all wet? <laughs> hey, you promised. <laughs> Didn't you know? Promises are made to be broken. <laughs> The young woman is Diane Templeton, the wife of Booth Templeton. In a moment, you'll meet Mr. Templeton himself, the subject of our story, who up to this point has remained off stage. During a long career, he has had the lead in more than 30 Broadway plays. Today, he's a bit late in getting to the theater because as you will see, he's not feeling up to par. In theatrical terms, his heart's not in the role. 
Yesterday and its memories are his script of choice. And that being the case, yesterday is exactly what he'll get. Within the hour, his years and troubles will threaten to descend on him like a final curtain. To avoid being crushed, Mr. Booth Templeton must escape from the theater and this world only to make his debut on another stage in another world, one we call The Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Trouble with Templeton, starring Michael York with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Ah, yes, yes, fun in the sun. Good morning, Mr. Templeton. Oh, hello, Marty. Ready to pick out a necktie? I suppose. Let's see. How about the blue stripes? I was thinking this one. Very smart. Laura gave it to me. Oh, it must have been 30 years ago now. Did she? Excellent taste. Well, she certainly had that. Help you with a knot? No, no. I can still manage to tie a Windsor, even with these hands. I had your jacket pressed. Thank you. Um, say, Marty? Yes, sir? Our new guest at uh, Poolside. His name is what? Page, I believe, sir. Mr. Edward Page. 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 Has he been here before? No, sir. He's new. Aren't they always? Oh, and don't forget your pills. Are they new, too? The same ones, every three hours. Hmm. Mrs. Templeton is not very discreet these days, is she? I'm sure I couldn't say. Well, her discretion was an early casualty. It didn't last long. And now, uh, perhaps she's waiting for the day when these pills won't um, do what they're designed to do. Perhaps I'm waiting for that day, too. Mr. Templeton, you shouldn't say that. Oh, don't distress yourself, my friend. When a man my age marries a woman her age, she gets exactly what he deserves. Come now. I'm ready for my jacket. Here you are. Glad you're here. I'm old, Marty. Mr. Templeton, you'll never be old. Old? And getting older every minute we stand here. They say, or at least the authors said it in most of my plays, that when a man achieves a certain number of years, he achieves reason and contentment, a reassuring sentiment, only I haven't quite accomplished that yet. Wonder if I ever will. Mr. Templeton, may I make a suggestion? Hmm? Well, perhaps this isn't a good day for you to go down to the theatre. They're only just beginning rehearsals. I could telephone and explain that you can't start today. Thank you, Marty, but I'll go there. I shall rehearse this play, and it will open on schedule. I shall cover the years with makeup, and I shall stand in the right place and hope to say the right lines. And when it is over, they'll say to me, You were wonderful, Mr. Templeton, as usual. And the stage manager will see to it that I'm properly delivered to you so that you can properly deliver me back here. And I can prepare to do it all over again the following night. I won't see or particularly care about what's going on out there or in the guest house or in this house. All I will want will be to go to bed, Marty, alone. That's the best place for me. Sleep. <laughs> Oblivion. Now, sir, you mustn't talk like that. Oh, it doesn't matter. I don't love her anymore. I don't remember when I did. You know, I can't recall one single contented moment with Diane. I haven't had many contented moments in my life, though I do recall a few long ago with Laura. Did you know that this was her music box? Please, Mr. Templeton. She was the freshest, most radiant creature God ever created. Eighteen when I married her, Marty. Twenty-four when she died. Uh, we didn't have long together, my first wife and I. But I'm forever grateful.
grateful for those years. Sir, don't do this to yourself. You know, there are some moments in life that have an indescribable loveliness to them. The world is transformed. The sky, the sun, a single blade of grass. The simple act of waking up, knowing that each day is full of treasures beyond compare. Such as those moments with Laura. They're all I have now. You understand that, Marty? Yes, Mr. Templeton, I believe I do. But that was... Oh, don't distress yourself, old friend. I'm all right. I'm quite all right. Now, where's my scarf? Here, sir. I'll go downstairs and bring the car around. You do that. Hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work I go. The Savoy, isn't it, sir? Indeed. The site of countless famous productions. The locked rooms of the heart, the O'Neill one acts, and the comedies. Dixie Dugan at the races, her simian husband, uh, oh, oh, so very many. I see the theatre just ahead. Well, what do you know? The old marquee is still there. It's so much more dramatic by night. The great white way, ablaze with stars. Ah, you should have seen it then, Marty. I did, sir. At least some of it. Not at its peak, of course. But the first Broadway play I ever attended, you had top billing. I waited outside to congratulate you. Remember? Yes, of course. People did that in those days. Fans, autograph hounds, gathered at the stage door. Here we are, sir. I'll wait for you in the loading zone. I uh, might be a while. Never a problem, Mr. Templeton. I brought my book to read. Unless a policeman comes along, in which case I can circle the block and find a place at the corner or in the alley. I'll keep an eye out for you. Actually, it shouldn't take long today. First rehearsals are a simple read-through. If you care to go to lunch... I'll be fine, sir. All part of my job. Thank you, my friend. Ever loyal. Not at all. It's an honor. Well then, once more unto the breach. Oh, and sir. Yes? Do break a leg, so to speak. Very kind of you. I will. I will. Oh, no billboard yet. I remember every time a new one went up... You're late, Booth. Hmm? What's that? After 12, kiddo. Is it really? The boy wonder won't like it. <clears throat> and uh, who is the boy wonder? Why, Arthur Willis. 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 The director. No, 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 no. You must be mistaken. Duff Mead is our director, a dear friend of mine. Was. Canned him last night. Surely not. We need someone with more pep, zip. Not my racket, but I know what's good and what's bad as well as the next guy. I wanted to drop by this morning and let everybody know that I'm personally interested in this thing. Art Willis is okay with you, isn't he? Well, I, uh, I've uh, heard the name, of course, but I don't actually know him. Mr. I'm Sid Sperry. Remember that name? Why, I believe I... Uh... I'm your angel. Big pardon? <laughs> That's what they call them, isn't it? My money's backing this play. Oh, yes, 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 Mr. Sperry. I'm rather forgetful about names. Always have been. Okay by me, just as long as you don't forget your lines. Uh, I'll do my best. Come on, I'll walk you in. Just... Stepped outside to have a smoke myself. Uh, yes, of course. I can hardly wait. Always a pleasure to begin rehearsals. I'll say this once, just once, and no more. But I'll 
say it now and expect each and every one of you to understand it. Wonder Boy, I take it. Shh, the man's a genius. Michael Franz is producing The Angry Lovers. Mr. Combs has written it. You have all been hired to act in it. And I have been contracted to direct it. So, make no mistake about what we are here to do and make no mistake about me. A ship has only one captain. I am in charge. I will direct every aspect of the production my way at all times. Is that clear? Yes, Mr. Willis. Quite clear, Mr. Willis. I like that. Like it very much. In control, that boy, right from the start. We're in good hands. We, Mr... Sperry, Templeton, Sperry. Oh, yes, yes, uh, Mr. Sperry, I apologize. How impolite of me. I won't forget again. Yeah, I'm sure you won't. So, now that we're all here... Almost all of us. Ah, uh, the elder member of the cast. Call his home. Yes, Mr. Willis. Call him and tell him that if he's not here, I'll have no choice but... Uh, that won't be necessary. Well, well. Booth Templeton, Mr... Willis, is it? Never mind, Janine. Yes, sir. So, you finally decided to put in an appearance. No offense intended. How do you do? Hello. Welcome. It's a pleasure, sir. Thank you, thank you. Some members of this company are young. Some are old. But neither condition precludes any of us young or old from ignoring the basics. Cooperation is what is required in my plays... When I direct, there is no cult of personality, but there are three significant dates in the life of any play. The first day of rehearsal, opening night, and closing night. The last two are intimately related to and dependent upon the first. Therefore, the first day of rehearsal is an extremely important day, the bedrock of any production. Of course, my mistake. But now that I... When I call rehearsal for 12 o'clock, Templeton, I mean 12 o'clock for everyone, young and old. Everyone in his place and ready to work. Are you ready to work with us, Templeton? Why, I... Uh... I asked you a question. I expect an answer. Speak up, Templeton. Templeton, speak up, man. No. No, I... Where does he think he's going? The stage door. Come back here. Both, come back. Templeton, you come back here right now. There he is. Is it really him? Ruth Templeton. Yeah, Mr. Templeton. You were really wonderful. May I have your autograph? Oh, but I... Please, Mr. Templeton, sign my book. Mine too. You are don't understand. Yeah, could you sign my program? What's all this? I've seen every play you've been in, Mr. Tempton. I've never missed a performance. You're my favorite actor. I think you're the best, Mr. Tempton. Why, thank you. When are you going to Hollywood to be in talking pictures? Talking pictures? Have you met... Greta Garbo. You'd be great together. Just one autograph, please. Sign mine. That profile is so handsome. Please, I'm very tired. If you'd let me through. This way. What? Huh? Around the corner. I can't believe I just met Booth Templeton. Bye, Mr. Templeton. See you tomorrow for the man thing. They won't follow you. Don't worry. You're a star. Am I? <laughs> I was once. Where's Marty? Who? May I ask what is going on? Huh? Those taxi cabs. Why are they all so ancient? They look new to me. There. Now you're in the clear. <laughs> Thank you. Think nothing of it. Always glad to help. You know that. You look familiar. Have we met? <laughs> now you're ribbing me, Mr. Templeton. You know my name. Anderson, the stage manager. Anderson. Yes, yes. Wait a minute, what's this? What's what? 
This billboard, how long has it been here? Oh, a few days, I guess. Since they started previews. What's the matter? Don't you like it? I do. But it's a collector's item. Will be, I guess, if you sign it. Hold on. Why is it on the side of the building? Savoy Theatre, Booth Templeton in The Great Seed, 1927's biggest hit. Yep. I never read reviews so good. You're going to get an award for this one. 1927? That's 35 years ago. Written and directed by Barney Fluger. Barney? He sure is good, huh, Mr. Templeton? Another winner for both of you. What year is this? Oh, there you go again. All in my leg. Most assuredly not. I have to know. <laughs> All right. It's 1927. And what else could it be? But that's not possible. Oh, I almost forgot. I got a message to deliver. A message? Yeah, your wife called. My wife? Yeah, on the backstage phone. I guess she's seen the play lots of times, huh? What's her name? <laughs> you mean to tell me you got more than one wife? Her name, man. Why, uh, it's Laura. Same as always. Isn't it? That's not very funny. No? It sounded like her. But Laura's dead. Well, if she is, she's the best-looking ghost I ever saw. Uh, no offense. Where's Laura? Where, where is she? Well, she said for you to meet her at your regular place. Where is that? For the love of God, man. Relax. It ain't far. That club, the private one. What? You know, Freddie Iacinas, down the street. When? She's there now. It isn't possible. Freddy Iacinas, the way it used to be. Unmarked because of the prohibition. I'd know this door anywhere. Yeah? Freddy. Oh, hi, Mr. Templeton. Come on in. Freddy, it is you. What'd you expect? But I'd swear this is your old speakeasy. Can't be too careful these days. Always expecting a raid or something. Why, this is fantastic. Where the elite meet to eat. Nick, make my friend a drink. What'll it be? Uh, nothing right now. Suit yourself. Uh, one Manhattan, one old fashioned, a screwdriver, and a glass of beer. Table set. Coming right up. Freddy, my wife. Yeah? Is she here? Sure. Came in a little while ago. But she's not at our usual table. Table three, over there. What do you have tonight? Steaks or chops? Nothing. Nothing. Freddy, we're not staying very long. If you change your mind, let me know. I will, I will. <laughs> oh, Barney, you're a scream. Laura? Is it you? Hi! Hey, Booth! We didn't wait, as you can see. Barney? Barney Fluger? The same, to know I must love him. But I haven't seen you in years. It only seems that long. How soon they forget. Sit down, old man. I'll be right back. Laura. <laughs> Laura, darling. Oh, my goodness. Relax. The Kansas City steak's great tonight. So juicy. Right? Laura. What's the matter, honey? You look worried. I hurried over as soon as I heard. Heard of what? Ugh, Booth. How many times have I told you to take off your makeup before you come in here? Makeup? This isn't the green room. It makes you look old. 
Laura, darling, let's go somewhere else. We already are somewhere else. I mean, where, where it's quieter, where there aren't so many people. Well, I happen to like people. The more the merrier. I want to talk to you. Why? Well, about several things. Very important things. Well, I want to have a good time. Oh, you hoo Yes? Could you get me another one of these, please? And make it the good stuff, not that watered-down hooch. Coming right up, Mrs. Templeton. But I have to talk to you. So go ahead. I'm all ears. Oh, Laura, darling, where do I begin? I don't know why I'm here or for how long. All I know is I'm here. Do tell. And I want to make good use of the time. I want to have you alone to myself. Oh, Ruth, don't be dull. I'm back. Miss me? Not particularly. You gonna eat, old chap? What? If you are, better get your order in now. The new band swell. Laura. Barney. So are the steaks. The jumps are a bit chewy, though. He's right, honey. Now, listen to me, you two. I have something important to say. So do I. Barney, do you have those pages with you? Pages? The script you were working on. Let me see it. I don't think that's a good idea. I need something to fan myself with. It's so hot tonight. Oh! <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. Be my guest. Your drink. Thanks, Dudes. Laura, we need to talk now before anything else happens. What could happen, old boy? The police won't come in here. Hey, George, bring me another. And one for the gentleman, too. Coming right up. Mm, I'd be glad to get into a cold tub. Laura, please, put that down. Give it here. Look at you, Booth. You're ridiculous. Will you tell me one thing? But that's what I'm trying to... Why on this glad green earth are you wearing an overcoat on a night like this? I mean, really. You look like Rudy Valley. I'm not so sure that it is a glad green earth. Oh, Laura, Laura, darling, Barney, I'm not so certain of this earth or anything else right now. Please, listen to me, won't you? Don't be such a wet blanket. Listen! Something's happened. Something very strange. Please, try to understand. This isn't makeup. I have grown older, darling. In another world for many, many lonely years, I've had only a memory of you to live on. You too, Barney. Why, you were my best friend. But both of you have been only memories for a long time. And now, tonight, or today, or whatever it is, wherever I am in space and time, I have you back again. You're alive. You didn't die. Life is going on here. It's as if you never died, either of you. You do understand, don't you? Oh, sure. Laura, do you understand? Come on, let's have a good time, huh? Laura, why are you so different? I don't remember you drinking like this. Well, that's the kind of hairpin I am, Booth. That's just the way it is. I mean, what did you expect? Yes, old chap. What did you expect? I... Uh, I don't know. But you were my love, Laura. Everywhere. At all times. Why, we couldn't walk down the street or sit in a restaurant without everyone knowing that we were in love. Are you finished? I... I don't like what you've become. Oh, really, Booth? <laughs> He's having us on, that's it. Shut up. Shut up, both of you. You silly old fool of a man. Laura, come away from here. <gasps> that's for me. Who wants to dance? Laura, come with me now. Hey, take your hands off. Stop it. Stop it. Leave me alone. Why don't you go back where you came from? We don't want you here. Laura, you slapped me. Ugh, leave me alone. See here, Booth. Let's not have a scene. Isn't anyone going to dance with me? How about you, Barney? Oh, no. I can't do the Charleston. You know that. Come on, you old stick in the mud. Let's cut a rug. 
Look at that girl dance. I say, Laura, you're a real flapper. Stop. Stop, I tell you. Something wrong here? Yes. It's all wrong. She won't listen. Take it easy, Mr. Templeton. Have a good time. That's the problem. Time. Who knows how long this will last? It's a gift. Every moment of it, every second. I can't let her squander it. Have a round on the house. No, you don't understand. I'd say you're the one who doesn't understand, old boy. This place is for the young. If you can't get with it, perhaps you should go somewhere else. You're mad, all of you. Come on, Mr. Templeton. You don't fit in. Freddy's right, you don't. Why won't you listen? I didn't ask to come here. Are you sure? Perhaps you did. And now that you're here, you're miserable. Well, why ruin it for us? Don't you see? This simply isn't for you. Not anymore. Maybe you should listen to him. We don't want any trouble. I don't want any trouble either, but you don't know what it's like. Seeing my wife, my best friend... Come along now. Peaceful life. Get some air. Yes, that's what I need to clear my head. Right this way. See you in the funny papers, old boy. Dance, go dance. Go, 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 go. See you some other time, Barney. I don't think so. Oh, Barney. What have we done? What we had to do. I'll miss him. Me too. Do you think he knows? If not right away, then later. He'll figure it out. But when, Barney? It's for his own good. You love him, don't you? I do. Then try to remember that. Hold on to it. For his sake. <laughs> What, what do you want? My wife's your biggest fan. We just saw the great seed. You were brilliant. Great show. I'm sorry, I... May I have your autograph? Not now, please. What are you? Stock up? All we want's an autograph. Very well, then. There. Oh. I, I'm afraid I must be going. It's... Fantastic. The cars, the clothing, just as they were. The lights, the marquees. Find her all right, Mr. Templeton? W what? Your wife. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, Harvey. I, I suppose I should thank you. Where are you headed now? I, uh, I honestly don't know. Need a cab? Uh, yes. Uh, no, I, I mean, my driver. Where has he gone? Your driver? His name is Marty. He said he'd wait for me in front. But that was hours ago. It was still daylight. I don't follow. Never mind. It, it's not possible for him to be there and here as well. I always hail you a cab. Most nights, at least. When you're not going over to Freddy's. Harvey, may I ask a favor of you? You bet. Just listen to me for a moment. Don't say anything. I want to confirm something. Shoot. Well, you see, I, I seem to be having a problem with my memory. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. I'm serious. I honestly don't know what I'm doing here. The last thing I remember, I was in the theater, the Savoy. This is the Savoy, isn't it? Better be, or I'm working in the wrong place. I was here this afternoon to begin rehearsals. For what? This one just opened. Want to run for months, if you ask me. 
A director named Willis, the boy wonder of Broadway. Never heard of him. The play was called The Angry Lovers. Yeah? What were they angry about? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Well, that's where I beg to differ. My wife and me, you never go to bed mad. Do that and you drive yourself crazy. Whatever happened, that's that. The past is the past. Future lies ahead. You know what I mean? I think I see your point. Take it from me. Let sleeping dogs lie. Keep moving. Don't let the grass grow. Am I right or am I right? Quite right, I should say. Well, if you don't need me, I better go back inside. You sure you're okay? No, but um, I suppose that's okay too. It'll have to be. And take off your overcoat. What? It's too hot tonight. You'll get heat prostration. Oh, thank you, Harvey. I'll do that. Don't mention it. See you tomorrow, Mr. Templeton. Oh, why did I wear this blasted thing? What was in the pocket? Oh, Barney's latest play. Not a very long one. Looks like a rough draft. What in the... What to do when Booth comes back? Setting, table and speakeasy. Enter Booth as Laura throws back her head and laughs too shrilly. Laura. Oh, Barney, you're a scream. Booth, Laura, is it you? Barney. Hi, Booth. We didn't wait, as you can see. Booth? Barney? Barney Fluger? Barney? The same. To know him is to love him. Sit down, old chap. I don't believe this. It is a script, but for what? Laura, why don't you go back where you came from? We don't want you here. They were acting the whole time. <sighs> but why? For me? Yes. Yes, that's it. They wanted to tell me something, to leave them here, in the past, to go back to my own life and live it. That's what they wanted me to understand. Star. He was. He's still a draw. If we make the announcement now, it will sound like the production's in trouble. There he is now. Let me handle this. Templeton. Mr. Willis, I presume. One question. Are you in? Or are you out? I am definitely in. And it is definitely Mr. Templeton, especially to one so young as you. Now, wait a minute. Excuse me, Mr... Sperry, if you have something to say to I me... I do, Mr. Sperry, and it is simply this. I never allow anyone not directly connected with the production to attend my rehearsals. That is a matter best left to the artist you hire to do their job, which, as I understand it, is to give you a hit play. Say... And your job is to remain out of sight and not interfere. In fact... I insist upon it. Just who do you think you are? I don't think. I know. The name is Booth Templeton. Yeah, well, I don't care. Sydney, if... run along. But... I said I'll handle it. Yeah, right, all right. But see that you do. Now then, uh, shall we start rehearsal? I'd like that, Mr. Templeton. I uh, guess I came on too strong before. I don't blame you for taking a break. Think nothing of it, young man. What's past is past. I like your attitude. I've just had a remarkable experience. For a moment, <laughs> I almost forgot who I am. And when. I couldn't possibly expect you to comprehend. Perhaps I'll tell you about it someday. I look forward to it. Booth Templeton. Is that you? I don't believe I... Harvey? 
Yes, sir. Good to see you, sir. Harvey Anderson, you're still stage manager of the Savoy after all these years? Wouldn't miss it for the world. Like I always say, the future lies ahead. Everyone, break time's over. Do you know, Mr. Willis, you were right. The first day of rehearsal is the most important date in the life of a play. And this will be our first day to begin anew. How do you do, Mr. Templeton? My pleasure. An honor to be working with you, sir. The honor is mine. I admire you so much. Me too, sir. No, not at all, not at all. Now, let's roll up our sleeves and get to work, shall we? We have a play to put on. Mr. Booth Templeton who shares with most human beings a hunger to recapture the distant past, moments that soften and blur with the years. But in this case, the characters from his past blocked his return and sent him back to his own time, because for the living, the future always lies ahead. Mr. Booth Templeton, who discovered in his pocket a round-trip ticket to the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. The Trouble with Templeton, starring Michael York with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by E. Jack Newman. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Rebecca Spence, Nick Sandys, Frenette Lebo, Rick Arthur, David Darlow, Doug James, Tom McElroy, Roy Anderson, Tom Lally, Carl Amari, Linda Ryder, Terry Lopez, and Vince Amari. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website, at twilightzoneradio.com Doug You're traveling through another dimension a dimension not only of sight and sound but of mind a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination your next stop the twilight zone wrong with you? We are behind schedule. The jungle is too thick, Clemente. Use your machetes, all of you. We have used them. Now they are dull. Then sharpen them. The burros need water. He's right, Ramos. If we lose another animal, we cannot make it. <sighs> Very well. Make camp here. Alto. We rest. How 
much longer, Alessandro? A few more days, perhaps a week. If this is the right way to the capital. What? You have the map. What does it say? We are here by the mountains. We should go around, through the lowlands. No, that is too far. We must strike the Cruz now, before his army comes looking for us. Don't worry, Ramos. We are not worth hunting. You say that to me? I speak the truth. Look around. What do you see? Men of destiny. Oh? And how many are we today? The campesinos support us. They give us food, shelter. That is because we are the ones who march. We are the point of the spear. When we strike, they will follow. But only if we succeed. The jungle is full of rebels. They will come out of their caves to join us. First, we must survive. The way through the mountains is difficult. Cristo and Tamar are loyal. And Garcia. And what of the others? If they go back to their wives, we are alone. A teacher and a dreamer. Your words are strange to my ears, Javier. As if they come from a woman. <laughs> Politics is more than a cause, my friend. It is a strategy. When a bridge is weak, it must fall. Remember the history of our land. The earth is ripe with the blood of other rebellions. We will not fail. There is no shame in it. We can take up arms again when the time is right. This is our moment. Not this year, Ramos. And perhaps not next year either. That is still too soon. But sooner or later, the crops will fail. The people will rise up and we will show them the way. Now, the bellies are full from the harvest. They are not ready. Listen to your fear. You yourself taught me that the people rally behind a leader. A brave leader who knows no fear. Only a fool is without fear. I am not a fool. I am a man. More will come. They will leave their villages and march with us, 10,000 strong. The Cruz's guard will not fire on us. They are our brothers. And how many brothers do we have here? Eleven? Twelve? Turn back now, my friend, before it is too late. Too late? Hear me well, because this, I swear, one week from now, we take the capital. This is Ramos Clemente and his ragtag band of followers. Chief among them, Xavier D'Alessandro, his political advisor and sergeant-at-arms. Clemente is the keeper of a dream. Once he walked behind a mule as it plowed someone else's land, looked up at a hot Central American sun and pledged the impossible. He vowed that he would lead his people against the tyranny that put the ache in their backs, the lines in their faces, the anguish in their eyes. That he would ride at the head of an army into the capital city, cheered along the way by thousands of dreamers, all sharing the hope that General Clemente is the man to give them back their freedom. A noble dream, or an illusion. If the latter, it would be an honest mistake. But even honest mistakes have a price. In a moment, Clemente and his lieutenants will encounter something which will turn out to be more than they bargained for. The surprising aftermath of a well-intentioned revolution. They will discover the startling truth as reflected in a very strange mirror. One that was handmade just for them. In the Twilight Zone. And now... The Twilight Zone and our story, The Mirror, starring Tony Plana with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Do you hear that? See me, General. They are calling for you. They are. They are. Let them see you, Clemente. Yes, from the balcony. Perhaps I should. Just for a minute. Go on, Ramos. This is your palace now. It is your right. Very well. Luke, there he is. It is him. 
my countrymen, a new day. I promise you the time has come. The president has fallen. Go home to your families now and make ready for tomorrow. You shall have peace, justice, and equality. Do you hear? Viva Clemente! That is me. Viva, viva, viva! <laughs> A toast! Yes, with some of the cruise's precious wine. The glasses. To the revolution. Ah, <laughs> uh, so do you know? Do you know why I laugh? I laugh because there is so much, so much feeling inside of me. I didn't know in the beginning. I didn't know when this moment came how I would react to it. What would I do? Laugh? Cry? Get drunk? I didn't know. What makes a man more drunk? Wine? Or the people shouting his name? Another toast to you. No, my friend. To you. To all of you. I toast my friends. Cristo, the bold one. Alessandro, the dedicated one. Tabal, the quiet one. And Garcia, the strong one. To the four lieutenants of the revolution. To the new heads of government. To the new government. Not to the Cruz, whose portrait stares down on us from the wall. Now the wall drips with wine, like blood. And so we begin. De Cruz. He is still alive. As you ordered. Bring him here. Let that be the first order of business. Yes, sir. You will have to find another picture for the wall. Yes. One of yourself, perhaps? Oh, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. We will find something. There. In the corner. What is it? A mirror. Ah. To reflect the new leader. A beautiful frame. Hand carved. General de Cruz had exceptional taste, huh? You should hang it up. Very well. Hmm. I look tired. Old. It has been a long day. Do you know, Alessandro, one year ago, this was the face of a peasant, a beardless, nameless worker of the dirt, whose fingernails were in mourning and whose clothing stank. And now? Now it is the face of a leader, a chief of state. Yes, it is. One year. One year of starving, hiding, stealing weapons, and having the same dream every hour. And from the dream came an army, and from the army came a rebellion. And now I have liberated the masses of other nameless workers of the dirt. I have broken their shackles. And what of him, the one whose portrait you have taken down? The memory of him will soon be forgotten. What is your plan? A trial, D'Alessandro. Of course. A lot of trials. A lot of brick walls and a lot of firing squads. A lot of bloodbaths, you mean? To cleanse us of the past. Are you sure that is the way? It is only fair. Their blood now, in repayment of ours. In here, pig. The general is waiting. Take your hands off me. Now, show respect. You disappoint me, De Cruz. You are not like your portrait. Who are you to judge? 
I don't recognize him. The man in the picture had arrogance, a full braid on his uniform. Where is he now? I see only an old man in dirty, torn clothes. What do you want of me, Clemente? What I want? Not what I want. What they want. Look, a dictator! To the wall with him! To the wall! To the wall! To the wall! To the wall! To the wall. You hear? To the wall, they say. But I won't stand you against the wall with a blindfold. That is a cheap death for underlings. Firing squads are for followers, not leaders. No, no. Old man, you are too good for that. You are a special case. You, I will strip naked and cover with honey. I will tie you spread eagled on the ground under the sun, and then I'll let the ants eat you. And every time you scream, I'll drink wine. And every time you beg for mercy, I'll laugh out loud, because I want you to take a long time to die. Want part death for every acre of land you stole. One part death for every morsel of food you took out of a peasant's mouth. And one part death for every voice you stifled by decree. Now, what is your plea? Or will it be a cry for mercy? I will not oblige you, Clemente, with a cry or a plea. You can strip off my flesh, because it is here for you and easily done by any animal. But my manhood, my manhood, you greasy little peon, this is as far from you as the moon. Peon? You dare to call me a peon? Stop! He is to be judged, not tormented. He is the animal. <laughs> and you are not, eh? You are the purists, the idealists, the saviors, the avenging angels. Gentlemen, you will soon be disillusioned. You are me. You are the Cruz. You are Baptista. You are Trujillo, you are Noriega and Duvalier. You are the keepers of the grab bags. You can wave your flags and put up your statues and embrace all the people from the oldest to the youngest. But we are of the same breed. We are the spoilers. We care for no one but ourselves. You insult me, peon. Enough. He presents his case and we are his best witnesses. We corroborate everything he says. You cannot help but do it. You think this room, the people out there, you think these are the fruits of victory? The spoils? No. They are simply a legacy, Clemente. What I pass on to you. Power you shall have. Certainly, power. Enough to make you giddy. But there are other things in the inheritance. You will find them soon enough. What things? Fear. The chief legacy. Fear of assassination. Fear of disloyalty. Fear of rebellion. Fear of another Clemente hiding in the hills. Fear even of the Norte Americanos who offer you money and supplies. God help you. God pity you. Take him away. On your feet. Guards! I see you have found my mirror. It is mine now. Then it will serve you well. An old woman brought it to me ten years ago when I first took power. She said it was magic. She said, by looking into it I could see the faces of my assassins. She spoke the truth. That is why I took it down. That's right. Look deep, General Clemente. Find out who your enemies really are. You will see them there, in that mirror. You will see them in the dark corners. You will see them in the crowd. You will see them in your glasses of wine. You will see them everywhere. Out! Where shall we take him? Lock him up in the prison. I will decide what to do. Assassins, come out, come out, wherever you are. 
Come on, assassins. Come out of the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a joke. A stupid, ignorant joke. Assassins in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Yes? How goes it, my friend? Ah, Alessandro. I'm glad you're here. It is dark. The chandelier, let me turn it on. No, please. I need to think. The candles, then? Only one. That is enough. More plans, eh? For the new regime? Come to the windows, Alessandro. Look outside. What do you see? Fires in the night. Yes. Many fires. I see the old ways burning. To make way for the new. The transition begins. What do you think he meant? Who? De Cruz. When he spoke of dictators. For once he spoke the truth. He is not deluded. He knows his role. But not ours. We will not make the same mistakes. No. But be cautious, my friend. It is easy to slip. Too much blood and the crops will not grow. We will know a season of poverty before the people are reborn. False friends will come to you, offering help. We must make alliances. There is always a price. Their influence, like fish hooks to bind us to them. From our neighbors to the south and the north... From lands across the sea. I will strike a bargain. With those who are so powerful? They will bring ships filled with goods. But also gunboats and helicopters and advisors with packs to be signed. Their ways are ruthless. Deal with them, yes. But not as a puppet. I am no man's puppet. Then take care. Take care, Ramos. Choose the path of justice, not of revenge. What? You would have me forgive De Cruz and his army? They who have kept our people under the yoke? Not forgiveness. Banishment. The prison is overflowing. We do not have enough bullets to liquidate them all. So they go to another land and rebuild their army. That is stupid, Javier. They are our enemies. Where will they live? In the mirror? Cristo. Sir. How many prisoners are there? In the capital? About 1,000. Start shooting them. When? Tonight. Yes, sir. Right away. I see. There is no time for trials. But for murder, there's plenty of time? What are you? A chameleon? The ease with which you strip off one color and put on another. You turn my stomach. I thought you were with me. I am. But not with mass murder. Murderers can never be murdered. They can only be eliminated. You clean your house with a reckless hand. Go, Cristo. Give the order. Gladly. You should look in that mirror and see what face looks back at you. A magical mirror, he said. A mirror that reflects the faces of my assassins. <laughs> How intriguing. Isn't that intriguing, D'Alessandro? I had no idea that you believed in such... What are you doing? What am I doing? I saw it. Where is it? What? The submachine gun. You need to rest. You have been awake too long. Tomorrow we will go into the fields, the villages, meet with the people. D'Alessandro. The dedicated one, the moralist... I was the arm of the revolution, but he was the heart. What are you talking about? I saw you with a weapon, cradled in your arms. Then you cocked it, ready to shoot me in the back. Where are you hiding it? Ramos, listen to me. You're not making sense. A man can believe his own eyes. I saw you in the mirror with the gun. I should have known. What gun? Ramos, you sound demented. I should have known. Of all of them, it would be you. 
It would have to be you, D'Alessandro. What are you doing? Yes, a traitor. Let go of me. See him with your own eyes. See the assassin. Do with him what you will. I am not an assassin. I am your lieutenant. Your conscience. No! Garcia, get off the couch and find a bed. Did you hear that? Uh, hear Garcia. He had too much to drink last night. The palace is stocked with the finest brandy. Not that. Outside, in the courtyard. Ah. Uh, the firing squad. We've already killed off hundreds. That sound, better than a swig of brandy. What were you before the rebellion, Cristo? Why do you ask that? Don't tell me. Did you work in a stockyard? You seem to enjoy the butchery. It is a fiesta. Then why do I not hear laughter? The crowd is getting bored, I think. Not bored. Sick. We have given them their freedom. Twelve hours of it. And it is such a fine freedom. The right to watch a massacre. Ten executions at least. Every five minutes. You would like more? Oh, oh good, good morning, Clemente. We did not give them their freedom, Tabal. What? You said we. It was I who gave it to them. And I'm sure you'll continue to give it to them. Why are they quiet? They scream for justice, and when you give it to them, they become weary. Like an audience in one peso seats at a burlesque. Their entertainment must be varied. Costume changes every five minutes, or they lose interest. New bodies every few minutes. But even that is not enough. I know them well. You fill their stomachs and it empties their brains. They have cheap tastes and short memories. Clemente, Clemente. Something to say, Tabal? No, I have papers to check. The figures for De Cruz's treasury. Is there nothing more? Something that sits heavy on you? That, that sits heavy on me. On my ears and on my heart. Why should it? Execution is not a time of joy. But even this is not as bad as the death of a man who was my friend. That is a sword in my chest. D'Alessandro? An assassin? And that's the worst lie of all. It was no lie. He was no assassin. What? What's the matter? Uh, what's going on? Oh. Still at it out there, huh? Yes. Until their work is done. Good morning to you, Senor Garcia. How handsome you look in the mirror. What do you see there? <laughs> I see only a tired soldier. A man who needs a change of clothes. Is there a bathtub? Many. Take your pick. <sighs> oh, I'll go then. And that is all? You don't see any assassins in that mirror? <laughs> no. I see nothing but my ugly face. Even an assassin might be better. Let me see. No! Leave the mirror alone. Why? 
You can talk yourself into an illusion. You can make yourself believe anything. Let go of my arm. What is that? Two men. With knives. Tabal. And Garcia. What is it, Ramos? That mirror needs to be cleaned. A trick of the light? Did you think you saw something? No, no, no. I, I, I saw nothing. Sometimes, if you stare at nothing too long, it begins to stare back at you. Tabal, you and Garcia go over to the prison. Yes? Looking on the cruise. Then report back to me. You report what? His health? Do as I tell you. See that he's properly guarded. Yes, sir. You have a message for De Cruz? What sort of message? Should I tell him that he was right about the fear? That there are assassins under the bed and in the shadows and all around the room? Cabal, you have both your freedom and your life. But you have them through my sufferings. Don't throw them away. Of course not, General. Cristo, get me the prison. Sir? On the phone. Here, I'll do it. Hello? Hello? Are you asleep down there? It's General Clemente. That's correct. This is urgent. I want the prison. No, not the office, the front gate. That's right. This is General Clemente. Two men will arrive there in a few minutes. They are spies and should be shot on sight. Their names are Tabal and Garcia. I know who they are and I know what they are. Shoot them. Call me when it is done. Bodies out. Yes, sir. Right away. I think maybe I'm still asleep. I wish you were, and me as well. Did you ever have a dream that. Uh, never mind. Go ahead. Say it. A dream where you try to wake up, but you cannot. You mean a nightmare. And do you wonder? What? Well, if I hadn't joined Clemente, well, I would be home now with my woman, my little ones. I would be in the fields working the crops. I think now that it wasn't so bad. But it was. Half of your vegetables, your livestock, to the state, that is no way to live. No. Still, I do not like this slaughter. Nor do I. I guess it isn't ours to know. What do you mean? Clemente, he has his reasons. I am not an educated man. The ways of politics are hard to understand. Clemente is not educated. But the Alessandro was. Mm, a very smart man. A lieutenant, like us. Closer than that. And now we are three. Clemente will need us even more. Garcia, listen to me. Watch your back. Huh? Clemente has not slept in three days. But he sees. Not with his eyes. With his mind. And what he sees is dark and strange. Like a house of many doors and behind each door is... More darkness. And the way into that house is... The mirror. What? A piece of glass? The glass reflects what is before it. When Clemente stands and looks... He sees... The doorways of his mind. I do not fear an old woman's gift. We are his lieutenants. Yes. Like the Alessandro. Come, we will report on the cruise. And then, we must make a plan. Senor Garcia. Senor Tabal. You know our names? But of course. We have come to see the prisoner. You have many prisoners, but only one of interest to the General. 
Ah, the general. I spoke to him not five minutes ago. Come in. We have been expecting you. Clemente, are they there? Good. Tell me when it is done. The prison? You have any complaints? None. You are sure? Why should I? A pie cut into two pieces is better than one cut into five. A drink of wine? Pie? But we do not speak of pie. Do we? These are the lives of friends. Are you sure? They were very close to me. Very close. You know that. Alessandro, Garcia, Tabal. They were like brothers. Or so it seemed. That is what I don't understand. How is it that they can change so? And even more curious. How can I crush them underfoot? like ants and feel nothing men cannot be brothers and assassins no they must choose it is to be expected when a man has power he has enemies and now you have enemies enemies yes i understand that but are all my friends to be my enemies from now on ramos you have no friends you have only followers and competitors. This is the breakdown of your world. You must live with it. And how do you classify yourself, Cristo? Myself? I am a follower, General. For how long? That is a strange question. For how long will you be a follower? Until some quiet moment when my back is turned? Oh, no. Only until that moment when you prove to me that you cannot lead. Only until the moment when I think that perhaps... Perhaps? What? That perhaps I am stronger than you. You'll be eaten by worms before that moment comes. Besides, if my back is turned to you, I will see you in the mirror. As I do now. What is it? What do you see? Only you. At the desk, holding out a glass of wine. Of course. Here is a glass for you. Now you pour it. Take a drink. It will make you feel better. But you poured it before. I saw you in the mirror. Your eyes are tired. Go ahead. It will help you sleep. It will help me sleep? But for how long, Cristo? How long will I sleep after drinking it? For all eternity? Why did you do that? What did you put in the glass? A powder? Did you point a gun at me? Only at traitors. But there is no reason. I have a desire to live out my life. I am allergic to poison. You have gone crazy. Mark your words carefully, Cristo. Yes? Yes, he is here. When? All right. I'll tell him. That was the gatehouse of the prison. The guards have shot Taval and Garcia. They are both dead. And what shall we do now? Mourn for them? If you wish. They were our friends, weren't they? But then again, they can't be friends and assassins. They must be one or the other. Wasn't that your point? Ramos, there was no poison in the wine. I swear to you, I had nothing like that in mind. Nothing of the sort. You are imagining things. Am I? Look, look, I'll show you. It was an illusion. This is just a mirror, an ordinary mirror, in an old frame. See? It's only glass, polished glass. 
I'm looking into it. I see myself and you behind me, nothing else. You are raising the gun and pointing it because you've let yourself see things that are not there. You've let yourself... Ramos! Ramos! What have you done? Only what I had to do. A terrible mistake. Now, you will be very lonely. You will be all alone. You have just killed the better man. The better man. General, I heard a shot. Lieutenant Cristo shot himself accidentally. But how? Did you hear what I said? It was an accident. Now get out of here! To the four lieutenants of the revolution, to the new heads of government, to the Alessandro the dedicated, Tabal the quiet, Garcia the strong one, and to Cristo, the bold one. Yes! Someone to see you, sir. Who? The Holy Father. What would a priest want with me? Leave us. General? It's all right. Yes, sir. I'll be outside. General Clemente. I'm Father Thomas. So? You will forgive me, General. But this must be said now. What must be said? The executions. The people are appalled. That is no concern of mine. Is this what we are to expect from the new regime? I have my enemies, Father. That is your answer? You may tell the people that as long as I have enemies, the executions will continue. They will go on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and if this disturbs them, if this disturbs them... Then what? Then let them do something about it. Let them starve in the mountains, as I did. Let them hide in caves. Let them raise an army out of the dirt. If there is one among them strong enough to make a new rebellion, let him try. But let him be prepared for a year of suffering, and let him learn how to lead. General Clemente, the victory is not so sweet, is it? Now you are learning. Instead of the flavor of wine, it has the taste of ashes. I had a dream, Father. I had such a dream. And they were all a part of it. Cristo and Tabal and Garcia... And Alessandro, why did they turn against me? You ask me for the answer? Where else can I turn? To this mirror? Look to what is in yourself. But I can't stand this. I can't live this way. I'm frightened. Morning till night, I hold my breath. I look over my shoulder. I keep looking back to see what is there. I will live the rest of my life running from death. Why? Why do I have so many enemies? This is the story of all tyrants, General Clemente. They had but one real enemy, and it is the one they never recognize until it is too late. God be with you. You, I see you looking at me. What do you see? What do you see?
Keep an eye on him. What did you say, priest? The general. He's not well. General Clemente is a great man. He might have been. He may be yet. He needs our help. I will remember him in my prayers. God be with you, my son. My general, the blood, who has done this terrible thing? last assassin, and they never learn. They never seem to learn. Ramos Clemente, a would-be savior in khakis, his brains blown out by an illusion, a mirage dangled before the eyes of all ambitious men, no matter how they begin. The most vulnerable are the dreamers, when they allow fear and paranoia to make them murderers. Which is not to say that ideals are an illusion, only that revolution requires more than songs and slogans. Courage helps, as does character, a touch of luck and something along the lines of superhuman strength, whether it be found here or in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. The Mirror, starring Tony Plana with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Tony Sancho, Rick Vargas, Eddie Martinez, Tony Castillo, Ricardo Gutierrez, Ivan Vega, Florentino Mitchell, Arturo Montemayor, and Oliver Adolfi. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group and Westwood One. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Matt Sorrow, Tim Cerny, and Todd Beyer. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. This is Doc James speaking.